Thank you very much. Look at those wonderful uniformed service law enforcement. Wonderful. January 15th, 2020, meeting of the City Council's call to order. This meeting has been properly noticed and posted in compliance with the open meeting law. These proceedings are being video recorded as well as presented live on KCLV Cable Channel 2 and are closed captioned for hearing impaired viewers. Please note customers of CenturyLink Cox Communication may view this program in high definition on channel 102 and in standard definition on channel 2. You may also watch the meeting live on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Go Vegas app. The City Council meeting, as well as all other KCLV programming, may be viewed on the internet at www.kclv.tv forward slash live. The proceedings will be rebroadcast on KCLV Channel 2, the web, and the web, the Wednesday of the meeting tonight at 8 p.m., Friday at 4 a.m., Saturday 7 p.m., Sunday 7 a.m., and the following Monday at 5 p.m. This building is protected by state-of-the-art fire detection and suppression sprinkler systems. If alarms should activate during today's meeting, please evacuate using the exits at the back of the chambers. Go out to the mezzanine, proceed out the double doors to the terrace, and go down the back staircase. For anyone who has difficulty with stairs, please check with a marshal or fire official for assistance. Once outside, please assemble on the northeast corner across the street from City Hall at Lewis and First. Employees wearing safety vests or city marshals will inform you when it's safe to re-enter the building. For public comment related items on the agenda, citizen participation and public hearing items, we have available a speaker card which you may complete and submit to the city clerk. Cards are available in the clerk's office or at the rear of these chambers. If you do not submit a card, it does not prevent you from speaking under public comment, citizen participation, or specified public hearing items. If anyone is present today who has need for hearing impaired equipment, please come up and see our city clerk staff up front. And if you parked in the parking garage across the street, a self-validation machine is located in the foyer between the council chambers and the security desk you walk through to enter these chambers. You must have your ticket with you to use the machine, but if you don't have your ticket, please see security personnel and exiting for a validation coupon. Before we proceed with the agenda, would everyone please rise for the invocation given this morning by Reverend Mary Bradlow, Clark County Coroner's Office, and remain standing for the pledge. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Thank you. Let us pray. As we begin a new year in our valley, guide us with a genuine respect for all life. For new local transportation program, ride share for kids, getting kids to and from school and sports events, that this new service be one of consummate safety for kids. And that each of us be willing to help friends or strangers to not get behind the wheel after drinking. And that those who drive vehicles for public or private use refrain from texting while driving. And that when we drive our own vehicles to and from work or to do errands, we refrain from taking chances by running red lights or taking illegal shortcuts to get somewhere faster. Whether we are working or off work, please help us to protect other drivers or pedestrians by valuing other persons' lives and families by the way we drive. Especially during the past couple months, we pray for children whose young mothers have been killed by drunk drivers. Bless these hurting children of deceased single moms so that they can be taken care of and raised by other loving people within their families or by loving foster parents. As we have been enjoying seasonal festivities and gift giving, inspire us as individuals to be a gift to others around us by exuding a persona of kindness and being a person full of care, carefulness for all lives. Amen.
Okay, we're coming on down for our ceremonials. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we love our whole family that chooses to live in Las Vegas, that's involved and wants to help. We don't appreciate your rudeness by screaming out. We'd love you to stay, but I can assure you, one at a time, I'm going to ask you out of here. So please don't do that. You're important to us. And we, we're going to be counting on you to help in this situation. This is not helping. So please put your signs down. Be respectful. Doesn't happen in your home. Doesn't happen from your relatives. Treat your, I don't want to hear any words. This is not your time. This is not public comment. So put your sign down so I can see the beautiful people behind you. They are here specially to be honored today. So put it down, please. Or I'll ask you to leave. Do you want your choice now? Okay, Marshall, let's start right here. Goodbye. Not going to have it. It's so disrespectful. Okay, everyone. This is excitingly our ceremonial portion of our council agenda. And for our first item today, Mayor Pro Tem Fiore is going to recognize the January Citizen of the Month. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I am so happy to be announcing that our Centennial Hills YMCA staff as our January Citizen of the Month. Um, the Centennial Hills Community Center is the largest recreation center in Nevada. Through public-private partnerships, the YMCA has been operating the center and the Northwest community since 2007. Currently, Centennial Hills YMCA has over 12,000 members. 82% of these members are part of uh, family memberships. Over 25% of our WISE members are active military or veterans. Through a national partnership with the Department of Defense and the Armed Services YMCA, the Y provides free membership to members of Creech Air Force Base and some of Nellis's Air Force staff as well. The Centennial Hills Y is a satellite location for Creech offering space for military families to gather, build relationships, reach fitness goals, and decompress after a hard day's work. Family engagement facts, strengthening family bonds and improving health and well-being are priorities of the Y as part of its family engagement initiative. The Y hosts free family night every Friday and parents night out every Saturday. And the greatest thing about partnering up with our YMCA a lot of events that we do, we do together. Our community events, our Halloween events, our Cinco de Mayo events, our Fourth of July events, our movie night events. I reach out to the Y and we do it together and we provide such amazing community partners. So I have to tell you, they have over 200 volunteers and dozens of Y staff and over 10,000 members of the Centennial Hills community participated in some of our holiday fun. Those are just a few facts of many, many things that the Centennial Hills YMCA staff does for our community every year. And with this community excellence in mind, I am happy to be recognizing the Centennial Hills YMCA staff as our City of Las Vegas Citizens of the Month for January. So, and then we also have to, before I bring them up, talk about our YMCA teen connection. 
Having already talked about the great things our Centennial Hills YMCA staff does every day, I am so excited to be recognizing the Centennial Hills YMCA Teen Debate Program participants as well. The team program, uh, debate program, they literally, uh, in response to a 2017 rise in what was dubbed caught on camera crimes by teens, the Centennial Hills YMCA enhanced its leaders in training summer camp program and launched four new teen programs designed to provide a safe, engaging, and productive environment for the development of tomorrow's community leaders. One of these new programs is a summer internship program for teens. The teen interns seeking more safe space and opportunities to grow and thrive collaborated with their peers and the YMCA staff to create this school's year's teen talks and teen connection programs. The free teen talks programs is designed to guide teens in making positive choices concerning their lives and relationships. The teen night program focuses on social activities, the Free Teen Connection Program stands on three pillars, service learning projects, social activities, and skill development opportunities. Today, um, select members of the Teen Connection Program are being recognized for their incredible efforts in a recent debate tournament that was facilitated through the mentorship. And what we did was myself and Councilwoman Seaman participated in a debate that they had put on. And I have to tell you, I'm very, very, very proud of them. And it's to their outstanding staff members, such as Mr. Chris, Mr. Joss, Mr. Stanley, Stanley alongside actively involved parents. And these teens, and they're uh, dedicated to the betterment of themselves and their community, that these programs have been so, so successful. And with that, I would like to bring up Breezy and our Y staff. <laughs> Breezy, this is our, and we're going to also, I'm going to have you say a few words, but I'm also going to ask our YMCA teen connection. There they are. Perfect. So we have certificates for all of you. Thank you so much, Mary Pro Tim and, and the council and Mayor Goodman. Um, the YMCA is very appreciative of our partnership with the city of Las Vegas and our opportunity to serve the young people, the families, and our military as well. And so we're, we're honored to be here today, and we're honored for you to recognize our efforts. Thank you. They truly are amazing. So let's take a photo. Yeah. Make sure everyone gets their certificates. Perfect. Madam Mayor, I'll okay. take a How about a picture? Let's all get close if we can. Yeah. We love closeness, except if we have the flu. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. All right. All right. I got told I'm supposed to be yes, in the middle. Yes, you're right. in the middle. And then everybody's going to look in back to the gentleman in blue. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. We're so grateful to each of you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm back to you um, right away. Mayor Pro Tem, busy lady, yes. Thank you. Um, this is not it. We are recognizing our Faith Lutheran Councilwoman Seaman. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Mayor good. Pro Tem. Okay. <laughs> it is my pleasure to recognize the Faith Lutheran High School girls soccer team on their victory in the 4A Division State Championship game. So, yes, it's amazing. May I please have Coach Chin, his staff, and the team join me here at the podium. All of you champions, come on up. Wow. 
Where's Bob Grown Hour's daughters? Where's where's where, Serene and Ari? Ari, come here. There you guys are. I just have to tell you, your dad <laughs> is fabulous to work with. Hang on. You're gonna That's so up. Come on over here. Yeah. There you go. We'll get them all. Congratulations. We want each and every one of you up here because we're so proud of you. These young ladies had one amazing season. They had 23 wins. Listen to this, no losses. Wow. One tie and were the only undefeated team in 4A, which is the largest school division in Nevada. Yeah, they deserve a round of applause. During their season, they scored 126 goals while only allowing three all year, registering 21 shout outs out of their 24 games. They are also the first Faith Lutheran team to win a state championship since the school moved up from Division 3A to 4A. Their accomplishments on the field is why they ended the season ranked number eight in the nation by the USA today super poll on behalf of the city of las vegas we are so proud to congratulate the team on an amazing year coach chin would you like to say a few words about your amazing team thank you uh first thank you very much to the city council and the mayor we have really appreciate it uh, it's a wonderful group of young ladies it's one of those times in your life that you look back on and you realize how blessed you are just to be a part of this type of a group uh, I see nothing but bright things ahead for them. I'm looking forward to being with them. Wonderful group of girls. The numbers speak for themselves. They really did good. The other thing that wasn't mentioned, and that was my fault, out of the entire season, we only had two yellow cards, which is amazing if you know anything about soccer and the, the way the game's played. So we're very proud of them, and we're proud of the school. So thank you. Thank you. We'll have to come up here and try to, maybe we'll put some of the girls in the front. Maybe they can. Ladies, you know how to do it. Give me a row in front and a row behind. Okay. We'll do a knee on one row. Sid, up front. We'll let our photographer see if he's got everybody in the picture back there. It's going to be difficult. Taylor, can you scoot up? JB, scoot up a little. See the gentleman in the blue there. Don't smile. Right, perfect. Mayor. Stay back. <laughs> One, two, three. Good. Congratulations. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations. We're so proud. Or more than one, two brothers. Congratulations. Okay, goodness, we are full today. Beautiful Councilwoman Diaz is going to recognize Rancho High School's Criminal Justice Club. We are not doing that. We're going to. 
we're going to trail. All right, boy, are we confused here. I hope city government works better. We're going to start off with Councilman Knudsen, Ward 1. I have no idea what you're doing. You take it from here. I got it. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I, I have the distinct honor and privilege of recognizing the Nevada Highway Patrol. Uh, so for the officers that are standing in the back, if you want to make your way on up, I'm going to talk as you're walking uh, so we can expedite the morning. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was doing shop with a cop, and I was able to get in one of the officer's cars, and we talked about what the Nevada Highway Patrol does, um, the, com the commercial enforcement unit, um, and I learned a whole lot, and I also learned that the city of Las Vegas had not in our history recognized the Nevada Highway Patrol, and so I took that as my opportunity and my responsibility to uh, talk about the wonderful things that the Nevada Highway Patrol does for our community and keeping us safe. Uh, so the number one goal of the Nevada Highway Patrol is to prevent critical injury or fatal crashes from occurring on our freeways. The mission of the Commercial Enforcement Unit is to ensure the free flow of commerce and safe operation of commercial motor vehicles on our freeways while inspecting such vehicles to make sure they are maintaining safe equipment set forth by state, state and federal guidelines. There are, this, is, this is fascinating to me. So there are 34,624 miles of highway in Nevada with no permanent fixed inspection facilities. So our commercial enforcement union, the, the team you see up here, they carry portable scales and are able to conduct roadside safety inspections anywhere in the state of Nevada. These operations use new tech for the uh, New Year's Eve. This is especially interesting for those of us who were, who were welcoming in New Year's Eve and felt safe at home and safe on the strip. The New Year's Eve Commercial Enforcement Unit, these operations, op operations use new technology using infrared cameras and automated license plate readers to scan all commercial vehicles that came through the checkpoint. Troopers were equipped with radiation detectors inspecting semi-tractor semi trailers for nefarious or terrorist activities. The Highway Patrol also utilized canine teams and partner canines as well. And the 72-hour check site is in operation every year for New Year's. Every year they do this to make sure no radiological materials make their way into Las Vegas for the New Year's Eve celebration. It's estimated that 20,000 commercial vehicles pass through the check sites during a 72-hour operation. Today I get the honor and the privilege of recognizing the Nevada Highway Patrol Commercial Enforcement Unit for keeping all of us safe and ensuring the free flow of commerce and safe operation of commercial vehicles on our freeway. Uh, I want to give them a, a round of applause and then I'm going to turn it over. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, City Council, Mayor. Thank you so much for recognizing these great uh, individuals that we have part of our team. Uh, something that I do want to highlight with our 72-hour operations is we, this group that's here is the lead in the state right now with testing new technologies to make sure that our roadways are safer, that the vehicles that are coming through here are properly screened, that we can tell that se semi-trucks that are driving on, down the roadway, if they have flat tires, or brakes that aren't working, we can screen that while the vehicles are in motion, as well as other technology. This year was the first year that we've tested that in the state of Nevada, and we did that because of great partnerships that we have with other states that let us bring that technology here, because that's where we need to move forward in Nevada with smart technology to bring us safer, more efficient and effective methods of finding vehicles that are dangerous for the public. Uh, so I really want to recognize our team for doing a fantastic job for that. We found various vehicles that had no brakes, that had flat tires, that did not have operating authority, which means they didn't even have insurance or they, didn't, they had other violations that were not allowed. And these inspectors were able to identify those things to that uh, use of that technology. There's two other programs that I'm very proud of uh, that I'd like Sir, uh, Sergeant Madsen to discuss that really create a huge impact in our community. Good morning, um, Sergeant Clay Matson. I'm the administrative sergeant for our commercial enforcement section. Uh, there's two programs that I really wanted to emphasize on the local side for us here in the Valley. The first is our civilian inspectors, uh, Robert DeFrancisco and Paul Nemu. Could you step forward for just a minute, please? Uh, these two individuals, we typically have three civilians that inspect the school buses in Southern Nevada. For those that don't know, there's about 2,000 school buses owned by Clark County School District. They had to be inspected twice a year. Uh, we look at everything on the vehicles to make sure that our children that are being transported are safe, make sure that they're not out there with unlicensed drivers or anything like that. So these guys 
worked pretty much full time on that on top of doing other things specialty for commercial enforcement. Thank you guys. Uh, your hard work and dedication shows through. <laughs> Pardon me? I'd like to ask a question. Um, we have the eyes and ears of the public all the time. They're very proud of this community, the city. Uh, where would they call if they saw something questionable? Or what do they text? What do, what's the best response for the public to participate and help, not be a hindrance? As far as the school bus regulations and Everything. just in general? Well, uh, you can either call our dispatch through 311 or Star NHP or the Metro, and they'll route it to us through dispatch to the appropriate agency depending on the jurisdiction. So, then 311, 311 or our dispatch. Um, one other program that I'm really proud of, uh, Brian Drone, my buddy Brian here. So, he has been instrumental in putting forth in the valley our truckers against trafficking and busing on the lookout. This is a program that targets human trafficking, uh, predominantly looking to help people that are victims of human trafficking get out of the life and get help. And I just want to thank Brian. Uh, through his hard work last year, we did a media campaign. RTC donated a lot of advertising area on bus stops and on buses to help get that message out. A uh, lot of hard work. It's probably going to turn into a national program based on what Brian has done. Yeah, it's already running. And I just want to say thank you for that. If anybody would like any information on that, please get in contact with the Highway Patrol and Commercial Enforcement. Brian and our, or I will be happy to give you more info. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, so I have the, uh, again, the honor and privilege. Our, our number one job, I believe, is public safety um, and to, to ensure the perception of safety. Um, and we, I feel safer right now because of a team like this that's standing up before you. Uh, so it is my honor and privilege uh, to, to proclaim on behalf of the mayor and city council today, Commercial Enforcement Unit Day in the city of Las Vegas. Thank you very much. We'll do a picture. Guys, bring it in tight because they can't get it in the camera. Get in closer. Thank you. Oh my, I hear the bones creaking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Just Just kidding. Hard. Here, come on over here. Can you get in between yeah. the camera? Yep. Yeah, yeah. We're, good. we're good. Okay. Great. Thank One you more. so One much. More. Who's Got doing it? it? Okay. Yes, he's set. He's set. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Awesome. You're here. Uh, that is so. Uh, wow. Councilman Knudsen, I mean, I'm just so grateful on behalf of all of us for what they do as a body. It's just, it was great, really wonderful. I was worried who was out on the roads right now, but uh, we, I was told we were well covered, so thank you. Okay, our lovely Councilwoman Diaz, here you go. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I had to trail my recognition, not because they're less worthy than any of the aforementioned um, folks that came before you, but it's just the bus system sometimes is not on time. And so I wanted to make sure that my crowd was here so that we could really acknowledge their, their work. Um, but before I forget, I want to acknowledge Futuro Academy's present here, presence here. We have elementary, elementary school students from Ward 3 and their parents here in attendance. And if they could please stand so that we can acknowledge them. They're fresh little minds taking our process in. Thank you to the fearless leader there, Ignacio Prado, for making this happen and having them come out to visit us today. What a way to start our new year. Welcome Futuro Academy. Um, I am proud and excited to have this opportunity to recognize my alma, ma my alma mater, Rancho High School, and their Criminal Justice Club for being winners of the iRecycle contest. 
In recognition of National Recycle Day, my staff and team from the Office of Community Services hosted the I Recycle contest to shed light on the importance and ignite the recycling bug in high school students. The I Recycle contest was a five-day competition held during the school week of Monday, November 18th through Friday, November 22nd. Student club members at two high at two competing high schools monitored the number of recycled materials collected in the designated recycling receptacles provided by the city's Office of Community Services. At the end of the contest period, winners were determined by the number of bags filled with recyclable items. And recyclable items were limited to just plastic bottles and aluminum cans. Our Office of Community Services Department provided six recycled receptacles receptacles, trash bags, recycling, educational flyers, and promotion material to ensure both schools would have all needed to succeed in the contest. Rancho High School's Criminal Justice Club successfully collected 12 bags filled with recyclable items throughout the week of the contest. I want to give a special thank you to Mr. McNaught for encouraging his students to be involved and instilling this habit of recycling. And I'm going to go ahead and invite Rancho High School down so that we can um, present them with the recognition and give them a round of applause for their recycling efforts. And also our Office of Community Services and any of the VISTAs that participated and took part of this program, come on down. And then if some of the students can come on this side so we can balance it out a little. And then... Uh, and it was also, so it was, I'm hearing it's a partnership between the Criminal Justice Club and the Student Council at Rancho High School that undertook these recycling efforts. We know that every little effort will help lessen our carbon footprint, and we thank these youth for doing their part. Um, so it's been a pleasure of my office to engage with the Office of Community Services and the VISTAs, and especially you, the students, for carrying out such important work. And with that, I'm gonna turn over the mic to the assistant principal at Rancho High School so that he can also share about the excitement and being recognized today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Colin McNaught. I'm one of the assistant principals at Rancho High School. Um, I know it doesn't look like it, but I promise that I, promise that I am. Um, and so we were really excited when uh, we were approached by this competition because at Rancho, we actually, this wasn't just a one-week effort. Um, the one-week effort was you know, nice to kind of get an idea of how much we do recycle. But throughout the entire year, uh, we have clubs and organizations that man our recycling stations during lunches and collect the bottles and cans. Um, so we were pretty much doing this all year, and it was exciting to be able to participate in a competition and you know potentially get recognized. And we did win, so we are getting recognized for the efforts uh, of all of our clubs and organizations. This particular week that we uh, were part of the competition, the Criminal Justice Club. So raise your hand if you're part of the Criminal Justice Club over here. So they were responsible for actually collecting uh, everything during lunch. Um, and then my student council, raise your hand for that. This is my student council executive board. Um, they were responsible for the back end of it, of just kind of organizing it and getting us the, the pictures that we needed to send over to show what we did each day. Um, so you know, if we could just get one more round of applause for them, for their efforts. They they did an amazing job. I uh, just asked them to do it, and they were like, yeah, well, aren't we already doing that? And I was like, yeah, perfect. So now we're going to try to get recognized for it. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to continuing this process. Thank you. And so with that, Mr. McNaught, um, the mayor, the Las Vegas City Council, my office, want to commend you, Rancho High School, for amazing work uh, in showing how to recycle. And uh, I'm so ecstatic that it's not just something you do during a week, but it's a, it's a tradition at Rancho High School to continue those efforts year, year round. It's so important. So with that, thank you so much. Here's your snazzy little thing to hang up there at my alma mater. I'd love to see it when I come through the doors. Um, and so thank you so much. And we're going to go ahead and take a picture. Thank you very much. I don't want to block you. Can we get them? Well, if they can take a knee to first row, yeah. that oh, yeah. would help. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you guys can squat? You guys squat. I would like to see how good the response was. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I just, I'm good. I'm good. You can up here. 
Councilman birthday boy, our elder councilman, now really elder. Happy birth! How about a happy birthday to this guy, Stavros Anthony? Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Stavros Anthony! Happy birthday to you! Was. The recipient appreciates it, but I will tell you, we're not winning any song singing contest. <laughs> Yours. Thank you, Mayor. At this age, it doesn't matter if I have birthdays or not. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is my honor to uh, recognize the ninth annual Chinese New Year in the Desert Festival and welcome all the cultural ambassadors. Let's begin the festivities. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite Jannie Lowe of Golden Catalyst, who is the executive producer and has been instrumental in organizing the festival for the last eight years. Please give her a nice round of applause, Jannie Lowe. The City of Las Vegas, Golden Catalyst, and the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority will come together to usher in the Year of the Rat in Las Vegas starting Saturday, January 25th with a parade in downtown Las Vegas at 
Attendees will be taken on a journey around the world as they experience lion blessing, folklore, and traditional instrumental performances. The celebration continues that evening with the official ribbon cutting ceremony at the Grand Canal Shops. The weekend festivities will end on Sunday with a nine course dinner at the Ping Pang Pong restaurant at the Gold Coast Hotel. So uh, if you're interested in that, please come out. Uh, the city of Las Vegas is very pleased to usher in the year of the rat. The rat is the Chinese zodiac sign known for being inquisitive, shrewd, and resourceful, and represents a year of renewal. The New Year celebration includes an assortment of cultural amenities, attractions, and celebrates the largest Chinese New Year celebration in the United States here in Las Vegas. Is that great or what? That's what we do here in Las Vegas. I'd li now like to have Jani uh, from Golden Catalyst say uh, anything else you'd like to say about the Chinese New Year. Thank you, Councilman. At this, good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you so much for having us. At this time, I would like to invite my culture ambassadors to come up to present special gifts. So, Salve, Pam, Derek, Bill, Ali, Jesse, Jenny, and Jason. Come on up. These are our traditional, yes, put, go ahead and put them over there, yes. And uh, this is our traditional scarf and that hopefully will keep you warm during the parade next week, right? And please stay, stay here, okay? And you can just hold that one. Oh, oh. Okay, go ahead, yes, both, yes, stay please. Okay. So, Happy New Year everyone. 新年快乐. So thank you so much for being here. At this time, I would like to invite Marcel Cruzado. She's our next generation cultural ambassador to talk about uh, the Year of the Rat. Here you go, Marcel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcel Cruzado, and I'm an international business major in my fourth year at the Lee Business School at UNLV. I have been working with Ms. Janney and CNY in the Desert for about four years now, and I can honestly say it has been such an amazing experience. Through this journey, I've not only engaged with the Las Vegas community, but I've, not, I've seen the incredible potential that our city has that our city possesses. To see how much this event has grown and to be a part of it has been such a blessing. Chinese New Year is about celebrating life with family and friends. With your support, we have continued to grow CNY in the Desert to include many more spectators, participants, national and international visitors. 2020 is the year of the rat. The rat is the first of all zodiac animals and it represents the beginning of a new day. In Chinese culture, rats were seen as a sign of wealth and surplus. Those born in the year of the rat are clever, quick thinkers, successful, but content with living a quiet and peaceful life. What a great message this brings. By being successful and content with what we have ourselves, we can be the good fortune for one another, in our families, in our communities, and in our world. In this way, we are guaranteed that 2020 will be a great year for all. We are very fortunate to collaborate with all of our community partners, and we want to thank our major sponsors, Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, Vegas Golden Knights, 18B Arts District, the City of Las Vegas, East West Bank, and Hospitality Culinaire. Our greatest hope is that your participation in this festival touches you and your loved ones and marks the beginning of a happy, healthy, and prosperous 2020. Thank you, and Happy New Year. Good job. Well, thank you. I'd now like to uh, recognize um, uh, one of the ambassadors and give him a special recognition, uh, Mr. Michael T. Would you please come down here? Give him a nice round of applause. Mr. T is one of the key stakeholders and champions of the annual citywide Chinese New Year's Festival, which brings community partners together. We applaud Mr. T for all his contributions made to our great city and for being an inspiring role model for our future generation, especially in the Asian American community. And I have a proclamation for you, sir. And uh, there's a bunch of whereas's in here, but the ones that are the most important say, the City of Las Vegas acknowledges Michael T's work as the former national president of the American Culinary Federation, former president of the Las Vegas chapter of the American Culinary Federation, 
And as a dedicated public servant where he volunteers endless hours and donates breakfast to the Chef for Kids program since 1991. The City of Las Vegas values Michael T. for being a champion of the young culinary professionals by his involvement as, now we're talking some French words here. Uh, let's see, uh, I don't know if I can do this correctly. Uh, do you want to try this? Do you speak French? Chien de rotisseur? Yes, yeah, say that. <laughs> I don't want to. Chien de rotisseur. Okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and is a uh, Shan Foundation trustee that awards scholarships to young chefs and sommeliers. So because of all your work, sir, uh, I'd like to pronounce today Michael T. Day in the city of Las Vegas. Congratulations. Anything else? Oh, you want to say something? Sure. Uh, it's an honor, uh, councilman and councilwoman and mayor. I've known mayor for a long time. Um, Yes, I've uh, been a, a proud citizen of uh, Las Vegas for 45 years and uh, dedicated a former chef and uh, work, still work to uh, educate young culinary professionals in their field and uh, continue to do that through all my life. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good job. All right, uh, Michael, if you can stay here. We actually have a great uh, surprise here. Sally, can you please roll out the special, wonderful, delicious cake? And let's do this. Let's help us sing happy birthday to Councilman. You can do any language you want, OK? I'm going to do it in Mandarin. Ready? Go. Happy birthday to you, Julie Shandler, Thank you. Can, can we take pictures? Is that okay? Where's the 63 candles? All right. Okay, so we'll cut this up into pieces and everybody gets one uh, out in the audience before you leave. So, all right, thank you. Uh, let's round everybody up for a picture yes. and uh, let's celebrate the uh, Chinese New Year in the desert. Yeah, anybody else who wants to be in the picture, come on up. Good health. Wow. You know something? I must say these scarves are magnificent. They all make us look so bright, and that is good. I mean, no, it, they just, everything you're wearing, it looks fabulous. Yes. We all wore the right and they are soft. <laughs> they are very soft. But what a wonderful celebration. And Councilman, um, where downtown is the parade? Is that in the Arts District on Main Street? And starting, what did, what did you say? 9.30? 9.30. So please come on down. Main Street in Utah. So come on down. There'll be just a hot time down here, as always. So thank you so much, Councilman. And what a celebration for your birthday. Don't expect it every year like this, you know. <laughs> and I think now for our final. That's it? What a way to end. 
We made it. Congratulations. Happy birthday. You're the last. So, all right, we are going to take, um, how much do we need? How much time? Ten minutes? Or are we set up over there? Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. We'll be back. We have to wait for technology to catch up with the human effort. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and a big surprise. Um, we continue to celebrate Councilman Anthony's birthday here, and it will go on for a long time. But we brought back all the way from Reno, came in specially. Councilman Creer did not take the full day. He came back specifically to sit next to you today on your birthday. Councilman Creer, come on in. Make a He's, yeah. your, he's your city no, no, no. birthday <laughs> gift. <laughs> I love it. Took the red eye for me to get here. Oh, wow. Do you know that? Okay. We're on to agenda item 12. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. The amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. All comments made will be cross-referenced to those specific items. If anyone submitted a speaker card or who wishes to speak under this portion of the agenda, please come to the podium, state your name for the record. This is your opportunity to address the council, but the council will not respond or engage in dialogue. Everyone will have one minute, please, Madam Clerk as you're decorating your little space there. Okay, if you'll um, mention, uh, say I, your name and we, spell it if it's difficult. We can barely hear you, ma'am. <laughs> you can hear, cannot hear us? No, it's, the volume is turned down. Oh. Volume's turned down. Volume's turned down. Can the volume come back up? Name is Daniel Braisted, B-R-A-I-S-T-E-D. This is a matter of old business. You weren't here in December. I presented three resolutions that I wanted consideration. I haven't heard anything about it. I presented a major challenge of attempting to talk to people at the courtyard. I even offered to pay the lady's salary double. Two employees followed me out, got my information. I have heard zap. Okay. I would like to help the okay. courtyard. Thank you. How do I do it? Okay. The very simplest thing is I'm going to ask our city manager to make sure that you get a response with the holidays and everything else and the meetings both in town and out that we've, I, I can understand why it was difficult to get through in December. And so, um, or I can ask um, Dr. Hibbler, if you will, the lady, the beautiful lady in pink, if you will step aside with Thank her, you, she will make sure you have it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I, I am here today to make comment on item um, 71 on the agenda. Okay, I didn't you, then you want to forego your space at that time. I w I'm going to take public hearing at that time. You so, are going to? Yes, but it's either now or then, not both. Okay, so now I have a decision to make. Yes, that's what we do every day. I know, okay. I think I will go ahead and make my public comment now. Okay. Is that and that's a full minute, and we're going to do the same thing at the agenda time. It's only going to be one minute, too. Also, okay. Okay, please uh, my state name, your name for the record. That doesn't count as part of your minute. Thank you. My name is Elaine Winger Raisner. I reside at 9811 Orient Express Court, and I'm here today as president of the HOA of the Queens Ridge a community. And I would like to submit a seven question survey that the Board of Directors did in the Queens Ridge community. A total of 967 surveys were sent with 468 surveys returned, giving us a 48.4% return rate. A brief overview of the <laughs> survey is number one, an overwhelming survey uh, an overwhelming support at 82.6% of the open space ordinance that ensures citizen input and requires impact studies in an effort to aid the city council in making responsible decisions. Number two, there is a strong support at 95.7 for the city to require potential developer not only to meet with impacted residents, but to prepare a report and address their concerns and possible resolutions before submitting a development application. Thank also you. noted is a That's strong it. support. Sorry, 
that's it. So if you want to leave that with our city clerk, the list, and a copy of the survey, that would be welcome. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, that's the copy for the city. Thank you. And if your last name is difficult, could you please spell it for the clerk in your minute? Thank you very much. Um, your minute doesn't start till after <coughs> the details. Thank you. I can't be here this afternoon, so thank you for this opportunity. My name is Gordon Culp. I live at 653 Ravel Court uh, in Queens Ridge. And I'd just like to very briefly remind you of the type of public comments that you received when this original motion ordinance was voted on on November 7th. There were a petition submitted with 181 signatures in favor of the ordinance, 61 emails, 58 citizens took time out from their busy lives and showed up to testify that day. Then in response to the current motions, you've received 97 other emails, 96 of which are opposed to the repeal of the ordinance. So 96 to 1 ratio is uh, pretty unusual in today's environment, showing strong strong favoritism toward retaining the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Culp. Morning. Good morning. I'm Ann Smith, 653 Ravel Court, but I'm also speaking for um, a friend who's in Desert Shores. So no, no, we're just to staying with one minute. I know. We're not doing that. It's, okay, I just wanted to let and you know. That, that dialogue didn't count, so if you'd start her now. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm urging you to vote no to re on the repeal of the Open Space Ordinance 71 and then the replacement 73. But if it is repealed, which I'm anticipating, then on behalf of our street, which is Ravel Court, and also I ask that you only approve in the future density of development on Badlands that's compatible and complementary to everybody in the area and the surrounding area and not stress the infrastructure around our entire neighborhood and also on Charleston and on Rampart and the schools. So that's what I'm asking because I don't feel like any negotiations are going to work with the neighborhood and the developer at this point um, on past experience and you're the only ones that hold any power to get something in the area that's going to be Thank you, Mr. decent. Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Right there is fine. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jerry Engel, and I reside at 700 Poncha Train Drive, uh, 89145 in the Badlands. I'm here for just two items. Number one, to express my objection to items 71 and 73. We really put a lot of effort in getting an ordinance that we think is good for the whole county and there are people now who want to piecemeal it and break it out to where it is not good for everybody. The other item is uh, Mr. Summerfield addressed us uh, last month at a hearing with uh, Councilwoman uh, Siemens and uh, I asked him why is there so much uh, storage uh, a few hundred feet from my home, and he said there has been no permit allowed for the c contractor or the owner to bring storage facilities and conduits and all on the property. I sent pictures, it's still there. He said there was never the right for the builder to do that. It's an eyesore, and I ask the council to do something about it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Engel. What do I do with this? Uh, right there would be fine. In the in the black uh, box there is good. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Dale Raisner, 9811 Orient Express Court. Um, I'm here to voice my, um, voice my opposition to uh, items 71 and 73. Um, I, I feel like, and I mentioned this in the past, the ordinance provides a framework and, and, and some guidelines to kind of prevent the unending chaos that we've gone through for the last four and a half years, specifically at, at Queens Ridge. Um, but in addition to that, more specifically within that repeal, uh, there's language to uh, change the definition of open space. And I feel like that is totally unfair. We bought near land ourselves. There's other people that probably have too that has open space and designations. And to, to change that after the fact marginalizes existing 
existing homeowners, and I don't think it's fair, uh, and it should not be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Herman Allers. I live at 9731 Orient Express Court. I've been here a few times before over the last three years. I want to express my objection to repealing what we voted on, worked hard on, on the previous ordinance. I don't think it is illegal. I don't think it is unfair. However, I have heard that some legal people with the city feel that if they would repeal it and make it more liberal for developers, it would, would help in the lawsuit against the city, which I think is absolutely not the case. My most important issue with any type of ordinance that we should end up with or agree to, that it should state, have an amendment, that any development done within an existing community that's been in effect for 25 years will make sure that that development will not exceed height limits, existing okay, thank you. I'm trying density. to give you an extra second or two to get to your point. So thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate thank you. Thank you for down. the opportunity. Good morning, morning, Mayor. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. My name is Ron Iverson. I reside at 9324 Verlaine Court in Queens Ridge, and I'm as a member of the HOA board, but I'm here speaking to you this morning as a resident. urge you, as my uh, former speakers have said, to uh, not to repeal the current uh, open space ordinance. First, the ordinance was based on best practices from across the state. We put, uh, we put, or the United States put a lot of time and effort into trying to get the rights in uh, and in place to preclude a lot of chaos that had included uh, the last uh, four years before that. Uh, secondly, we've been told that it was considered onerous by developers. When we queried a number of sources around city council about uh, what developers considered it uh, onerous, uh, we got, we did not uh, understand anything. Uh, no developers were named. We heard that it was discriminatory, and I ask uh, what's discriminatory about an ordinance that provides transparency, a process and requirements developed, and provides equal rights to re I'm sorry, that's the end. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Corey Mays, I'm a city resident, and I'm here to uh, hope to convince you to vote no on your number 17. Um, <clears throat> basically what we're doing is we're changing out our models, we're, we're going from a different uh, service and trying to reduce them down and we're claiming to save a lot of money. What I've found is, is that uh, for me potentially during the time period, that switchover is going to cost me about what they're going to save the first year, that's just those two days. Uh, you start doing this comparison over any length of time, um, the savings doesn't actually add up. I did a five-year period and looked at the totals. Um, basically, I'm going to make almost 7,000 more if I was to stay with the fund we currently, I'm currently with. Um, what it actually would benefit us to do is to move to, mo to nationwide and give us the option of extra investments, not actually lose this one. And also the variation to the totals that they have on their calculations are, very, are not done with any reduction. And then it gives us a bad uh, run against what the totals are. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. And anyone else, please come forward. And if you would, it would help. Um, and Tony Johnson, are you here? Okay, I have your card, ma'am. Could you wait one moment, because I do have his card right here. I'll be right with you after that. Please, Mr. Johnson, if you'd state what uh, agenda item you're addressing. I didn't know what agenda item, but it's on the homeless situation. 71? Okay. If I, is it if seven, seven zero. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Johnson. My address is 6113 Stybor Street, Las Vegas, Nevada. 
I'm a retired correctional officer and I'm here as a mental health provider. My question is, are there going to be funds available or grants available for to assist the homeless providers in, uh, uh, with the homeless situation? Uh, how much is going to be available uh, and for what areas? And when are the dates for yeah, the applications? Okay. Very um, what I'd like you to do is get the card back if you could, put your address, phone number, information, we will give it to Dr. Hibbler, uh -huh. who is in charge of, uh, of the entire project. Okay. And um, certainly since you already are a, a mental health provider yeah. and helper, um, certainly we, we want to get those who are advocating for the homeless to get involved, mm -hmm. just not speak, but be involved and part of helping us help okay. others. So uh, if you will do that, and Dr. Hibbler will take your card, she'll be in touch. It's Thank already you. on there. My name is Ebony. Thank you so Tony much. Tony Johnson, right? Yes, ma'am. Fine. I also Thank have, uh, I guess, finances available to assist, and I just need some more assistance. She'd love to ha oh, help hear from that. Yeah, thank so you. So good. We love help, financial as well. And Kathy Thomas Gibson, you found her, or she came up so quickly. Thank you. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Good morning. My name morning. is Carmela Gadsen. Um, I actually work at Battleborn Progress as a story bank organizer, working with people who are currently homeless to understand what they are experiencing um, as they're trying to get jobs, trying to get apartments, people who have disabilities who are receiving SSI benefits but cannot afford excuse me, cannot afford affordable housing. Um, I'm opposed to agenda item number 70. And at this point, I feel that you are planning to move forward. And in doing that, I hope that you will make it easier for people to cope with this particular ordinance and think about reducing the fine right. and the misdemeanor status of violating the ordinance and the law. If a person can't afford to eat, they can't afford $1,000 or a misdemeanor. Um, and so you can park your car for $25 fines to $100 fines, but if you sleep, it's 1000 And so I hope that you create some equity um, because we are advocating for people who have nothing. I've met a person who's living in a sewer. He's living in the sewer, You'll trying to clean that. windows and make a living. And so as we, as you do what you're already planning to do, please think about making this fairer for people so they can well, afford we're to start, pay the fine. You're down to your minute. We're going to start with you helping us. So your card, please put down a phone number that we can contact I did. you. And we're going to get you involved in helping. We know we're helping. I'm already helping. involved in helping. Then continue to do so. We're doing it on every, every aspect of this. We are absolutely about helping the homeless that we can get back into a healthy life. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for caring. We appreciate Can I just ask a it. question before no, I go? No, I'm sorry, because we're out and we've got a, a list. And I'm going to ask each one of you, while you're waiting in line, fill out a card, a speaker card, with your phone number so we can contact you to help us. It is time now that we're going to ask you to be of help to all of us who are working so hard. And as we work around this country to take in animals that are uh, abandoned, certainly people who come before animals. So we're asking every single person now who comes as an advocate for the, hope, for the homeless to get involved. And if you don't have the time, let us know anyway. But in order to speak, I'm asking you, you still may be able to speak, fill out one of our speaker cards with your phone number and how we reach you, because we are going to ask you to go with us and help these wonderful people who've had bad luck in life. So next, sir, your turn, please. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Nathaniel Phillips. I'm a resident of Ward 5. Hello, Councilman Creer. Um, I'm keeping my own time also. Um, I think I'm already on the record as opposed to yes. the ordinance. I apologize, um, Councilman um, Knudsen. I misspoke at the recommending um, meeting last. You obviously did not sponsor and would not sponsor um, legislation like this. Obviously, the only well, there's well, Career Wood, Goodman Wood, um, the Excuse Pro me, that's would. just rude. It's Councilman Career who happens to be the councilman. Sure. My apologies, Mayor. Mayor. My Please, apologies, Mayor Goodman. Good. In my last 20 seconds, um, wow, I guess I would just re beseech you, M Mayor Goodman, um, since we have very limited time, 10 seconds now. Um, to please, to please stop interrupting every advocate that comes up here. We know more than you on this issue. 
Um, and the way that you have run this meeting so far is quite juvenile, to be honest. Um, my grandmother had the um, privilege of hiring your husband um, as her lawyer upon her move to Las Thank Vegas. Thank you very much. And it's quite disappointing that you still maintain power over this. Thank you. And your days are numbered. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hello, my name is Merrick Haji Sheik. I have been a resident of Las Vegas for about a year and a half. Um, I live down on uh, East Carson, uh, zip code 89101. That's about as much as I'm comfortable telling you. Uh, and uh, first of all, I'm in Diaz's district, and I would like to thank her for not sponsoring the ordinance. Councilwoman Diaz, please. Yes. Uh, I would like to thank her for not sponsoring the ordinance last time. It shows that she's got, you know, some moral courage. Uh, and I would like to take this time to remind you guys that under the Eighth Amendment that uh, the state or city may not criminalize conduct that is unavoidable as a consequence of being homeless, namely sitting, lying, or sleeping on the streets. Uh, this has been upheld in the Ninth Circuit, which is our circuit. So I would really hope you guys do not violate the Constitution. Uh, it seems like it speaks more to who your interests lie. Thank you very much. Next, please. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me, Mayor Goodman. Uh, my name is Ethan Cullings, uh, reside in 89012. Um, so my name is Ethan. As I said, I am an advocate with For Future Nevada. I would like to stand here to oppose uh, item number 70, uh, as it does criminalize homelessness. Um, I know that I have heard from this council that that is not their intent. However, we must recognize that intent does not equal impact. One's intentions may be good, but the ramifications that passing Ordinance 2019-44 as it stands will have will adversely hurt our homeless population. Uh, in calendar year 2019, 251 people were incarcerated in CCDC for obstructing a sidewalk, 88 of which were homeless, and those people cannot afford that. They need a helping hand up, and I implore you to not vote on 2019-44 as it stands and remove the criminalization element of that ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. And please make sure you leave us your phone numbers on a card so we can contact you to help. Thank you. We appreciate it. And um, Ms. Thomas Gibson, are you here somewhere? Yes. So we will get the cards to you to have them help in, in uh, the city, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is George Allen. I'm a home care worker. Uh, I have clients who are sick and being... Uh, put out of the hospitals and on to the streets, uh, they, and they have no homes. A, what I have to say is that homelessness, not the homeless, but the homelessness uh, without funding for housing is a clear and present danger and a threat to national security. We must find a way to work together and to move from protest to progress. Good. Good. I'm willing to work with you and to be in touch with you Good. Thank and you. for a better America. Thank you. That's so important and that's exactly what we want to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. My name is Janie Powell, and I am currently a Shade Tree resident. I was displaced due to domestic violence. I'm speaking, it, I, I would totally understand the actual idea of having businesses respected and places that are zoned for commercial residences absolutely having their business clean. However, under the circumstances, if I were to, for whatever reason, be unable to stay at the shade tree, I would absolutely not stay at the courtyard. I would probably sleep at a park that I found safer until I were able to get back to the Midwest or whatever the case may be. So moving forward, I understand that nothing is infallible. 
I would like to be a part of that process, but it would absolutely be a disservice to myself and my 11-year-old if I were fined $1,000 and criminalized. Thank I'm willing you. to be a part of the Thank process. Thank you. Shade Tree is one of our most fabulous partners, and that's what we're seeking. That's what we're trying is finding housing for those that can take care of themselves or their children. So please get involved, help us, and I know Kathy Thomas Gibson and Dr. Hibbler would be most grateful for your help, and hopefully Shade Tree, all the places that we have that are working so hard to house and take care that you get involved with that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. My name is Mercedes Saden, and I reside in 89012. Could you spell your last name, please? S-E-Y-E-D-I-N. I reside in 89012, but I have the privilege of working with those who live in 89101. I work for the care complex located, located in the heart of the Corridor of Hope on Four Master Lane, and I work directly with those experiencing homelessness. Good. A single mother displaced by domestic violence who is working full time, a middle-aged man who lost everything due to health issues also working full time. Those are the people we help. The process of them getting back on their feet starts with identification. With the current system, identification alone takes about 45 days. That's 45 days before they can start to seek employment. If one of our clients is caught with this ordinance or with the past one, it will halt all progress. <laughs> and that these individuals cannot afford a fine of 1,000, they will be arrested and will have increased barriers upon their release with a criminal record. I believe that you have a good intent and I ask you to reconsider the language and punishment currently proposed. It is not that I'm opposed to clean streets, but I'm opposed to the methods in which they are being enforced. Thank you very much, and just so that you know, we're trying to help every single homeless person with identification so they can get back into society. Thank you. Yes, sir, your name, please. Good morning. I'm Lalo Montoya, political director for Make the Road Nevada. I live on Nellis in Washington. We're an organization that fights to improve the quality of life of all immigrants and working families here in Nevada. We're here to oppose Bill 2019-44. The impact of this ordinance results in the criminalization of life-sustaining activities that put homeless people in danger. On Monday, I had the opportunity to uh, go through a walkthrough with the care complex. As I saw firsthand the services they're offering folks just to survive each day, I saw how people are trying to get their birth certificates and IDs to obtain employment, misdemeanors and fines that would come through this implementation of this bill makes the possibility of employment even much harder. And that's why I urge you to vote no on this ordinance and work with those opposed to enact real solutions that put people over profit. That's exactly what we're trying to do, so thank you. And please leave your name so Ms. Gibson can um, go ahead and contact you to get you involved with this as well. Thank you thank for you, what you're doing. Appreciate it. Good morning, uh, Mayor, Councilwoman, Councilman. Um, my name is Jonas Rand. Uh, I live at 89121, Unincorporated Paradise. Um, I'd like to urge you uh, to vote no on Ordinance 2019-44, as I have before at the um, uh, preliminary hearing. Um, I want to let you know that um, the advocates, like Nathaniel said, um, have had uh, firsthand experience with homeless folks, and I implore you to listen to them rather than cut them off. Uh, second, I'd like to uh, let you know that um, the uh, people who had spoken uh, at the 1936 uh, hearing uh, were describing uh, rapes and assaults at the courtyard, and I'd like every one of you to know that if you vote yes on this, you are essentially putting all the people that are going to be arrested as a result of this ordinance at risk of the behaviors that those uh, speakers had outlined at that hearing in no on November 6th. Um, when you uh, are doing this, you are also uh, you also need to keep in mind that you are violating the Constitution because you have no provision in there um, regarding people who uh, are, you know, uh, regarding shelters, uh, having space for them. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. That's a minute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Turn it on. Oh, it's up. Uh -huh. It's up okay. now. Try again. Daniel, your last name, please. Weber. Thank you. I live in East Las Vegas. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. 
As it stands, this city council before me is a despised group in the eyes of the nation, major publications, and prominent humanitarian groups. Any pretense of integrity was diminished by the attitude of the mayor, whose outbursts have been circulating the internet for mockery, and diminished by blatant lies told by this council. We were told that um, uh, this council was not interested in locking up the homeless. Police have confirmed that's a lie. We were told that the Corridor of Hope was capable of adequately sheltering homeless people. That was a lie. At best, it was a major oversight by council members who are painfully out of touch and criminally privileged. Any pretense of democracy was shown to be a sham as hundreds of local residents voiced their opposition. Yet it was the voices of business owners who took priority. The class war you've ignited against this community has emboldened workers now to reject capitalism and its running dogs, tarnish the legacies of this council indefinitely, and fight the ruling class in Las Vegas every chance we get. Go ahead and pass this ordinance like the good rubber stamp institution you are for the wealthy, because we're ready to fight you every step of the way. Next, please. Thank you. This we're all reading. Wait till the red light's on. There it is. Okay. Hello, I'm Annalise. I'm also with the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and I also live in East Las Vegas. The Las Vegas City Council has shown the true erosion of democracy. Only here with the ruling class serving their own exclusive interests can you listen to the voices of hundreds of dissenting residents from each council person's district constituency and still vote in favor of your own business entanglements. This government that we have here is not for the people. This is evidenced by the fact that we live in a city we live in a city with more than enough resources to meet the needs of the most vulnerable. Instead, we choose to lobby our alliance to big businesses and corporations that maintain a ruling stronghold over our citizens' quality of life. But beyond all these things, we must recognize that where there is systematic injustice, patriarchal violence, racism, homophobia, transphobia, colonialism, and endless war at the expense of those abroad and at home, there will be an entirely different system of justice for those who own property and those who do not and it is built upon a system of white supremacy that keeps millions of poor people, particularly people Thank you. Next, please. Thank you. Bye-bye. She was in North Las Vegas Council. Hello, my name is Frank Lopez. I live in East Las Vegas, and I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. This ordinance is not an attempt to safeguard the public, the homeless, or the marginalized within society. The sole purpose is to criminalize poverty. And by criminalizing po uh, homelessness and poverty, and by criminalizing camping, the very right to exist is criminalized. This ordinance also demonstrates that our government is not designed to protect the, bu the public, but is designed to protect private property and enforce private property relations. A truly democratic and representative government would, re would be ran by the workers themselves and would ensure that all of the needs of the people are met. It would ensure that everyone has housing, food, water, health care, and education. It would also ensure a proper justice system and a system of reparations to all of, all of those who have been exploited. Thank you. Mr. Lopez, did you leave your card with your phone number, please? I no, it's um, Frank Lopez. Uh, we really, I'm very serious, we want you to do more than just speak and put the council down. We want you involved to help, to be more than just advocates by mouth. We want to see you involved with us to help the homeless, please. Okay, next please after Mr. Lopez and make sure we have your card. He declined. Okay, well Mr. Frank Lopez has declined to be part of the help. He just wants to be an advocate. <clears throat> so, thank you very much, and yes, sir, please, again, fill out the card, put your phone number down, show the world that you really mean what you're talking about. So, please, sir, your name. Samuel Blasco, born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada, currently residing in 89147. Um, as my comrades before me, I'm here to oppose uh, issue 201944, which is the uh, item 70 on the docket today. In November, y'all passed 21936, effectively criminalizing homelessness punishable by misdemeanor and $1,000 fine. And there was an intent to pass another one, uh, making the same criminalization applicable to folks sleeping or resting in public areas scheduled for cleaning. Uh, these economic and violent attacks against our houseless neighbors and co-workers and fellow students will not be tolerated, and I urge you not to pass 2044. Poverty is not a crime of the poor, but of the ruling class, in this case, the downtown alliance against the workers who produce their wealth and your wealth, those of us who are rendered houseless by gentrification and other acts of beautification being the most vulnerable and being directly affected by this ordinance. Uh, we were never brought, nobody from, like, 
you know, non-government organizations or from the people who were brought to the table, only the Downtown Alliance was brought to the table, being very clear about who your priority is. So that's undeniable. Thank you, Mr. Blasco. And if you left your card and your phone number, you have a very strong family. The Blasco family has been very significant. Oh, too bad. They've been very significant in helping this city grow and develop it. Sorry, I thought you said you were, thought you were raised here. Please, your name, please. Morning. Um, uh, good morning, City Council. Um, I am Maria Teresa Lieberman, and I am here representing Battleborn Progress, but I do live on Craig and Decatur in Councilman Anthony's ward. Um, and uh, we are here, I'm here to represent our 20,000 um, subscribers statewide and say that we are opposed to this bill as written, um, as we were opposed to the last one, but as you've heard from one of my other colleagues, that going forward we would like to ensure that there is parity and equity in the fines so that those folks that um, can't afford to even have a car or even have a home, that they're not paying exor an exorbitant amount of money. So um, I'll make sure that they have my business card. You also have my information on there. And we would like just to ensure that um, fo experts and other community organizations are part of the process and we are happy, happy to be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Will Pregman, uh, P-R-E-G-M-A-N, uh, at 11652 Terenzio Court. I'm here in opposition to this ordinance, much like the last ordinance addressing this issue, I believe is counterproductive. You can't really argue that it helps the homeless and doesn't criminalize them when you impose a larger fine for sleeping on the street than for parking a car. We also just, the state just received a sizable grant from HUD that is $10 million to go to nonprofit organizations doing outreach to the homeless. I'm very concerned that that money gets wasted if the trust is broken down between people experiencing homelessness and those providing services such as the city or the county. I believe you should pursue affordable housing as an alternative. These ordinances risk abuse uh, for people experiencing homelessness and could lead to costly lawsuits for the city. That Ninth Circuit decision limits your actions in this matter, and I think you should take that into consideration. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jen Fleischman-Willoughby, F-L-E-I-S-C-H-M-A-N-N-W-I-L-L-O-U-G-H-B-Y. I live in 89113, but am proud to work in Councilwoman Diaz's district. Uh, I do want to thank you, Councilwoman Diaz, for voting against the last attempt to criminalize homelessness. I think that we can all sit here and know that it is common sense that somebody who is able to own a car should not have to pay a lower fine than someone who is forced to sleep on the street because they cannot afford to live in a home or rent an apartment. I think that we all know that it is ridiculous to assume that people who live on the streets are going to be able to pay a thousand dollar fine and we know that they're not going to be better off for spending time in city jail so I would like us to consider what else we could do to help the homeless I left my phone number on the card make the road Nevada has been proud to work with the homeless community as well as with our partner organizations and we'll continue trying to do the work that we can to actually help our community instead of just putting lip service on something thank, thank you. you thank you very much Hello, my name is Aranza Marmolejo. Wait, 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 wait. I'm so sorry, but it, could you spell your last name for me, please? Yes, M-A-R-M-O-L-E-J-O. -E Thank you. I hope you are having a good day. Uh, good morning and day, Mayor. Thank it's you. not a good morning to wake up in a city where we are criminalizing poverty, where occupying space during street cleaning can be fined up to $1,000 or even count as a misdemeanor. Don't you dare say this is not a homeless issue because if I were to leave my car during that cleaning time, I would not face the same consequences. When they are just trying to survive, we, uh, we need to be offering solutions. We need to show all our support to these vulnerable communities instead of tearing them down. We won't let you sleep until you give our people housing instead of putting them in handcuffs. And happy birthday. And thank you, wait, 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 wait. Do we have your card with your phone number, please? Ma'am? Okay, thank you. Kimberly Estrada, um, it's really simple. 
Um, the fact that there's a thousand dollar fine tied to this is the issue because our state still criminalizes tickets. So it's it's obvious that if someone can't afford rent, they can't afford to pay a thousand dollar fine and will be jailed. This rent. is criminalization of homelessness. Mm -hmm. And I just want a, a piece of advice. Don't tell a directly impacted person to do more because waking up every day as someone who's going through these issues is doing more than I'm sorry, any of you sitting up there will do. And I also just want to say that there are so many groups, before you tell me to, that I need to get involved, there are so many groups here that we are with that are, that are honestly on the ground working with people. Yes. These, are, these are the experts. Well, Directly impacted people you. are we the experts. It. These are the people and who should be making you. decisions. We and I am doing something it. by standing up here and opposing we this. We appreciate thank you. it. We appreciate also, you your help. Thank you. We have it. We have it. Thank you. We will be calling. Thank you. I am Bob Piccoli, uh, 9740 Verlaine Court. I am an attorney. Uh, I'm here in opposition to items 71 and 73. Uh, I wish to read into the record statements made by uh, Victoria Seaman councilman who is uh, supporting and sponsoring the repeal of the open uh, space Excuse me one sec, Mr. Piccoli, um, and let him start again. Um, because you're speaking, you may not have been here at the beginning of the public comment. I advised everybody that if they spoke now, they would not be permitted when I open for public comment at the time of the hearing of the agenda item. So I wanted to make sure you know here you have a minute. You may have a minute there or a little bit more. I'm not sure. But I just <clears throat> wanted you to know that not speaking at both. Uh, so you want to go out and start your minute again, but I just wanted to offer you that option. My question to you is, as an attorney that represents some of the, the homeowners, am I not allowed to speak at the second meeting? Well, that's what I've said, because we obviously, we've been doing this now for four years, so I wanted to offer <clears throat> you the opportunity to either speak now or then. Do you want to go now? Yes, I'd, okay. I'd like uh, the record to reflect what uh, Councilman uh, Seaman commented on when she okay, uh, please was start the um, start this time now. Thank was you. Was dealing with the issue of uh, marijuana dispensary in Ward Two. Her comment is, "Dear neighbor, my job as your city councilwoman is to listen to the residents of the ward, and your voices were heard loud and clear on the issue of the marijuana dispensary." The overwhelming opposition voiced against the dispensary at both public town halls, along with the stream of emails and phone calls opposing the dispensary that have come into my office, make it clear to me the residents of Ward 2 do not believe that the subject location is an appropriate one for a marijuana dispensary. Therefore, I have asked the applicant to withdraw the application for a special use permit. Using the very statements of Councilman Seaman, there has been so much opposition to the repeal of this bill that I would only say that please follow your own okay. statements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ne next, please, is this person that I see coming or a reincarnation? Hello, your name, please, sir. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Uh, for the record, Mark Vincent. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, Ward 4, Councilman Anthony's Ward. And I'm here today to speak uh, on something not quite as important as homelessness, but on items seven, in favor of items 17 and 18 on your deferred comp plan. Some of you know me as a retired CFO from the city of Las Vegas. And uh, when I retired, I had less than 19 years of service, which wasn't a big deal, but I had a deferred comp plan that I had with the city, and that enabled me to take a retirement for medical reasons. Uh, what you probably don't know is the average retiree has about 20 years of service, and so the deferred comp plan is very important for them. We started back in 2013, I think it was, when we first initiated. It's been an issue for decades on the costs of plans, deferred comp plans. And the biggest issue was having multiple plans where you've diluted your assets and you're paying exorbitant costs. 
you're paying about half a million dollars a year, excuse me, you're not paying, we're paying, the, the participants are paying half a million dollars a year in costs on those plans. And so the idea of consolidating them to one record keeper is gonna be a significant savings, and not only in the terms of record keeper, but your consolidated assets are gonna allow you to get access to uh, mutual funds that you wouldn't otherwise get because you've consolidated your assets. Thank you. Anyway, thank, thank you, you for the time. Thank you, it's good to see you. Thank you. Good, thank you. Yes. Wait one sec, please. <coughs> there, that? you're on now. Oh. Okay. Uh, Madam Mayor, yes. I'm speaking in favor of number 70, but I suggest this, an amendment. The cafeteria at the county building is empty, is not used after three or four. Right now, they don't even have it. They aren't even used it in their kitchen. I would like an amendment to explore adding additional entrances on the outside of the building and gating inside, which would allow the homeless to sleep on the floor, a carpeted floor warm, with a kitchen, classrooms, and a computer lab that sit idle overnight. I think uh, I would appreciate your calling, Council, uh, Commissioner Chair, Woman Kirkpatrick. Um, and, and that's uh, the county building. There are 38 acres there that the county sits on. I think it's a good idea, but they would be the ones, not us. I'd appreciate so it. So if you I would please give them a call, or um, that's Ward 3. Which district? Who is your counterpart? Weekly. Uh, Lawrence Weekly. Lawrence Weekly. So yeah, if you he's would, very good. But I, I was looking both. for a resolution saying well, consider. we can't do that with some, you know, property that's not ours, but I think that's Thank a you. great idea, so if you would follow up, please. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, I'm going to close uh, agenda item 12 and move on to 13 for possible action. Any items from the 9 a.m. session that the council staff and or applicant wish to be stricken, table withdrawn, or held in the abeyance to a future meeting may be brought forward and act upon at this time. Mayor Pro Tem, what have we got? Well, right now it's pretty quiet, Madam Mayor. Um, we don't have anything to obey, strike, or table at this time. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to 14. For possible action to approve the final minutes by reference to the December 4th, 2019 regular city council meeting. Um, may I have, uh, I would like to make a comment here. Um, before we go for approval of the minutes of the last meeting, I was not in town um, at the time of the last council meeting, and I know there was a vote taken to go back to one meeting a month um, for our planning commission, but I do want to um, voice my opinion on that as business should increase. We are here to serve the public, and should it look like these meetings that start at 6, I believe, are running more frequently to midnight to make sure that we are accommodating the public and meeting um, twice a month rather than just one. I, I think we are here for the public. Our planning commission that works so hard and is here, their appointed positions not elected, and each of us gets to appoint a planning commission. And like ourselves, we work at the behest of the public. So um, I just want to make that before you go ahead and move for your approval, which I say please go ahead, because <laughs> they're accurate. Thank you, Madam Mayor. But before I go and move for my approval, is there something you want to change? No, I just I just wanted to make the staff alert to that as we find the time is running because I know our staff is here all day and I know even right now in the clerk's office, uh, last night we had a planning commission that closed at what time? A little after 8. So our city staff starts at 7 in the morning, so when they're going to 12 or 1 or 2 in, in the next morning, that's and then have to be back at work, it's a little challenge. Without a doubt. So I just wanted to make a record that I really am, am very sensitive to that for the public. I want to make sure that uh, we keep a good eye on that, which I th believe Mr. Summerfield said he would and would advise. So just to have our planning commission on uh, alert that we can't do it past midnight. Uh, hopefully we won't have to do that. So and it's I've just gotten, making yeah, a record. I totally have the word of the new chairman, Lou DeSalvio, that if it go, they will, they're, all of them are up for a second meeting, so the public doesn't Good. wait. Yes. Wonderful. So, Madam Mayor, I move to approve the minutes of the December 4th, 2019 City Council meeting. Thank you. There's motion. Please vote and please post.
Okay, motion carries. Let's move on to agenda item 15. Um, this is on the consent. Um, items 15 through 61 on the consent agenda are considered to be routine, recommended for approval by departments, and may be enacted in one motion. Note that the record should reflect my abstention on items 39 and 40 because they pertain to the medical marijuana industry and related businesses, and one of my sons involved in that industry. I will be voting on the other items, and Council and Seaman, I understand you wish to make a comment regarding items Item 15. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We start off the new year the way we ended it, with another request for more funding for Badlands litigation defense. This is exactly why I'm so committed to taking the steps necessary to help create a pathway to resolving this situation for the residents of Las Vegas. Until that time's come, till the time comes, I will support this additional funding. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Okay, um, are there any items that council wishes to bring forward? Okay, and Mayor Pro Tem may I have a motion on the consent agenda, please. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the consent items number 15 through 61. Thank you very much. There's a motion, please vote and please post. Thank you, the motion carries. Okay, we have a time certain set on agenda item number 62. So let's, um, let me take a look. Mr. Arndt, are you here, Mr. Arndt? There you are, so sorry. Do you think this is something that um, I have 10 minutes of uh, 11, we have a time certain issue at 11. Um, is this something that hopefully, is there a, a long presentation? In which case we have to wait and I'll just uh, take a recess. Um, Mayor, we have a short presentation, so I think it shouldn't take more than five to 10 minutes, Perfect. but it's certainly your then discussion And that the is meeting. agenda item 64 or which one? 64 and also calling forward 68, which is a separate uh, vote, but the same transaction. So there'll be one brief presentation. Can't do it. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to have pulled you out. I'm looking at the time. That took two minutes of it. And so to read both of them, I can't even get it done. So if you will take a seat, we'll be right back after. We'll just take a brief recess for six minutes. And uh, so we're here, time certain, on agenda item 62. Thank you.
Garden Massage and Diana Yu Dai, individually as a as sole proprietor whose place of business is located 6706 West Cheyenne Avenue, Las Vegas County, Clark, Nevada 89108 as holders of massage establishment license number M03-00161, an independent massage therapist license number M12-00701 for violations of the Las Vegas Municipal Code. This, um, this issue is in Ward 4 with Councilman Anthony. And uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Hi. Good morning. John Curtis and Darcy Hurd for the City of Las Vegas. Um, good morning, Your Honor. Attorney Robert DeMarco appearing for Attorney Richard Schoenfeld with Chesnoff and Schoenfeld on behalf of Mrs. Dye and Jade Garden. Y Your Honor, uh, we're ready to proceed, but, but Mr. DeMarco uh, asked that he be heard uh, in advance of our presentation of our evidence in this case. And as a courtesy, I told him he, he could uh, make a short uh, uh, statement to the court. Uh, that is so correct, please, Your Honor. I appreciate that, counsel, Excuse me. Uh, your, your Honor, um, preliminarily, uh, Mr. Schoenfeld is the official counsel of record for Ms. Dye and uh, Jade Garden. Uh, we are respectfully requesting that this matter be held in abeyance until the February 5th hearing. Uh, Mr. Schoenfeld is currently in a mediation with six other attorneys and four experts, uh, many of which are from out of town. Uh, so that would be the n initial request, Your Honor, that uh, this matter actually be held in abeyance so Mr. Schoenfeld can personally attend. I'm not sure if uh, the council has a position on that at this time, but that's what we would ask first. And if the council denies that, I do have some other uh, comments, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to you. Uh, to, um We're ready to proceed at this time. And as, as far as his request for abeyance, as I, well, as I mentioned in briefings yesterday, okay. I was going to leave that to the leave that to the council's discretion. Okay, and I think while we all have been included with the information and background, yeah. I am going to take um, the liberty of giving this to Councilman Anthony in your ward. And as we proceed, any council members, as you have questions, please just tap on the table or put your hand up or something so I can see, and we'll go from there. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so uh, I understand your. Uh, your your request to obey this a um, couple issues though uh, number one uh, this was scheduled two weeks ago for today so uh, should have been ample time to to be prepared for uh, the hearing today uh, the second which is the bigger problem is according to the report uh, there were two undercover I'm sorry operations. Councilman Stavros our clerk wants me to make you aware it was two months ago, not two weeks ago. Oh, was it two months ago? I'm sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, it was two months ago. That's even uh, that's even worse. So, um, but the, the the main issue is, um, according to the report, uh, Metro did two undercover operations there, and there were two uh, soliciting for prostitutions, one in each case. So the issue is, I don't know if prostitution is occurring there today, and I don't know if it's gonna occur between today and the day that we obey it. So if you're, if the owner of the business wants to shut the business down during the abeyance time, then uh, I think we could probably entertain that, and we have to prove that it's shut down until the hearing. If she doesn't want to do that, then I have no reason to know whether illegal activity is going on there, which means you're going to have the hearing today. So if you want to ask her that, um, or if you know what the answer is, then you can tell me what that is. Uh, respectfully, I, I do not know the answer to that. I don't know if the council will give us a minute or two to discuss yeah. that. I mean, if, with that's your permission, Mayor, yeah, if you want to discuss that, that's a minute. That's I'll, I'll leave I, it up to the mayor. And, and I just want to say, obviously, we submit that there is no such activities going on there currently. And without going into the specifics, the one first allegation was in 2017, and the second allegation apparently was from 2019 with no issues uh, since, and there's no convictions actually in any related cases. But 
Uh, without going into the substance, Your Honor, I would maybe uh, like a, about a minute or two to discuss. I'll, I'll let the mayor okay, decide Thank that. you. We'll give you two minutes. Thank Is you, Dr. Your Honor. Wright, yeah, please. We'll just, that, you can step top. down where okay. it's more private <laughs> down there. That. So we'll just uh, Thank hold you, Thank a quiet you. recess here for two minutes, please. Thank you very much. You are right on time. I'm proud. I like people who stay on time. And now we're having a private conversation. Okay, we'll go ahead and state it on the record. Yeah, let's keep it right. Okay, Councilman, do you want to take it from here? We'll hear from Mr. Curtis and where. I believe, believe Mr. DeMarco uh, has one more thing to say. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you for uh, giving us a few moments to discuss this. Um, I have a proposal. Um, procedurally, we were going to be making an objection. We are making an objection to the fact that there's no live witnesses and testimony. And obviously, our client has a due process right uh, in light of this impacting her right to earn a living and also property rights, which the Nevada uh, courts have found to be entitled to due process. Uh, my understanding is there's no witnesses here today on behalf of the city and that everything comes from essentially police reports which as uh, the council is aware are hearsay and it's our position are inadmissible uh, and there's no ability to cross-examine witnesses. So preliminarily we would assert for today that the complaint should be dismissed on that ground alone. If the, if the council yeah. is not agreeable or does not uh, agree with that position, um, we would ask that as an offer of compromise that Ms. Dye would voluntarily relinquish her license in exchange for the complaint being dismissed with no fine being imposed. Um, and that that would resolve the issue for today, uh, for purposes of today. My understanding is the city is asking for fines to be imposed. Um, so with that said, um, unless the uh, council would agree with our position and with the uh, uh, offering compromise, essentially if the court overrules our procedural objections, then we would be done with it today. But if, if the council was inclined to possibly entertain any argument on this, uh, I think they're going to be asking for a $10,000 fine. Obviously, that's a substantial fine. 
and I would appreciate the opportunity for Mr. Schoenfeld to be here present to address that, and it would only be basically less than three weeks. So, I, and this is why I think it's important to highlight that Mr. Schoenfeld is the main attorney here. I appreciate uh, Councilman's uh, concern and request. Obviously, shutting down a business for three weeks uh, is a very significant uh, issue. And so, uh, Ms. Dye preferably doesn't want to do that. Um, but so, I guess just in, in, to summarize it, number one, we'd ask that it be held in abeyance until February 5th period so Mr. Schoenfeld can be present. If the council does not agree with that, and does not agree with our position on the objections on the procedural issues of no witnesses being here and violating her due process rights, then the, the second, or I'm sorry, the third option would be voluntarily re relinquishing the license with the complaint being dismissed with no fines, Your Honor. Could I ask a question? Uh, all right. May I be heard, um, Your Honor? Well, yeah. I just wanted to ask and then have you respond. But if, in fact, um, the uh, owner of the business surrendered her license, then the business can't operate, is what I understand, or can it without her license? No, it has, it, 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 this business, the surrender of the license becomes de facto shutting down of the okay, business. That's what but I But I'm not saying. hearing from them that they're all that eager to shut the business down. And what, and what my finely tuned ears tell me sometimes is that the surrender of the license without this willingness to shut the business down means that they're going to try to uh, transfer the license or sell what they have there, the lease or what have you, to someone well, else. The only thing I was concerned about, just for my own edification, was to find out that if the owner of the business surrenders his or her license of that business, the business automatically is closed according to city code. If that's not true and without the license of the proprietor of the business, not there and having surrendered, they can continue to operate, that's clear. So what's the answer? If in fact the proprietor surrenders, surrenders the license, licenses. the business is closed. Yes. Okay, that's what I need. That, that, that's okay. But, 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 so uh, if you want to let him then respond, and then he wanted um, to comment or whatever you do. What you well, want. Um, I mean, the, 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 the main issue here is that the business needs to shut down because there's prostitution occurring in there. So. Um, so if my motion was to revoke the license, which it says here, revoke the massage establishment license and independent massage therapist license uh, for Diana U. Day um, without, without uh, attaching a fine to it, you guys are okay with that? Uh, indulgence, Your Honor? Because that's the motion I'm, I'm going to make eventually. Yeah, it's only just for both. Right. Save yourself. Right. And it's voluntarily, and we don't have to worry about dealing with anything else down the road. I just don't, I, I'm still suspicious when they start talking. Uh, you, Your Honor, just to um, clarify that point, we would uh, also request that technically the complaint be dismissed in that. Uh, arrangement, but no, that, 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 that's not acceptable. If, if, they, if they want to turn it in with it now, there will be a, a finding of revocation. There would have to be a finding. So of revocation. I'm kind of, I just, I'm kind of getting to maybe a little bit ahead of myself. So um, uh, that, that, what, what, that's what I'm hearing so far. I mean, it sounds like we probably need to do the hearing. Well, you, uh, but that, from what I've read so far, um, that's probably what's going to happen. But we. But Indulgent, Your Honor. Go ahead. Your Honor, I have spoken to her. Um, assuming, like I said, that the council does overrule our procedural objections and declines to hold it in abeyance, which I'm understanding the council apparently would do. Am I correct in that? Well, I, I'm just speaking for myself here. Um, so we'd have to. I would eventually have to make a motion. I'm not going to make a motion to dismiss it. And I'm not going to make a motion to obey it with the building open. So my motion will be based on what I've heard so far plus the hearing. So if you want to make a recommendation prior to the hearing for me to make a motion on, I'd be glad to consider that. Well, I will clarify uh, if the council would agree on permitting 
the license to be voluntarily relinquished with no fine, uh, Ms. Dye would approve of that. Okay, so what, do you guys want to respond to that? Well. <laughs> Relinquished, but as long as it's revoked by city council so that it is noted and the record was Sorry, made. Did you step yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not relinquishing the license because that's her surrendering the license. But if the city council is voting to revoke the license, and because you're not dismissing um, the, the case. My, my motion based on what he just said would be to revoke. It's, it's your recommendation to revoke the license. That would be my motion based on what I heard the attorney say. Yeah, so we're, we're fine, with, we're fine with the revocation. Yes. We're okay. fine with the revocation and a surrender of the license without hearing if they're willing to do that voluntarily. Okay. We do not want a dismissal of these charges. I think it's important that there is a finding, at least that we don't have to go through all the uh, chapter and verse of the allegations, but at least a finding of revocation on the record. That's what we're looking so for. So do I need to make a motion for that, or you guys just handle it today? Well, if, he's, if, they're, if they're agreeing to do it, we just need to have them agree to that on the record, and then I'd ask you to make a motion. Okay. Um, and just, just so that all of us here that are going to be voting, I'm wondering, and it's a question, it's not a dictate here, um, but going through you, Councilman, um, is this a good idea? It sounds like you need to talk with them, and so there's no confusion, so that you bring back to us when Councilman Anthony says, if I do this, this happens. If I do this, this happens. Should we trail this? For a, a five or ten minutes might, might be helpful. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Honest. Is that all right yeah, with you? Okay. Yeah. So let's, we will trail this for, what time is it, anybody? What time is it? 11.18. Uh, trail it to what? Give me a nine. time. 11.30. 11.30? Okay. We'll trail this to 11.30. Gives you time to be clear to come back to us and tell us whatever you're recommending. All right. Thank, Thank you, Diana. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So, Stacy, you'll remind me at 11.30. Okay. So, now we move on to 64. We will now hear abeyance item number 64 and 68 together. Number 64 is discussion for possible action regarding a disposition <laughs> development agreement, DDA, between Southern Land Company and City Parkway 5, Inc., CPV, for the sale and development of parcel D in Symphony Park, for the construction of Class A multifamily housing office commercial amenities, and agenda item number 68 is R-50-2019, discussion for possible action regarding a resolution authorizing the City Parkway 5 to sell parcel D within Symphony Park, located Symphony Park to the north, Grand Central Parkway to the west, future West Carson Avenue to the north and future Promenade Place to the east for the purpose of economic development without first offering it to the public and for less than fair market value to SLC Development Inc. for the development of multifamily housing, commercial space amenities in Park Symphony Park, Ward 5, Councilman Creer. And here we go, Mr. Hello. Welcome back. And uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, did you also read in item 68? I just read 68 that's here. Do I read it again? From, uh, oh, that, I read that's the whole fine. Thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of City Council. For the record, Bill Arndt, Economic and Urban Development Director for the City of Las Vegas. Joining me this morning are Tim Downey and Alex Wooden of the Southern Land Company. And we're really excited about this project and what it means for our city. Uh, before I explain the project, I do want to make one brief clarification on the record between uh, the prior item that was scheduled at the prior meeting and to bring it forward today after the abeyance. Uh, there was uh, an error in uploading uh, one of the documents. One of the lines got dropped in the document. It's not substantive and should not influence or affect your decision, but as a technical correction, I wanted to make that correction on the record. In section 10, conditions to close of escrow, which is section 10.1, uh, item C uh, was deleted. Uh, we would like this added in the final document for the transaction document to be signed, and it should read as follows. Escrow agent is prepared to issue the title policy as required herein, end. Uh, so that is the only change. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as you looked at at the prior council meeting. We've also updated the schedule, the fact that we've lost uh, roughly a month since the last schedule, so the schedule performance 
in the agreement uh, has been pushed back 30 days to reflect that all the dates are moving forward from the date of the council taking action. The transaction otherwise is the same, so I wanted to outline the transaction for the city. And again, we're really excited about the project. This is a disposition and development agreement with SLC Development Inc. This would uh, propose to sell parcel D in Symphony Park, which is a 1.84 acre parcel uh, in Symphony Park. Uh, it's uh, proposed to be a sale price of $2,500,000. Uh, SLC Development has already purchased Parcel C, which is an adjacent parcel in Symphony Park, and they would like to combine the two parcels into one larger parcel to facilitate this project. They would also ask that the city, uh, city vacate uh, West Bridger, which is a proposed street to be, that was to be put in between the two parcels, but by combining the two parcels, that's no longer needed, and this is a, a, a very common practice of vacating a uh, city right away in order to facilitate the project. The project will consist of at least two buildings connected via a sky bridge and a parking structure. Uh, the first building is required contractually to have a minimum 15-story structure uh, and contain no less than 200 multifamily residential units. And then the second building, uh, uh, and that first building also minimum, I'm sorry, of 12,500 square feet of ground floor uh, commercial space, which would include restaurant, retail, or flexible office space. The second building is a minimum four-story structure, also containing 200 units and 10,000 square feet of amenity space to be shared by both buildings. Uh, the project is anticipated to start construction in September, October of 2021, next year and take 36 months to complete. This is an exciting project for the city and for Symphony Park. I think it's validating everything that the city's doing with all the investment we're making in downtown and the interest for people to move into downtown and live in downtown. This is gonna be providing much needed quality market rate housing in our downtown and our partner is proposing to make uh, a very large investment, and I think you'll be very pleased to, to see what they're proposing today. Uh, before I turn it over to Tim and Alex, I would like to thank our team that worked on this transaction for the city, Tara Anderson, Tracy Reich, and our uh, council, Nick Niarcos, uh, and of course, thank Tim and Alex and their entire team. Uh, as you know, they've been building already in Symphony Park and have been a wonderful partner, and we're really excited to propose this project forward. Uh, for you to, your consideration today. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Tim and Alex who are gonna explain the, the vision for the project. Tim? Um, good morning, <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> Thank you. I realize this is a long day for you all, so I'll, I'll be brief. Um, we are very excited to be a part of Symphony Park. We've already, um, as you may know, have about an $80 million investment there and um, this one will be about a, another 150 million. We really believe in, um, we can create a wonderful place for local people to live that's fun and safe and mostly walkable, um, create some things for them to walk to. And um, I don't know that we'll ever be able to live quite up to the, the standard you set with the Smith Center. That's one of the most incredible buildings I've ever seen in my life. But um, we're going to try to continue to spend more and do better as rents have continued to rise in the market. And um, that I'll, I think we can show you some really quick pictures of what we're doing. Can you do that? Please. You know how to do Please. And, um, then I'll Thank you. We're terribly excited. Alex, again, if you could say your last name just so that we have it on the record. Please. Sure. Alex Wooden, W-O-O-D-I-N with Southern thank Land. You. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you all for hearing us. Uh, just some quick site context. As you all know, you're very familiar with the area. Um, as you can see here, block F and G is currently under construction. Block C and D is what we are proposing. Uh, here is a rendering facing to the north. It currently, the, our design team, both internally and externally, with GDA, the architect of record on uh, parcels F and G, are hard at work designing uh, the tower and, and project bill laid out. It's currently programmed at 18 stories, um, and so it will provide a very unique uh, project that will hopefully complement the Smith Center and provide a new level of housing within uh, downtown Las Vegas. 
Uh, here's another view of that project. We're really trying to incorporate varying styles of architecture so we don't wind up with one big homogeneous, uh, very similar color, very similar styles. We really want to create a differentiated project um, that is very uh, complementary to our current project as well as the Smith Center and the hotel that will soon be breaking ground there. Um, here's a, a view looking downtown from the amenity deck on the, I believe it's the 12th floor, as well as along promenade here, you can really see we're trying to pull in uh, the potential for an art deco type style uh, to, again, to help complement uh, Auric uh, that will be across the street, create a lot of shaded uh, walkways for pedestrian walkability, and really activate the, the ground floor and area around Symphony Park. With that, uh, Mayor, members of council, we're very excited to recommend approval of this project. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions about the transaction and, of course, any questions regarding the design or the vision for the project. Certainly uh, allow our partner a chance to address the council to that as well. Yeah. So thank you very much. And it's wonderful to look out the window and watch the progress. I gather it's the building on the left that's currently under construction on this rendering? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay. So you're looking for an eclectic change here, or are you looking for compatibility with change, or you're looking for uh, harmonious it's really a, a harmonious mix. Uh, there will be change from, from phase one, the, the project that's currently under construction. It will be a wide array of unit types, unit mixes to accommodate all prospects of renters, whether it be a working young professional, potential uh, you know, couple that would like to downsize out of an existing home, married couple with children. We'll, we will have a wide range of unit types and sizes available in this project. Okay, and how about parking? Because uh, um, we're always, obviously, we have new garage, and that is part of the downtown Symphony Park. But just wondering, is that part using the facilities that the city has already put up, or are you incorporating that? So if you look on this rendering, it's somewhat tough to see, but right under block, where it says block C and D, we're proposing a three-story parking garage that will self-park our entire project, including oh. a majority of the retail space. So we are addressing the parking, and we have worked tirelessly with Bill and his staff, which, uh, if I may, have been wonderful, and I thank them for their time um, to address the parking adequately. Beautiful. Okay, questions. And, uh, Councilwoman Seaman. And, uh, pardon me, Mayor. I've Part of the interruption, but also I'd just like to put one other business item on the record. I've neglected to mention we are providing some uh, monies for environmental remediation. So out of the purchase price that they pay, we are offering uh, monies back to the developer up to a cap or ceiling of $3 per gross square feet of land. The site is approximately 80,000 square feet, so this is less than a quarter million dollars and less than 10% of the purchase price. Uh, there is still some environmental cleanup that needs to be done. Any monies needed above and beyond that dollar figure would be the responsibility of the developer. So I neglected to put that on the record, and I just want to make sure I put that on the record. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please, uh, Councilman Seaman. So forgive me if I miss this, but when would you break ground on this exciting project, and when would you anticipate the completion date? The uh, proposed groundbreaking, I believe, is in September or October of next year. Uh, we are beholden to a scheduled performance as part of the documents that you have in front of you, uh, and we fully intend to meet those obligations. If, uh, assuming we do break ground on time and on schedule, then we will complete construction, I believe, in 36 months. Um, Councilman Anthony, anything? Any comments? No. Um, Councilwoman Diaz, Sansman, no? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem, please. Thank you. Um, it is very exciting, and, uh, and I love to see our downtown uh, be built up like that. In this particular slide that we're looking at right here, it's, it, I'm really focused on all of your palm trees that you have there. Um, I'm not a fan. Just to let you know, I think they're like a telephone pole with a bush at the top. Is there, uh, are you open to discussing that landscaping if your councilman is open to that? Because palm trees don't give shade, it's downtown, we want everyone to be out and walking, and that out of your, this project is so beautiful, 
the palm trees is just like a killer for me. Of, of course, we'd be happy to. The, I think we've, we're just following what was, has already been done there. So if, there's a, if we can introduce another plan, we'd be happy to. Um, Thank you. Great. I would like to add that these renderings, as they stand in front of you, are still very conceptual in nature. They are likely to change, working with Bill and his staff, uh, bringing in input from the city planning commission. We will address those concerns. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Creer, you lucky man. Yeah, tell me about it. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Welcome back to Las Vegas. Uh, Mr. Downey and uh, Mr. Wooden, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to have your project uh, in Ward 5. Uh, many of you may or may not know, uh, a team of us had the pleasure to travel to Nashville to look at some of their projects and to see their corporate headquarters, um, as well as we traveled to a few other places looking at projects in, that, in, the, in the area. Um, and seeing your projects and the quality projects that you have developed, the um, level of professionalism of your entire team, uh, and uh, the quality of your organization put a lot of trust in myself that you're going to build the project that you say you're going to build. Um, looking at the groundbreaking of your current project in Symphony Park and seeing how swiftly you moved to, to go from uh, concept to actually putting shovels in the ground also lends a high level of confidence in us that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Um, and I, I just really believe that you're going to build a, a beautiful product that is going to enhance Symphony Park, um, enhance our downtown corridor, and ultimately enhance Ward 5. Um, this falls, once again, right into our project of our Ward 5 works, where we're looking to get people trained, ready, prepared to go to work. And so uh, we'll be looking to work with you in terms of finding opportunities for people within our ward to go to work. Um, I've said this many times, Ward 5 has an unemployment rate of 15 percent, and we're doing our best to make sure that people are trained, ready, prepared to go to work. And as we're bringing in business, we need to get people prepared to go to work in those businesses. So we'll be looking to work with you on that end as well. Um, and uh, I thank you for coming to Las Vegas. We welcome you. And, and therefore, uh, you'd like to make a motion on the agenda. Therefore, <laughs> I'd like to make a motion for approval for item number 64. Thank you very much. There is a motion to approve on agenda item 9, uh, 64. Please Thank vote. Please Sundry. post. Yeah. There it comes. Thank you. And on agenda item 68, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you, uh, item 68, I move for approval. Thank you. There's a motion on agenda item 68. Please vote and please post. Thank you. Wonderful. Congratulations. We just hope you move up. I know Councilwoman Seaman, and I know she'd love to see that go quickly. <laughs> so please, on 68, let's move into 2020. Please. Yes. Thank Council you very much. Career, if you'll get with me about your program with yes. there's such a labor shortage right now for construction for both skilled and non-skilled, we'd be happy to Yes. Talk. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, agenda item uh, 65. Oh, we, we're back. 62. I think we have an agreement on yes. item number 62, oh, which please. will short, shorten things substantially. Okay, go ahead. Please, we're back on 62. Oops. Your Honor, if I may put it on the record, uh, subject to council's agreement, uh, stipulation, uh, the licensee, which is uh, a Jade Garden Massage and Diana U. Dye are going to stipulate to a revocation of their license. They will not be admitting to any of the allegations in the, in the complaint, but they will stipulate the revocation and, and agree that the license will, will be revoked effective immediately. There will be no $10,000 fine associated with this, and uh, they will be closing the business within the next few days by, by the end of the weekend at the latest. Uh, that is correct. Just want to clarify, Your Honor, consistent with the answer of denial and without any admissions, my client for resolution purposes is agreeing <laughs> to the revocation of the license with no fine being imposed. That is correct. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councilman. 
I would ask that a motion be made. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that a motion be made for revocation, uh, subject to the vote of the council at this point. Okay, my motion is what Mr. Curtis just said. <laughs> just uh, both licenses here are hereby that both licenses be revoked for Diana U. Dye and a Jade Garden massage. And Immediately. No, no fines. Immediately. Thank Immediately. you. And so business ceases as of now. Yeah. Okay, that's my motion. Okay, this motion, please vote. This is on agenda item 62. What happened here? Yeah. The, okay. That motion carries. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Your Honor. Much. Just wanted to clarify if the minutes could also reflect th that there it, there was no admission by the client, but for res resolution purposes, Your Honor. Right. And I think Mr. Curtis reiterated that, so the thank record you. has been made. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank your, your time. Honor. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Take care. Now we're at agenda item 65, discussion for possible action regarding a First Amendment to sublease agreement between the City of Las Vegas City and the Economic Opportunity Board of Clark County EOB to an additional office space, bringing the total leasable area to 1,740 square feet, located as 350 West Washington Avenue, redevelopment area. This is Ward 5, Councilman Creer. Mr. Arndt. Thank you. Good morning again. Bill Arndt, Economic and Urban Development Director for the City of Las Vegas. With me this morning is Lawrence Beasley, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Economic Opportunity Board of Clark County, uh, also known as EOB. EOB currently leases administrative office space at the historic Westside School and is a great partner, of course, of ours, not only leasing space, but the services that they provide in the community. Uh, they are expanding and would like to have an additional office space which would uh, bring their original 917 square feet of space, an additional 823 square feet of space, or 1,740 square feet total. Uh, this additional space would be uh, under a lease with uh, one year, with four one-year options to extend, subject to board approvals for EOB. The rent uh, is essentially staying the same on a per foot, uh, square foot basis which is a dollar per square foot, $1,740 total. The tenant also is paying common area maintenance costs of 35 cents per square foot or $609. Uh, and the city, in order to enable uh, EOB to take advantage of this space, there are some tenant improvement expenses that EOB has to bear. Uh, so the city will be providing an amount not to exceed $12,000 against actual expenses. And of course, we will recoup that expense as the city through the rent paid by EOB. I'd like to thank Mr. Beasley for working with our team, Julie Quisenberry, on this transaction, and also to thank him and his organization for the services that they provide for our community. So with that, I'll introduce Mr. Beasley. Uh, good morning, Council. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to allow us to expand our footprint. Uh, we are currently located at the historic West Side School. Uh, we currently provide services in one suite there. Uh, we are looking to expand our footprint uh, so that we can provide some better services to the community. Thank you. Um, is this quick start funding that we're putting forward, the 12000 for improvements, or is that just the different redevelopment fund? Uh, again, for the record, Bill Arntz. Uh, Mayor, essentially this is self-funded through the, the school, so the city owns the asset. Our office manages the property as a landlord, and so there's funds through this lease as well as other leases that we have at the school. So there's, uh, it's essentially self-funded from, from the property. So we're not uh, taking incentives from, from other programs, and so all the, the monies from our typical incentives are available for other businesses in, in downtown and in the neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Weasley, too, um, EOB used to be on H. and Owen. Um, are there facilities still there? Is there leasing there by EOB or no? Uh, no, we are currently all housed at the historic West Side School. Because mm. okay. I worked there in 1968, 69, right there. So just a little fondness there. So <coughs> any questions, comment? Yes, please, Councilman Knudsen. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Mr. Beasley, do you mind in the maybe two or three minutes kind of summarizing the, the core mission and responsibilities of the EOB? I was 
aware of historically what they were, but I'm not now. Sure. Uh, currently, we are the newly redesignated Community Action Agency for Southern Nevada. So we provide services that help with uh, those individuals who are in poverty. Uh, we also manage the KCEP radio station, which is also housed at the historic West Side School. Uh, we provide four programs, uh, primarily uh, centered around uh, family supportive services, workforce development services, uh, English language learning for parents of students in school, and uh, we currently manage the Martin Luther King Jr. Senior Center. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilman Greer. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Mr. Bleasy, great to see you today. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I move for approval. Thank you, I think we've heard from Council, no one else had comments, so there's a motion to approve. Please vote and please post. That motion carries, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, we're on to agenda item 66, discussion for possible action to rename a senior center and co uh, sports complex located Bonanza Road, Las Vegas Boulevard, as Doula Community Center at the Doula Complex. This is also in Ward 5, Councilman Creer, and I see our wonderful head of Parks and Recreation. Good morning, I think, still. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. Greg Weitzel, Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Las Vegas, with the great pleasure of introducing our Vice Chair of our Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission, Mr. Larry Schultz. Morning. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Good to be back again. And it's good that we're constantly updating and improving our parks and recreation facilities throughout the city. So today, um, we want to start out by thanking Councilman Creer and his team uh, for assisting and providing fine support for the ongoing and soon to be completed renovation of this wonderful center on Bonanza and uh, Las Vegas Boulevard. And just in case, uh, let's see, we have that here. Uh, this is the current f uh, footprint uh, of the uh, center and uh, the facilities currently are comprised of a senior center, of a uh, gym and a municipal pool. Uh, the center was closed over the last seven months for <coughs> significant renovations and the renovations uh, basically you could see some of the work that was done here. This is not everything that was done, but some of the work that was done. And uh, this affected an ADA-compliant front desk. It affected a, comp uh, a computer lab, uh, meeting and restrooms, as well as other ancillary improvements. So currently, the center and the facility is uh, slotted for the grand reopening, which is scheduled for Thursday, January 23rd at 2 o'clock. So that's the current plan. Um, con uh, Councilman Creer wanted to uh, name or rename the overall facility so it's easily recognized within the community and can synergistically encompass uh, the combined multi-generational facilities that will continue to serve Ward 5 youth, seniors, and adaptive recreation participants. Uh, the center complex name will continue to recognize fallen officer Robert F. Dula Jr., who uh, was killed in the line of duty back in August of 1955, so that's a long time ago, but that center will continue to recognize his name. So at the last uh, January 7th Parks and Recreation uh, Advisory Commission meeting, the commission uh, heard uh, the story uh, shared by the uh, councilman's staff, and as a result of that, the commission felt very comfortable in unanimously voting to accept the councilman's recommendation that the newly renovated center 
be now referred to as the Dula Community Center at the Dula Complex. So on behalf of the Commission, I recommend that the Council uh, approve the renaming uh, of the newly renovated Ward 5 facility uh, located up Bonanza Avenue and Las Vegas Boulevard, again as the Dula Community Center at the Dula Complex. And thank you so much again for your time and consideration. Thank you. Yeah, we're excited about this, and I know the renovation's been terrific, so especially keeping the pool open. So any comments, questions from council here? Okay, Councilman Greer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schultz, for one, your dedication and commitment to our, our, our parks and our city. Uh, you are a, definitely a committed individual that really cares about the betterment of our, of our parks. So I appreciate that. And to all the other members of the uh, parks board, I appreciate them as well for their support on this. You know, if you look at what was going on at, at, at Dula, um, we had a number of different moving parts that are happening at Dula. Uh, and now it's just a perfect time for us with the renovation of the center to make it easier for people to understand about the Dula complex, because it is more than just a Dula complex. I, growing up, you know, I thought Dula was the pool, and then you think it was the gym, and then you think it was the senior center, and, and it's, it really is combined into one. So hopefully people will realize that when they come down to the Dula complex, there's multi-facets that are going on there. And, and also just thank you to our Parks and Rec team for putting resources towards in an in, in area that needed rehabilitation. Uh, thank you for coming back into the city. Many times we're expanding out and we need to look within and uh, this will greatly affect not only Ward 5, but I think members in Ward 3 as well who utilize that uh, center. So if there's no further conversation, I'd love to make a motion for approval. Thank you very much. There is a motion to approve agenda item number 66. We're thrilled. Please vote and please post. And yes, thank you to everybody that's been involved in thank you, renovating this fabulous complex. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Councilwoman Mayor Pro Tem Fiore for number 67 it has to do with uh, marijuana and I have one of my sons involved in that business. Um, and uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Agenda item number 67 is a discussion for possible action regarding the approval of a new compliance permit for a retail marijuana store License for Essence Tropicana LLC, DBA Essence at 2307 South Las Vegas Boulevard, Ward 3, Councilwoman Diaz, Mrs. Well, not Macalone. <laughs> uh, Darcy Edelby Heard, Business License Section Manager. Um, this item is for a new compliance permit to operate a retail marijuana. Um, Retail, retail marijuana store. They are one of the new 10 retail locations that were approved by the state. Um, this location that they're moving into already has a medical and retail operating there. As since it's their sister company, we did confirm with the state that they're okay to have the third location at this, at this site. Thank you very much. Is there any comment from council? Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. And with that, I move to approve item number 67. Motion passed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have already um, dealt with agenda item 68, so we're on to agenda item 69, boards and commissions. Discussion for possible action regarding the appointment of wonderful councilman Brian Knudsen to the Southern Nevada Regional Planning Coalition. The term of office for this seat has no expiration date. Members serve until they're replaced. Councilman Knudsen will be joining Councilwoman Seaman to represent the city of Las Vegas on this board if, in fact, he um, uh, agrees. Yes? Okay. That will be my motion. And so please vote. Lucky you. There you go, Mr. Knudsen. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, um, because we have a time certain um, on agenda item, what, seven, what 62. is it? 63. 60, 63 at one o'clock. Um, and because um, we have, uh, what I'm going to do is be pulling uh, agenda item 77 forward. 
Um, we're going to take um, a recess now in order not to mess with that. And I don't know, um, can we, while we recess, can we just pull that 77 forward now? Or do you want a, a time certain for us to have the closed session? Uh, Mayor Jeff Dorkak, Deputy City Attorney. Yeah, I would recommend pull 77, read it into the record. We'll go in the back into closed session if you want to set that till 1 o'clock on the nose so we can come back out for the hearing. So we'll do closed session in the back and obviously an opportunity to recess and eat if the council okay. so desires. So we will do 77. I'm going to read it and we'll do it immediately. We'll do the closed session now. And we will be back here at 1 o'clock sharp? Correct. For, okay, there we go. So agenda item 77, I am reading it in. Closed session. Closed meeting is called in accordance with NRS 241.015, paren 3, paren B, paren 2, to receive information from the city attorney about potential and existing litigation. Um, and then we will be back here a few minutes before 1 for the um, time-specific hearing. So we are in recess. Agenda item 63. Okay. Another day in paradise. Yes, <laughs> Time certain 1 p.m. Hearing and discussion for possible action regarding complaint for disciplinary action against RTB Inc. DBA 512 Rodney Purdue and Bruce Purdue and Tracy Farley whose place of business is located 512 Fremont Street, Las Vegas, Clark County, Nevada 89101 as holders of Tavern Limited license number. L65-00011 slash P64-00191. And nightclub license G64-05236 for violations Las Vegas Municipal Code, Ward 3, Councilwoman BS. Good morning, Your Honor. John Curtis and Mary McElhone for the City of Las Vegas. Clyde DeWitt for the respondents. Mr. Wood. Your Honor, we are prepared to go forward right now. We have witnesses ready to call. I'd like to make a short opening statement. I believe my opposing counsel wishes to make a short opening statement as well. Is that correct, Mr. DeWitt? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I may proceed at this Please. point. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the, the city does not bring these actions to revoke business licenses lightly. There generally has to be a pattern of behavior that shows that the privileges that are accorded and afforded uh, business people have been violated over a length of time before we seek to, to revoke the license. Unfortunately, the operation of the 512 nightclub down on East Fremont Street over the past two years has shown a pattern of violence, code violations, uh, duplicity on, on behalf of the ownership, uh, a drive-by shooting, police officers uh, being forced to separate customers on a regular basis, police officers being struck, patrons being left in the street for unconscious, uh, this going back two years, almost since the inception of the license. Because of this pattern, we have brought this complaint. We have both uh, Deputy Pl uh, Business Licensing Director Mary McElhone here to testify, as well as uh, multiple uh, officers from Metro Police Department who can itemize the chronology of violence, which has brought us to this place right now. Unfortunately, we, uh, it's the city's position at this point that this is simply the wrong, wrong business in the wrong place at the wrong time, and their license needs to be revoked. Uh, before, I, before we begin with evidence, I've, I've given my opposing counsel the courtesy of stating he can, be, he sh he can speak now before we, we commence with the evidence, if, the, okay. if it pleases the counsel. Thank you very much and welcome. And please, if you would, Thank state you, your, your name clearly again for the record. Um, also, for the record, I have uh, tendered to the clerk uh, an answer, responsive pleading, and I, she has it in her hand there, and I sent courtesy copies to the council uh, yesterday evening. And uh, I am going to ask, at least as, as far as my half of the case is concerned, uh, that the council put the matter in abeyance. I see they have a lot of witnesses here, and I don't want the witnesses to have to come back and all that. But 
until yesterday morning, we thought the club was sold. And so I did not prepare for a hearing because if the club was sold, that would be that. And so yesterday, I started scrambling around preparing for a hearing. I still have one witness I haven't even been able to get a hold of, much less prepare. And so if I, what I would like is to uh, have the matter held in abeyance after the city puts on their witnesses, if the city would prefer to do it that way. Um, I would point out that <clears throat> there was a dramatic change in the business in May. Um, there was a 10-day suspension, emergency type suspension imposed. During the period of that suspension, uh, the club did the following. They added metal detectors, added patron scanners, facial recognition technology, um, and so forth. Third-party security officers changed the music format, changed the name of the club, repainted the front of it from red to black, um, and started working on trying to uh, initiate a restaurant concept that would replace half of the club. Um, since then, of the incidents of the type that uh, my opposing counsel is talking about, there haven't been any of those, at least that we know about. And uh, for that reason, I don't think the city would be uh, any worse for, for where if my half of the case at least was continued uh, to a subsequent session. E even the first one in February, the second one would be better, but the first one uh, would be better than trying to do it today. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Curtis. At this time, we'll proceed. I will. Uh, I will uh, ask Mary McElhone to uh, give the city's presentation, followed by uh, testimony from the Metropolitan Police Department witnesses that are present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the record, Mary McElhone, Deputy Planning Director for the City of Las Vegas. So 512 received its initial tavern limited license and nightclub licenses on August 25th, 2016. It operated originally under the name of Red and had a name change to 512 on June 3rd, 2019. During the course of the last three years, there have been a pattern of violent acts and non-compliance issues at this location. Most of the concerns involved the security operations of the business where 512 failed to provide adequate security or the security staff acted in a manner to place the general public at risk. The disciplinary complaint documents uh, several violent incidents reported by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department involving security and the operations of 512. There are three incidences in particular where the patrons of the club actually went to a Metropolitan Police substation and filed police reports stating that they were assaulted and battered by 512 security. These incidents took place on and around July 8, 2017, July, July 19, 2018, and August 23, 2018. One witness, or victim, was also later diagnosed with an open fracture of his mandible. On December 23, 2017, a security guard from Evil Pie, a business located next door, was shot four times with a firearm. Per witnesses, there was a fight which occurred inside 512 between suspects and the 512 security staff. The suspects were kicked out of 512, but returned later in a vehicle shooting the security guard at Evil Pie. Evil Pie is located again right next door to 512. It is believed that the suspects mistook the Evil Pie security guard for 512 security. Mitchell will provide additional details about this later on. In the last two years, there have been two occasions where Metro executed emergency closure orders to close the club due to public safety concerns. The first incident happened May 5th, 2018 at 3.30 a.m. in the morning. Um, Metro conducted emergency closure of 512 for public safety concerns when a large fight broke out when 512 <coughs> failed to control its access line into the nightclub due to public safety. Prior to the night of the incident, uh, 512 had received at least nine warnings and several violations about controlling their patron line over the previous year. And on that particular evening, 512 again had line control issues. And at 12.45 a.m. in the morning, Metro had six officers close off the line due to public safety issues when patrons had to step off the sidewalk and into the traffic to get around the entrance. Also, the entrance to a neighboring business was blocked. 
the line was later reopened. And over the course of the next hour, two hours, our business licensing officers, who happened to be out there that evening, informed the business approximately eight times that the line was getting out of control again. At 8.30 a.m., a large fight broke out, and Metro uh, Special Investigation Section, SIS, responded and had to order an emergency closure of the business for public safety. The incident could have been avoided had 512 the proper security and procedures to control the line as required by the Las Vegas Municipal Code. The second emergency closure took place a year later, in May of 2019, because of two incidences that had actually occurred five days apart. On May 12, 2019, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's Fusion Watch cameras identified that a black male was lying on the ground in front of the 512 nightclub. A later review of surveillance footage disclosed that the male was assaulted, punched, and knocked unconscious by a security staff member of 512. No aid was rendered nor 911 called by staff. The man remained unconscious for 13 minutes, minutes while on the ground. Additionally, staff members of 512 were uncooperative when questioned and one employee denied witnessing the battery even when it was clear on the surveillance tape that he did actually witness it. On May 17, 2019, just five days later, a neighboring business called Metro reporting a fight um, which was later confirmed to be between 512 security and patrons. Three patrons were being injected from the club due to them wearing hats, despite them being let in with those hats, and individual fights then broke out with security in the front, front of 512. The three patrons regroup. However, one patron walks back for an unknown reason with his hands held up in a passive fashion, and one of the security officers sucker punches him, knocking him out. Um, Metro's SIS uh, performed emergency closure at this time, since this was the second incident where security used excessive force in less than one week. Uh, later on the hearing, Metro will also provide additional details on these two events. The Department of Planning has had multiple high-level meetings, January 18, 2018, May 8, 2018, April 4, 2019, May 22, 2000, 2019, with Rodney and Bruce Perdue, who are the owners of the club, to discuss the concerns over security practices and patron safety. These discussions also included concerns about hiring security personnel with gang affiliations from the outlaw motorcycle gang, the Chosen Few. Undercover detectives were also able to get concealed weapons into the nightclub on two separate occasions in 2019. And at the meeting, after the second closure on May 22, 2019, the severity of the issues were discussed, including the potential for a disciplinary complaint. Rob Perdue stated that he would make changes to the club by rebranding. This would include renaming the club, implementing a dress code, hiring state licensed security, and changing the music genre. A new security plan was ultimately approved and in place on July 2, 2019, which did include state licensed security. And by state licensed security, we mean a company that is independently licensed by the state's Nevada State Private Investigators Licensing Board. The owners and employees must complete a background check, and these companies also carry a City of Las Vegas business license to do work in the city. However, using state license security became an issue. An issue. Initially, a state license company, Core Invictus, was hired, but the contract ended in just a few weeks, and then another state license company called Bullworks was hired. On August 13th, 2019, the summer, Kenny Hubner, who is the owner of Bullworks, who is providing the service, copied Metro on an email to Rod Perdue, the owner, notifying, notifying him of his intent to end his state license security contract. Two days later, on August 15th, our business license officer speaks to Mr. Perdue regarding the reports that they are ending their contract with Bullworks to provide security. Mr. Perdue, in this phone conversation, states that Bullworks insurance provider is requiring a much higher premium, so they are going to provide nightclub security. Um, if they are going to provide it, they're going to look at some other options, which might include hiring Bullworks employees directly under them. Our license officer reminded Mr. Perdue that they had previously agreed on May 22nd that the expectation was that security would be provided by a state licensed security company. Mr. Perdue at that time said that he did not recall that. On August 23rd, a week later, 
Mr. Perdue again spoke to our license officer. Uh, he said that he was still working with Bullthorks through the end of September and would probably hire them directly. Mr. Perdue said he did not think he was required to have state license security. Mr. Perdue was again advised that having a state license security company was one of the expectations. He said he did not recall that. Our license officer advised Mr. Perdue and reminded him that he had to submit a security plan in order for business license review. On September 12th, three weeks later, Sergeant Beth Schmidt emailed myself, Mary McElhone, and in the email she asked me, downtown area command just had our meeting with um, FEED, which is uh, Fremont East, East District Coalition. 512's key employee told us at the end of September, 512 was severed their ties with Bulwark Security. He said 512 has now taken the security back in-house. After the meeting, Sergeant Schmidt called Kenny, the owner of Bulwarks, and Kenny stated that Bulwarks severed their ties with 512 was actually effective August 25th, three weeks earlier, and that 512 took the security in-house after that. And was the city aware that Rod had been staffing and running security in-house since August 25th? The next day on September 3rd, our license officers went out, conducted an on-site inspection, verified that Bullworks is no longer providing security. Uh, 512, as a result of this, received a $500 fine for violating conditions on their license, which states that they must operate in accordance with their submitted security plan. This plan had to be approved by the director, and all updates to this plan must be approved prior to the implementation. On October 17th, 2017, Business Licensing had a big meeting with Mr. Perdue. Um, he brought in a security plan, which no longer had a state license company providing. In the meeting, he led myself and others in the meeting to believe that he had an arrangement with Kenny from Bulwarks, whether it was uh, verbal or contractual. Um, he stated that he was hiring off-duty Bulwarks employees that the owner, Kenny Hubner, was providing. Mr. Perdue stated he did not want to hire another state license company. Um, I told Mr. Perdue at that time that we would take all the information under advisement and get back to him. On October 22nd, a few days later, I spoke to Kenny Hubner from Bulwarks, and he told me he was not providing off-duty security officers for Mr. Perdue, and that he no longer had a contract with him, whether verbal, written, or otherwise, and that if his employees were working off-duty for 512, he is not involved in that arrangement. Um, Mr. Vid Perdue was then advised um, that we needed, and our expectation was they have a, that he have a state license security plan. Um, once 512 learned that they had been placed on the city council agenda, they did submit a security plan that includes state license security, and that security plan was approved on December 3rd. So over the last seven months, there have, they have operated on and off with state license security. There have been compliance issues with each of the four on-site inspections that have taken place. The employee list has not always been up to date, as well as missing alcohol awareness cards, and we've had issues, what we just discussed, with the security plan that ultimately resulted in a $500 fine. I'm now going to turn this over to our Metropolitan Police Department. Um, I'm going to just to you, introduce to you Sergeant Beth Schmidt, who's going to provide additional de details. Thank you. May I examine? Any problem to go ahead with no, your response? Just, Please, ahead, do so if you would. Okay, you're not. Thank you're not you. Oh, no. Yeah, it's just, just have a seat. It'll be a couple more. Okay. And, uh, just a few questions. Um, does uh, the business now have an improved security plan in place? Yes. The business has an improved security plan as of December 3rd, 2019. And you don't have any reason to believe that they're violating it, do you? No, I have no reason to believe that they're violating it. So. All the security things are straightened out since uh, you approved. They submitted this on November 22nd of 2019, and you approved it, or your department approved it, on uh, December 3rd, 2019. That is correct. At this point in time, we don't believe we have any outstanding violations with the security plan. Okay. That's the only thing I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Yeah. Madam Mayor. And councilmen and women, for the record, my name is Sergeant Beth Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. What I'm here to do today is to talk to you about, Metro is going to speak, there are going to be three of us, us that will speak. Myself as a sergeant, 
Officer Gill as community policing officer, and Detective Hurtado, who is with special business licensing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show you some videos first, and what I want you to keep in mind while we show you these videos is that security's role at a nightclub, when they have a problem patron, they have every right to remove those patrons. And we encourage that. And we encourage them to call us when they have problems. And what we have seen is a pattern of behavior where when they remove someone from the club, they pursue them past the boundaries of the club, they chase them into the street, and they do a good old-fashioned beatdown. That is not acceptable. We have had people that have been seriously injured. We have had a result, which I will talk about with the evil pie shooting, which because of the way that Red Security treated patrons that they kicked out, those patrons came back and they were so angry, it's not okay, but they were so angry they came back and committed attempt murder by shooting a security guard next door. So I want you to keep that in mind. This behavior of security pursuing people out of a club and then beating them and punching them and repeatedly attacking them, that is not typical in the downtown area command. It is not something we see on Fremont East. And that's why we bring this to your attention. I'm gonna turn this over now to Officer Cody Gill. He's gonna show you some very compelling videos and um, he's gonna narrate those for you. Thank you. For the record, I'm Officer Cody Gill. I work in Downtown Area Command for the Community Policing Division. Uh, the first video set that I'm gonna show you is gonna be an event that took place on May 12th. Um, so video one, um, I'm gonna let it play through and then I'm gonna show it again while I narrate it. So if you can play video one for me. Okay, so this video takes place outside of Red, located at 512 Fremont Street. Uh, the security guards in the video are gonna be wearing orange shirts with black pants. Um, can we just start it from the beginning? Um, so I'm gonna give you a little background. Pause it, please. Um, in this video, you're gonna see an irate male. You can see him in the video. He's wearing a white shirt with blue jeans and black sneakers. Um, he is gonna be arguing with security and you're gonna see one of Red's security guards come out of bounds onto the public sidewalk around the barrier and engage um, the victim in this case uh, where he knocks him out. So if we can play the video. You can see he is out of bounds and he engages the victim. I'll just pause it real quick. Um, he knocks him out and he proceeds back into the club. You can see uh, a larger uh, male security guard in the back with his hand raised. He has a black baseball cap backwards um, and an orange shirt. He's acknowledging um, what happened. Um, he seems to be frustrated with that security guard. Uh, and if you play it just a little further, pause. you can pause it. He addresses um, the security guard who struck the male. Um, at this time, um, this is gonna be the same uh, security guard who was outside when Metro arrives on scene and he um, completely denies um, seeing it. He specifically states to officers, I wasn't out here and I didn't touch him. Uh, that just shows the uncooperativeness. At this time, I'd also like to show um, the general manager is um, right by the doors in the back. He is a white male, he's dressed all in black and he has a black baseball cap. Uh, he is su supposed to be responsible for all the employees. Um, at, when we originally arrive on scene, he states he didn't know what happened. He is the same um, manager who allows the suspect in this battery to leave out the back door prior to Metro arriving. Um, we conducted a records check with our dispatch and no one from Red um, calls 911 or medical. No aid is rendered to this victim and he is unconscious for approximately 13 minutes until medical arrives. Um, so and this, uh, this was picked up by our crime cameras that is how we found out that this happened, that no one called us. That's part of the agreement, that's part of the security plan. You have to let us know when things happen. 
13 minutes this man lay. We cut the video down, 13 minutes. No aid was rendered until our, secure, until our cameras picked this up and officers arrived. <coughs> Now you continue playing the video. You can see all the security and employees retreat back into the club like nothing happened. Um, and they're just concerned with their club and no actions of their employees. So we can play the next video. Let me ask you a question. Do you know who did call the ambulance? How did the, how did the uh, EMTs get yeah. there? Metro Fusion Watch cameras. Um, were able to observe a male down on the ground, and they were the ones who initiated officers to the scene. So we have officers and sergeants and lieutenants that sit up at headquarters and watch cameras, but those cameras are valley-wide, so you, they're not watching every camera constantly, and it was just as they were scanning through, they realized that there was, they didn't know what had happened. They saw someone that was out cold on the sidewalk and no one rendering aid, and so our downtown officers responded. So I'm going to play this clip right now. So his friends are, are rendering aid at this point. So the main part of this video is you can see an employee dressed in black holding a broom. They are more concerned with cleaning the area um, where the occurrence occurred. and. Um, no one is concerned with calling the police, calling for medical, checking on the victim. And in the video, this is approximately two minutes later, you can still see the general manager who's responsible for his employees in the background, just staring at the victim on the floor. This is a crime scene. We have seen in this valley where people have gotten knocked out, fallen down to the ground, to the sidewalk, in a club, and have died. This is a crime scene, and they're cleaning it up, and no one's let us know that this has happened. Yes, and the actions of the security officer are criminal at this point. Um, this is not normal procedure for security. Uh, whenever they have an event, they should escort the victim or rowdy suspect outside and call police, and that's what they failed to do. So can we play the next video, please? I'm going to let this... Next event. No, I'm going to let this play out. Just... We've now arrived on scene. We're trying to figure out what happened. And part of that is, is that as more officers, you can see our officers in the yellow trying to deal with this guy's friends who, it's chaotic. But what we're gonna do here shortly is we're trying to figure out how did this happen? We don't know. All we found is a man, did he fall? Was he knocked out? And so we begin an investigation at that point as we get more people there and we're able to control the crowd. All right, this clip's gonna be over. We're just gonna restart it from the beginning. I'm gonna give you some background. This is how disorderly the crowd becomes. Um, officers have to switch their attention from the victim on the ground to um, other subjects in the area. Uh, this is all due to security's actions. Uh, the, the Metro officers in yellow are bike officers. They were the first arriving officers on scene. You can see by the doorway, the same um, security guard I pointed out earlier is um, still out there uh, and just watching. Uh, can we play the video a little bit? So the suspect in this video is going to be a black male adult with a white shirt, blue jeans, and black and white sneakers. He's wanting to fight with security. Officers are attempting to have him walk away. Uh, he continues to disregard commands and attempts to force his way through officers multiple times. He goes around trees. Um, he tries to push his way through. Eventually, one of the officers is going to draw his baton uh, due to the suspect's actions uh, are increasing and escalating. If you can pause it right here, um, the officer in the middle of the screen standing next to the tree, he has a baton in his right hand. Um, this is all um, due to the suspect's actions. If we continue to play the video, eventually more officers arrive on the outside of the screen. Um, he continues to walk towards the club. 
At some point, the same officer with the baton drawn has to, I will pause it right here. Um, there's also a female involved um, on the bottom right side. He has to draw his uh, taser to control the situation due to the escalation. Eventually, both of these suspects are taken to custody and arrested. So we can play this video out and switch to the next one, please. The next video I'm going to show you um, just shows how many resources were required on scene for this particular incident and how it escalated. Uh, and uh, as well, you're going to see an employee um, come out and take a photograph of the victim while he is unconscious. This is going to be video four, please. Remember, this went on for 13 minutes before we got here. So if you pause the video, on the right side of the screen by the patrol cars, officers continue to arrive, as well as a sergeant. Um, this, this keeps growing, the crowd keeps growing, and we're still waiting on medical to arrive. This is going to conclude the videos we have for uh, May 12, 2019. Uh, we're going to now show some videos from May 17, 2019. Now, I want you to watch this first video. Uh, we're going to show it a few times because there's a lot going on, and I'm going to break it down for everyone. So the next set of videos, they're all um, going to be from the event only on May 17th. And red security in these videos are going to have orange shirts, and as well, some of them are going to be dressed in all black. A large fight breaks out in front of red uh, with security and patrons. Uh, security is seen going above and beyond their boundary and um, being extremely heavy-handed. This is not normal procedure for security, and it shows an intent um, to do harm towards their patrons. For the first part of the video, uh, when we replay it, I'd like you to focus on the middle of the screen. You're going to see a security guard in an orange shirt with a black baseball cap. He can be seen throwing punches at two males. He's going to proceed to engage fighting one of the males and chase him into the middle of Fremont Street, clearly off property, and a clear intent to do harm. Um, later, we'll show you exactly how far off into the roadway they travel. Um, and in the video, you can clearly see that the patron is attempting to retreat as the security continues to advance and throw punches. So if we play it, I'll pause it. Here you can see he punches two of the patrons. Pause it, please. He just threw the red chair on the left. We're going to focus on that part of the video first. Now he's going to chase the patron into the middle of the road. And by he, you mean a security guard? By security, red security red. guard. And he continues off screen to the right. Um, now I want to restart the video. Now I'm going to ask that you focus on the top side of the screen. You will see another security guard with an orange shirt and a black baseball cap backwards. He is seen tackling um, the male in this video wearing a white shirt and black shorts. Uh, he tackles the male to the ground, gets on top of him, and continuously punches him in the face. At the same time, you can see another employee from red, dressed all in black, a Hispanic male, holding down his legs as the security guard punches him in the face. Uh, we're going to play it out. It's going to be on the top side of the screen. You can pause it right here. Um, behind the male, by the red uh, chair, you will see the Hispanic male with glasses. That's a red employee. You're going to see him holding down the legs of the victim. And uh, you will see one of the security guards punching a male on the ground. And we can play it. Pause it right here. You can see the male on top of the security guard from red on top of the male. He has a white shirt on and black shorts. And uh, after he's done punching him, he's going to throw him towards the street. I'm going to continue to play the video. All right. Um, again, 
very heavy handed. Now there's a, a third fight that actually takes place involving another security guard at the same time. This time the security guard <laughs> is gonna be wearing all black clothing. He has a large metal chain around his neck. He's, he's a black male and he is bald. Uh, if we can start it from the beginning. This place, did, if we can pause it. It's gonna take place um, near the garbage cans on the top right side of the screen. You'll see the security guard grab the male, force his head into the trash can, and he's gonna pummel the male in the face over and over again, if we can play it out. You can pause it right here. At the garbage can, you're gonna see two males. One appears to be a Hispanic male. He's bent over, and the other male behind him is a black male adult. He's wearing all black with black and white sneakers and bald. He has a chain around his neck. Watch that male. Please play the video. Pause it. You can see him forcing the victim's head into the trash can as he continues to punch him over and over again. After he's done punching him, he's gonna throw him into a sign um, near the middle of the screen, the top middle part of the screen. This is no cover charge. Can you play the video out, please? And he's thrown on the floor. And the male runs um, north on Fremont. I want to switch to video three now. It's gonna pertain to the same male who was battering that male in the garbage can, hitting him over and over in the face. Um, I'm gonna play it out just so you can see and then I'm gonna um, point out some key factors of concern. So right now he's punching the male He walks back to the front of the club. Now he's walking up towards the bottom side of the screen. And he takes his necklace off. So we're gonna replay this, please. So I wanna draw concern. Um, he is a security guard of red. Um, he takes a large chain off of his neck and he wraps it around his right fist, which he was just using to punch this other victim. Um, he is seen in another video walking towards the victim in the street, and he is creating a weapon to do substantial harm, and he wants to continue fighting. And he does this by wrapping a metal chain around his right wrist. So if we can play it out, I'm gonna pause it so you can see exactly when he does this. As he walks back to the front of the club, you'll see a large chain around his neck. You can see the chain. We we'll pause it right here. You can see how thick that chain is. Now, if you can play it, he's gonna be going to the bottom right and he will take the chain off and wrap it around his right wrist. We're gonna pause it. You can see him wrapping it around his, his hand. So now we're gonna go to video four. Um, this video is gonna take place moments after uh, the, our last video, the fight ensued. I'm gonna let it play out. Please pay attention to the top middle portion of the screen and then I'll explain what happened. So in this video, you will observe um, the, one of the victims from earlier wearing a white shirt, black shorts, and a red baseball cap. He, he approaches the club to attempt to talk to somebody while on public sidewalk with his hands raised in the air um, in a peaceful manner, non-threatening, um, non-aggressive manner. As he approaches the club, one of Red's security guards comes out and punches him, sucker punches him knocking him out. He is knocked unconscious and his friends drag him away. As his friends are dragging him away, um, Red Security is seen following them on the sidewalk, well out of bounds. At no time did Red report this to, to the police either. This call actually came in from a neighboring business who reported it. So again, they believe that they can take matters into their own hands and be extremely violent. So we're gonna play the video and I'm gonna pause it at some key points. 
He has his hands in the air. Pause it, please. His hands are up in a peaceful manner. His fists are not clenched. He's not in a fighting stance. You can see the red security guard who just exited through the front doors wearing an orange shirt with a black baseball cap running up to the victim. If you can play it. He is going to punch the male. He punches him. Pause it, please. A little bit forward. Pause. You can see he's knocked unconscious on the ground. Now when we play it, you're going to see his body start moving along the sidewalk as his friends dragging him. At this time, I'd like to draw the attention to the male in all black. He is the same male with the chain from previously. He's going to be seen taking that chain off again, <coughs> putting it around his hand to create a weapon in order to do harm to these patrons who are not in their business any longer. Can we play the video, please? He's being dragged away at this time. So the next video I have is going to be video five. It's good. This is going to be Metro's fusion watch camera. And this is going to be an angle from farther away from Las Vegas Boulevard. And this camera is going to show the entire event take place. Um, it's going to occur on the left side of the screen, just above the ATM sign under the red canopy. <coughs> right over here where the cursor is pointing. If you could pay attention, the fight starts over there, and then you can see how far in the street the security guard from red chases the patron as he attempts to retreat. And you can see the security continue to throw punches. In this video, you will also see the black male in all black with the chain, <coughs> wrap the chain around his hand, or it appears to wrap something around his hand, and approach that same patron. So if we could play the video, please. So the fight is breaking out right now in front of Red. You can see Red security in orange chasing the patron in the street. It's right under the martini glass. They're literally, literally fighting in the street. And this is what I'm talking about. If the goal for security is to remove a problem patron, hey, it's nightclubs, we get it. Fights break out. We get that. We understand that. But to pursue people into the street, to beat them, to put chains around your hand, and to chase them fully out into the street, it's unacceptable. Just get them outside your door, and then close the doors to the club and call us. But that's not what's happening. And this is the only club that this is happening at. It's been an ongoing behavior. All right, we could pause the video. Um, I, believe, I believe that's it. Yep, Council at this time, that's all for the videos. Uh, as far as video goes, Council, have any questions? I do. Um, in the first place, this video, what's on the screen right now, what is it? There's no date stamp on it. At the same day? Yeah, it is, yes. So that's uh, 517. <laughs> <coughs> now, going back to the first one, the security guard who punched the guy and knocked him out, was he cited or arrested or charged with anything? He left the scene prior to officers arriving, so he was not cited that night. I don't know if there was a follow-up citation <coughs> at that time. And um, the same thing with the security guards in the second video, at the 17th, were they charged and arrested and prosecuted? We're going to have Detective Hurtado. <clears throat> she'll come up next and she'll okay. answer those, okay? And are you aware that all of the security guards involved in both of those videos were fired? I'm not aware. Okay. Um, and on the 17th, after all this commotion, um, you emergency closed the place, did you not? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> And it's, there was a 10-day closure? Again, that's going to be Detective Hurtado will we'll answer to those questions since, okay. the, since it was her group that did that. But as far as you know, <clears throat> that's what happened? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'll defer my questions. Okay. Further. Okay. Any other right. questions for us on the videos? No, okay. Uh, 
think that's going to make it. Thank you. Yep. So I just want to talk a little bit about the the evil pie shooting that occurred on December 23rd. That. Um, Ms. McLehorn referenced, and that was December 23rd, 2017. I did respond to that. At that time, I was a graveyard sergeant, and I, I did respond on the scene to that attempt murder. Um, in Mr. DeWitt's rebuttal, he says that there never was a fight within Red that night. Um, the issue with that one was, we got a call from Red, which is what we want them to do when there's a problem. We're not going to penalize them to call us when there's a problem. They called us and said, hey, there's a guy in the back that's in an employee area. So we came, we showed up, um, we did not have the elements to charge him with burglary after conferring with Red, and so the agreement was, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna issue a citation to this guy for trespassing. So we positively identified him. He had an additional group with him, and that group, uh, it, was a, it was six to seven people that were there that night. After we trespassed him and he was removed from the business, then uh, security removed the rest of his group. What happened was, despite the rebuttal, there was in fact a fight. There was an old school beatdown of, of his additional friends. Security beat them so badly that they tore the pants off of one gentleman. Those gentlemen that were, that were evicted from the club and beaten, an hour later, they came back. And you see it on the videos. They come by a couple of times, casing, in two cars. They came by, and they unloaded with a firearm. And the person who got hit was an innocent man. He was security at the next door business because they kind of blend right together. It's the same wall and just kind of blends together. And that gentleman was shot numerous times and I was one of the first people to arrive in Evil Pie and find him. Now in the rebuttal, Mr. DeWitt says that there never was a fight. He says that this gentleman who was, we were trespassed told us that he was going to come back and shoot up the place and that he was, in fact, uh, a passenger in the vehicle that shot. That is categorically not true. That gentleman that we cited was upset. Did he possibly say he was going to shoot up the place? It's possible. I don't pick that up on cameras. I don't pick that up on, on any of the interviews with him. It's possible he said that. But that gentleman never made contact that night again with his buddies. In fact, that gentleman was extremely cooperative in this attempt murder investigation. And the only way we found him was because we had issued a citation. We went out and found him and talked to him. He, he wasn't part of this. He separated from his group. So I just want to point that out. It, it's a pattern of behavior. Kick them out, close the door, call us. Don't kick them out and beat them down to the point that they're so angry they come back seeking retaliation. That's Anything? Uh, that, I have nothing further of, of Sergeant Smith. Uh, questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was just a little over two years ago, right? Correct. And uh, let me see if I understand you. The, the person who was cited for trespassing was not a passenger in the car from which the bullets came? That is correct. Okay, now could I ask the last video mm -hmm. that, that was on, uh, the one I had to point out that there was no timestamp, could mm -hmm. somebody, I don't know who's working this, but could somebody put that back on again? Sure, the one from our crime cameras? Yes. Sure. I think. Wh which incident, though? <clears throat> well. The one where there were multiple fights going on, okay. and they chase him into the street. Right. We we yeah. use this. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you want this this one right here? Yeah, stop. Right. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. Reds. You just just pause it for us, please. Pause it, please. Uh, you can see on the video Reds. That's a the awning. The, there's an awning, and the whole thing is painted red. Mm -hmm. Right on, above the uh, ATM sign. And then. Uh, the pizza place, Easy Pie, I think it's Evil Pie. Evil, oh, evil Pie, so E V E L Pie, um, is, is next to it. And I, what I want to point out is that there's no mistaking one of those places for the other. Um, it, it, 
it would seem to me. Is that a fair statement? I, I, I would say no, that's not. Having worked down there and at night with the crowds, I would say no, that, that's not. Their intent was to come back and shoot the guys that beat them down, and that wasn't the evil security, <coughs> security guard. He just happened to be outside. And because of the flow of everything there, the, the security from Vanguard, the secu which is just next to it to the east, Red and Evil Pie, look, they work together. At, it, they're all on at the same hours, those, so they move back and forth. Well, I, I, let me just clarify. How many feet apart is the front door to Evil Pie to Red? Is it like 20 feet, yeah. maybe? 30, 20 yeah. feet? OK, so. Like as about as long as that, uh, as long as the that piece uh, of wood, I would agree wood, with you. Uh, mm -hmm. Transom right there between us and the council. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And why are you, why are you sure that the person that you cited was not in the vehicle from which the shots came? Because I've talked to the detective who investigated this case. Mm -hmm. And that's what he yeah. said. He said I wasn't in the car. We had multiple people in the car. We've interviewed them all. He was not in the car. Did you ever figure out who fired the shots? Yes, sir, we did. And who? And you, That's an ongoing investigation, and I'm sorry, I cannot speak to it. I'm not the sergeant over that case. Well, without disclosing details, which I'd sure like to hear, did they prosecute him for something? I Again, think the answer is not yet. Not yet, but they, they're, uh, they're still investigating that case, yeah. Two years, and they haven't prosecuted him yet? Sir, again, that is not my, that is not my oh, case, so I can, if you want, I can make a phone call to that detective and get an answer me. for you. Excuse me. Just real quick. I have a question, Mayor. It's just sort of point of order. Please. I am confused about the, the, where this is going. Um, normally, when we have cases in front of us, we deal with the issues in front of us, and you guys seem to be litigating this back and forth, and uh, I'm not sure if this is the purview of this this committee to listen to you go back and forth, not to say that it's not valid. I'm somewhat confused on, on that. Maybe Mr. Curtis or someone can clarify well, I, I, if this I, is appropriate for you guys to be doing this. The licensee does have a, a right to question witnesses, I mean, under our code. So uh, okay. I, I, we, I, we cannot deny him that the, a reasonable amount of questioning, cross-examination, whatever. Okay. Uh, as long as it has some relevance or pertinence. I mean, the council and the, the mayor is, is is able to cut off the, the, this inquiry, but to ban it all together would not be a good idea. We need okay. to let him have thank you. the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. And I'm trying to be brief and to the point. Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn this over now to De Detective Hurtado, and she's going to talk a little bit about the uh, pattern of behavior again, the recent calls for service, and the emergency suspensions. Thank you. How are you doing, everyone? For the record, my name is uh, Detective Hurtado, and I work with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Special Investigations Section. I've been on the department for 15 years, and I've been with the unit for three years. I am proud to say that I am a Las Vegas native, and I take pride in my work, and I grew up in downtown, so I take pride in making the community safe and... and Thank you for what, your service, what, and what high school? I went to Votech. Good. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, because I grew up in downtown and I actually did mo all of my patrol time in downtown, I am what is called the downtown liaison with special investigations and that is how I met downtown COP and this is how we work together to keep the downtown area safe. And so a little bit of background on what special investigations does is we do the investigations and the enforcement on privileged and regulated licenses within the city of Las Vegas and Clark County. Uh, due to the fact that I am the downtown liaison, uh, this is how I became aware of the issues at Red Nightclub uh, because it is located in the downtown area. Um, sir, to answer your question on the two incidents, on the incident of May 12th, the reason why there wasn't a suspect arrested for this was because the victim did not want to press charges. The victim was actually uncooperative, and so unfortunately we weren't able to make an arrest because the victim didn't want to press charges. On the second incident, May 17th, the victim was also uncooperative and also didn't want to press charges, but the security guard was arrested for some outstanding warrants. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I would like to, I will be, I'll try to be as quick as I can, but I just want to make some points clear. Um, 
Sir, you mentioned earlier that there have not been any police problems roughly in the seven and a half months since the new format was introduced in May, correct? That's our understanding. Okay, so first of all, I just want to make sure that we don't forget why red was rebranded to 512 because of these two very extreme and violent incidents, as we all saw on the video. There's no denying. So I just want to make clear that the secu one of the security officers that was identified on the first incident of May 12 was identified as a security guard who actually used to work at the beauty bar right across the way. And he was actually, um, he had some police trouble because he was also using excessive force upon patrons on Fremont East. So I just want to make that clear. There's no secret that all of these security guards know each other. They're very tight knit and they all know where they've worked and it's open to everybody down there that works down there that these security guards go back and forth just like Sergeant Schmidt uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so the incident um, on May 17th um, that was brought up to our attention and I'm sorry the incident on May 12 was brought up to our attention and I was actually called on the incident on May 17th at red so we also do what are called emergency suspensions a special investigations does that and we actually suspend the license when we deem a business unsafe for the public so I was actually the detective that responded that night and did the emergency suspension because just five days earlier I was aware that security did punch a male unconscious and he wasn't rendered aid. It was a very similar incident to when I responded that night and I just want to again say that this use of force is unacceptable and it was determined that for the safety of the public and our community to suspend the nightclub license that night. I also uh, want to share that we did call Mr. Purdue down to the club and he was hesitant over the phone on coming out because it was so late. Because this license is held to a higher standard, when we call an owner because we're serving an emergency suspension, there is no question on why or if they should not come out. They need to come out and take responsibility for any actions at their, at their business. Uh, security is obviously held at a higher standard and they're supposed to protect the public and not become a part of the problem. And like mentioned before, there was no, there was no aid rendered to the subject, police was never called and medical was never called. And police should have been called on, on both instances and because there is a license, a nightclub license, that is part of their security plan and they need to notify us. I also want to mention that the manager that night did not have a, a, a work card and he was very confused. He was cooperative, but he was very confused because he had just been promoted to manager and it was very obvious that he had no control over the security at Red that night. Uh, there, was also, uh, there was also some, uh, some citations of non-compliance issued to the business because the employee list was not updated and he didn't have his work card. And this is not the first time that uh, managers, negligent managers have been employed at this business. Um, I want to just mention just very quick that in January of 13, 2008, I conducted a site check at Red and I discovered that he didn't have a work card and he was actually a, a sex offender that failed to notify the LVMPD, so I arrested him that night. This is January 2018. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Um, I, else? I, I also want to mention that in the videos you see that there's patrons and visitors and tourists, and usually when I would patrol the area, there's actually families out there. So we are very fortunate that no innocent bystanders or children got hurt when these chairs were flying around. Um, I've also issued multiple notices of non-compliances, non-compliance to previous managers, and uh, I would also like to state that the reason why the calls for service are down is because Mr. Purdue did hire security, state licensed security temporarily, and also because our officers have been doing self-initiated calls and have been present in the area. I conducted a search of calls for service from May of 2019 to January 2020, 
and there was a total recorded number of 42 calls for service at 512 Fremont. And I just want to state Could that you, 21. Sorry, excuse me. Could you repeat the dates for, of those call, 42 calls, just yes. in general, from what date to what date? I did a search from May of 2019 to January of 2020. For the last seven months. Basically. Yes. And there was a total recorded number of 42 calls for service, but half of the calls, 21 of these calls were self-initiated calls by LVMPD, us doing enforcement, us doing stops in front of the business where we utilize the address. So half of those calls were all self-initiated. There were 17 calls for service, which were miscellaneous calls, such as homeless or other disturbances. There were two battery calls and two noted calls for service. So now I'm going back on the fact that the business was rebranded, but a continual pattern of the same violent incidents are still occurring. So one being a fight call on January 4th, of 2020 where an LVMPD officer was working overtime at 512 Fremont was actually punched in the face trying to break up a fight that occurred inside 512 Club. The officer took control of the suspect which had punched him in the face and handed him over to 512 security as he continued to assist the other officer in the fight. The officer then turned around and saw that the suspect that had punched him earlier was being released by 512 security, despite the officer communicating with security that that was the suspect that was handed over due to being a primary aggressor and hit him in the face, but had to turn around to assist the other officer. So, so this was a week ago? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, the officer saw that the suspect was being released and the officer and his partner ran towards the suspect and took him into custody with no further, further incident. <coughs> and it was revealed that after 512 security had released him, didn't even identify him. The officer sustained two minor scratches on his right hand and an abrasion to his right cheek. There was also a domestic violence which was reported on December 25th and I'm just gonna go through the short details, brief details, is that the victim stated she was inside Club Red on December 22nd, and she stated she was at the club with her boyfriend. She later said that she went up to security to tell security to keep an eye on her boyfriend because he was being physical. The victim's boyfriend then choked her and punched her while inside the club. She said security came and intervened and escorted the male out and security told her that the police had came and removed the subject from the club. She claimed she was so scared and did not want to talk to the police. So the security officer gave her his information in case she needed a witness. So that day she actually went home and didn't call the police herself, but she did call on the 25th of January because she did want it documented. And, find, and did a police report from a residence. Long story short is a detective contacted the witnessing 512 security guard and he corroborated that the male was getting physical and was hitting the victim so the suspect was kicked out of the club. But the report did not state that security actually called the police and I actually reviewed calls for service at this club and there were no calls into the LVMPD showing a battery call or disturbance call on or around or near December 22nd of 2019. I also want to mention really quickly that there were undercover operations that we did conduct and two firearms were uh, taken into the business. So we then did a different approach and we had undercovers go in blatantly with the firearm that could be visible and security did find that firearm and a minor was identified and they were not allowed entry. So we commend the club for that. Um, let me see, oh, and I also want to mention that during these uh, UC operations, undercover operations that officers did uh, notice documented gang members and OMG members of the chosen few at this business. When, On, when was that? So the dates were, I have February 22nd of 2019, we did one operation. March 1st, we conducted 
a second operation, and a third operation was conducted March 22nd of 2019. We would also like to mention that on April 17, 2019, Mr. Perdue sent two of his security officers from Red to speak to myself and Sergeant Melvin, which is my sergeant in special investigations. They came to LVMPD headquarters and they wanted to meet with us. Uh, this meeting was documented and recorded on Exhibit 3, page 2. The meeting was with the two red security officers admitting affiliation with the OMG Biker Club, the chosen few. They both stated they were fired, but will st will st were still working some nights at red. They stated Mr. Perdue fired them due to their biker affiliation and wanted special investigations approval to go back to work. SIS made it very clear that SIS does not determine who Red hires for security and do not give approvals to anyone to work as security. SIS would rather learn that they were SIS would later learn that they were both rehired at Red because on May 17th we conducted a uh, SIS responded to the in, an incident on Red and one of the securities that had come to the meeting talked to us and was present. The employee list also reviewed at that time showed that both were on the employee list as security. Okay. I think Mr. Curtis, I think, yeah. and I, I'd like to ask Councilwoman um, Seaman, um, I mean Diaz, yeah. how did I get there? It's all right, you're all the same. So, <laughs> you're our peeps. Are, are you comfortable that you have, uh, uh, you feel you have enough information on this? Um, do we have any comments? First of all, I want to thank you for your loyal service and the fact that you stayed in Las Vegas and that you pursued this career. We're just in such gratitude to all of you. Uh, everybody loves the city and, and just wants to keep it safe. I'm sure you're included in that as well. So I didn't know if there were any questions, comments before I do turn it over or if anything, Mr. Curtis, you wanted to add. I don't think I need to add anything further, Your Honor. Okay. And uh, Ms. McElhone, anything else you want to add here? Uh, nothing further. Uh, uh, thank you, our downtown area command. I mean, I think we've just come such a long way going back 20 years. It's, it's just very comforting. But we can't have this type of um, attitude going on anywhere. It's just not safe for our visitors or our residents that come down here or any of you. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Councilwoman and uh, Diaz, and uh, let's hear where you're going. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think that the owners of this tavern license or establishment want to portray that they've rectified the concerns that we've long had along with not just our licensing department but Metro as well. And based on the video that we just saw, the reports from um, Officer Hurtado, um, lead investigator in many of these and knows the area very well. Um, also in just um, being informed of how disciplinary meetings were held with the business owners. And we said very clearly after the incidents, you need to change your practice. And, you know, one thing is for them to come and say before us today here, you know, everything's been squeaky clean since May, the last two violent episodes. But we know this is a nightclub. And these are the things that are coming on our radar. So what other things are transpiring that don't even come to the light of day? And many of these victims, I call them victims because if you're being almost knocked unconscious by security, I'm a victim in that situation. If none of those victims are even holding them accountable, how many more victims are out there that haven't come before us to, or before law enforcement to tell them that they've been mistreated, that they've been mishandled, that they have not been given just adequate service that one should receive when you're patronizing um, any event venue space. So with that, I think that we've been very lenient. I think we've been very patient. I think we've been willing to work and let you know exactly what we want of you, that we wanted state certified security, I think from the get go, not oh, I'll do it um, when I get caught with my hand in the cookie jar and then now I'm just gonna yank them and pull them out and not, con not give it any continuity. I think that's just completely unconscious. You're not thinking about 
the well-being and the safety of your patrons and how that then creates mayhem for our law enforcement when they might have to be tending to more calls and then you're you're one more on that scene and on that beat so I I just I think that we've been more than um, accommodating in the past but I think that it is time to uh, move to revoke this license madam mayor that is my motion okay there is a motion on a agenda item was it 63 to revoke so please vote and please post a motion carries where's what there are we're good thank you very much appreciate it thank, thank you. you for coming thank down on behalf of your client we appreciate it and madam mayor if i may i want to acknowledge sergeant schmidt's service to downtown area command she recently parted ways to something bigger and better for her but we sure do appreciate her and all of her efforts to keep downtown safe under her watch thank you very much i appreciate you saying that and i'm still staying in the city i'm going to be in the northwest area command so right oh, and, and also i have a constituent who is about to retire after today, I believe, and we have Brian O'Callaghan, who served at Metro 22 years, and I want him to please stand up and for us to acknowledge his years of service to Metro as well. Uh, Your, Your Honor, I want to make clear, and maybe we need to present the motion again, the revocation has to be both of the tavern license and the business license. The nightclub. The nightclub. I mean, I'll, I'll let Mary explain it and make sure the language is <laughs> in, the, in the motion has to be precise. With right. We just want to make sure the motion is to revoke both the tavern limited license and also the nightclub license. And is that what you have, Madam Clerk? No. Okay. Okay. So let's restate it. Do we have to, uh, Mr. Dorchak, do we have to pull it back? and rescind it and restate it, or can we just... No, we had a little bit of a technical hiccup anyways. We can go ahead with a clean motion now, a motion to revoke both licenses. That's a business license, and what was the other Tavern. one? Tavern? It would be the Tavern Limited License Limited. and the Nightclub License. So, um, Councilwoman Diaz can uh, simply say, uh, move as stated by move me. Move as stated by our legal attorney. As of today? Yes. Okay. As of effective, right, Mary? No. Right now. Um, right now. Mayor Goodman, the way, the way I understand that it works is what happens is you sign all the items on this agenda that um, on th uh, tomorrow on Thursday, and they get it pu published in the newspaper on Sunday. And that's actually when it officially becomes effective. Um, not unless you make the determination that we're going to do some sort of emergency orders, but normally that's how we proceed. And we will be submitting a letter to them, and then we will be going out and I making like sure they're I would like to sign closed. that today. Right. I don't want to wait if something should happen to somebody between today and Sunday, but that's, I defer to you. Yeah, uh, Madam Mayor, if we would like to make that effective today uh, through um, what would be an emergency order, I believe that we can make that effective today. Yeah. We've done that before in the past. I'm fine with that motion. So it'll be the motion as stated, amended with effective via, via emergency the order closure today. closure would be as of today. Right. So if you'll get that to my office, I will <laughs> sign that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our officers, thank you so much. Thank you. Just, sorry. Very. Thank you. Pardon? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, I thought we voted, and oh, I, I need to vote. <laughs> Everybody has voted now. It does carry. All oh, right, I forgot the second one. Thank you. Right. Thank you for coming down. We appreciate it. Am I excused? Yes, thank you very much you, for Ryan. coming down. Okay, we are now on to agenda item 70. Recommending committee bills eligible for adoption at this meeting. Bill number 2019-44. Councilman Anthony, would you like the bill read? Yes, Mayor. Bill number 2019-44, an ordinance adding to LVMC Chapter 13.04, a new section to authorize the Department of Operations and Maintenance to determine and designate hours of cleaning for public sidewalks and to provide for other related matters. Move for approval. There's a motion to approve on agenda item 70. Please vote. Please post. Not good. 
to the bathroom. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to agenda. The motion carries. Move on to agenda item 71, bill number 219-48. Councilman Anthony, would you like the bill read? Yes, Mayor. Bill number 2019-48, an ordinance to repeal LVMC section 19.16.105 pertaining to the repurposing of certain golf courses and open spaces and to provide for other related matters. Excuse me. Okay, moving uh, uh, please read that bill, agenda item 71. Sure, just to read it again, bill number 2019-48, an ordinance to repeal LVMC section 19.16.105 pertaining to the repurposing of certain golf courses and open spaces and to provide for other related matters. Okay, and how say you on that? Uh, we don't have recommendation. There's no, okay, there was no recommendation from recommending, so um, councilwoman. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Bill number 2019-48 repeals a relatively new section of the city's municipal code pertaining to the repurposing of certain golf courses and open spaces. This repeal bill, not by accident, is the first proposed ordinance to come before this council that I have sponsored since my election to serve the residents of Ward 2 last June. I say it's not an accident that this bill in particular is the first piece of legislation that bears my name because I ran for this council seat with a clear agenda. I promised to solve problems for the residents of Ward 2 and I committed myself to serving as a pro-growth, business-friendly representative not only to the families and workers of Ward 2 but to every taxpayer and citizen in the city of Las Vegas. As a result, I believe the repeal bill before the council today achieves the goals I campaigned on less than a year ago. My proposed ordinance returns flexibility to this city council by eliminating regulations that in my view can burden businesses and applicants, especially small businesses. For instance, our great small businesses and local developers, I believe, look at the list of strict requirements in the current open space ordinance and simply say, it's not worth the effort and uncertainty to submit my development application for a project, whether big or small. Therefore, the current regulatory burdens, in my opinion, deter development and growth not only in my ward but throughout Las Vegas. The flexibility that this repeal bill returns to my six colleagues and myself does not mean that applicants such as developers or businesses will be given free reign when it comes to repurposing certain golf courses or open spaces in the city. To the contrary, this bill ensures uh, continued city council involvement in any repurposing project and the exercise of city council discretion when needed in any repurposing project. This flexibility and involvement not only provides sound oversight, but also announces that this city is open for business. Change and growth is welcomed, and we will not be handcuffed by regulations that spurn new ideas, bog down entrepreneurs, and can lead to acres of unused and wasted land, especially open land that everyone living around it knows from the start can one day be repurposed for a new use. I also want to address the comments made earlier by Mr. Piccoli. I was very clear while campaigning that I was committed to resolving the issues with Badlands. Voters who went to the polls in Ward 2 knew where I stood on the issue and supported my position to resolve the current situation. I received 40% of the vote in an eight-person race, beating my closest opponent by more than 8%. During that campaign, I spoke with numerous people who want to end 
endless taxpayer funds spent on litigation. And since taking office, I've had numerous calls and emails from people who support the real repeal and replacement of this ordinance with the hope of finding a resolution. So I do believe I am listening to all the residents and doing what I believe is the best interest of Ward 2. And for those reasons, and to continue moving this city forward, I respectfully urge my colleagues to support <laughs> Bill Number 2019-48. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Now, as I promised this morning, those who did not speak this morning in public comment on this uh, agendized item number 71 would have an opportunity. I did mention it would be, again, limited to one minute. And uh, let me read the cards I have, and we'll hear from you all. Uh, Henry Baker, and um, pardon me if I misread your names, uh, Mr. Bradford, um, Dennis Cronin, Derek Estelle, George Garcia, uh, Rogelio Gonzalez, Kenneth McLynn, whoops, I may have missed somebody here, sorry, uh, Harvey Noyd, Paula Quagliana, Michael Quarsini, Doug Rankin, and Anthony Sago. And what I'm going to ask you to do is just until I call you, but I think, first of all, I'd like to hear from our director of planning um, for a report, which I asked him to prepare just facts of uh, what we worked under for the past 30 some years, what is, and just facts. So if you would. Um, announce yourself, and then we'll go to these order, and we'll start um, with Mr. Baker. But again, uh, you d cannot give your minute to somebody else this time. I announced that this morning, and so you'll each have a minute when that time comes. Thank you, and good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of City Council, Robert Summerfield, Director of Planning for the City of Las Vegas. As requested, and I don't know, uh, Jeff, if we can get the overhead, um, I was requested to do just a real quick summary of the, uh, the before state, before the ordinance had been passed, and then what, uh, what is in the ordinance. Um, as I've mentioned in briefings with members of council, there, there are nuances to this, but the things that have been uh, heard, I think, at least in, in our work, uh, the most that the community has asked questions about are the neighborhood meeting provisions, uh, the master studies, and uh, maintenance. Um, the, and so what you see before you is just a real quick comparison of the prior to the adoption of the ordinance. Uh, and this was the second phase ordinance that was adopted in November of last, I'm sorry, not last year anymore, uh, in, in 2018, as well as what uh, the key elements of uh, the current ordinance that is in place that you're considering for repeal. Um, the neighborhood meeting. So a neighborhood meeting has previously, before the ordinance, was required for general plan amendments, um, certain modifications, and waiver requests in the, uh, the town center area if there was a special use permit re uh, requirement. Otherwise, neighborhood meetings were not required as a general practice uh, unless requested by a member of the Planning Commission and the City Council. The Planning Commission and City Council do use those whenever they hear, um, even in advance, not just at the public hearing, of any neighborhood concerns about a proposed development. They will at very often use their discretion as uh, hearing bodies to hold the item and allow time for a neighborhood meeting in practice. Uh, the other item of question is the master studies. So again, uh, prior to the ordinance, and just like in all other development currently, the master studies were required as a condition of approval and need to be in an approved uh, conceptual state prior to being able to pull permits to do any type of construction related to the proposed project. Um, that was the requirement before. Now, those studies are required to be done prior to application. So before they've officially come to the city and uh, asked 
asked for the right to develop whatever their project might be, uh, they would actually have to have all those studies approved uh, by Public Works, uh, even though they don't actually have entitlements to review those studies against necessarily. Um, to be clear, most large developers and large projects will consult with our Public Works Department in advance of submitting for their entitlements anyway. It's just a matter of course. Most of the engineering companies will do that. And then finally, maintenance was one of the other big things that's been a conversation piece. So prior to the ordinance, maintenance of any, any property is governed by the Las Vegas Municipal Code. Under the ordinance, it got more specific and required a maintenance closure plan um, that would just identify certain things that a property uh, that did have an open space or was a golf course uh, would would do, again, it's the developer telling the city what they would do to maintain the property and submit that for review and approval. So those are the main things I heard. I'm available uh, for any questions that you have on pre-ordinance, what's in the ordinance, or what the impact of the repeal, if it were to go through, might mean. And I'd like to ask you, just for a point of clarification, prior to the adoption of the current ordinance, you're saying these same study requirements had to be complied with. It just was not up front. It was just as they were going through the process. So if, in fact, the developer um, did not satisfy all the flood approval requirements, the department would deny the application at some point. Is that correct? A absolutely. So if you're not, so under anything that's not uh, deemed a repurposing, you come in, you get your entitlements. As a part of your conditions of approval on those entitlements, if you are going to do development of land, so a site development review, you are required to meet with uh, any number of city departments, mainly public works, to get those conceptual studies approved. They have to be an approved at least conceptually approved or conditionally approved prior to building, issuing any permits for construction on those projects. So it, there's many checkoffs in the building permit process, and one of those is by the uh, Public Works and Planning and other departments that verify that those studies are in an approved situation and match the plans that have been submitted for those permits. So to clarify, I come in, I want to develop a property. I put in an application, there's, there's a cost. There's a cost, let's just take flood. I come in, I put in my application to develop a property um, prior, this is prior to the ordinance and then after the ordinance. Um, I come in with my application to develop a property. Um, at some point, obviously, and sooner is better, I have to absorb the cost of a flood study. I, the developer? Correct. Okay. Um, at what, which point, why is the cost different? I'm taking the other side here. If under the new ordinance, I have to take the same study, what is the negative side? Do I have to do that prior to any, it, where's the difference? Where's the timeline different and cost to me, the developer? So the cost to you, the developer, is probably the same. The engineer is not going to charge you something different in terms of the time. The, the cost is going to be potentially carrying costs. So if you're financing that study as a part of the financing package for the project, you may have increased carrying costs because you may have needed to pull that money and spend it on the study in advance of when you might otherwise have planned to do that. Additionally, you're doing it to some degree at risk because if you do not have an entitlement to develop the project that you're proposing, then you've spent all that money on that study and if the Planning Commission or the City Council do not approve your project, then you have expended those resources um, and you don't get your money back. The engineers have done their work and so you will have potential, you will be more at risk in terms of having spent that money without having initiated the entitlement process. The other element that often happens is folks will begin that process maybe after they've met with staff officially, submitted an application, had a neighborhood meeting, got a feel for, you know, having met with their council person or their planning commissioner and got a feel for the questions and concerns that may have been addressed. So then they feel a certain level of comfort comfort in moving forward with, uh, with doing those studies. They will not have, they do not have that in these cases uh, because they will not submitted an application and begun the formal process yet. They will be doing that pre-application submittal. Okay. Under the way before the ordinance, um, 
after I went through flood and found out I, I'm not going there. I was not required then to go to the traffic and sewer. I was starting with flood and I found it prohibitive to my project and I saw that and so there was no additional uh, requirement to have traffic sanitation. Correct. Correct? Okay, so, now yes. wait. Then going to now, which I don't understand, am I required, coming in under the, the current ordinance, I am required to do all of those. So I have to absorb all of those costs up front? Again, there are nuances. So there are some size um, limitations that go with certain studies. And there's degrees to the studies, again, depending on the size and nature of the project that's being proposed. Um, but it, similar to what you described, if you are under the ordinance and you find that f you do pay for your flood study and you're doing it sequenced, and you pay for your flood study and you find that it's not feasible to get a uh, economically viable engineered solution for your flood issues, then no, you're not going to go and then pay to have your traffic study done because you know you're not going to be able to move forward with the project. Similar to now, if after you've gotten the entitlement, you find that you can't do the flood uh, mitigation because the flood study is just too expensive or cost prohibitive, then you wouldn't go on to your traffic study. If you did want to come forward, though, you would need all of the, the elements of uh, the traffic study, the flood study, and the sewer drainage Okay, study. so the only advantage of one over the other, it sounds like, is that you're not obligated to pay on all, which you ultimately will do if you're coming in to look at a project. Right. And you're going through it and taking it. And the one other question I had, as I recall from all of our discussions over these three, four years, um, there was an element about um, schooling and how um, additional a density of properties at may or may not affect the Clark County School District. Is that just, I know there are other elements, but is that one of the ones that would be on this list? So one of the things that the, that the applicant in this case, in the case of a repurposing, it calls out in the purpose statement um, school capacity. But we already, again, under your base code, we already have a requirement. If you meet certain thresholds, you have to provide what's called a, um, a project of regional significance or a DINA uh, report, which includes a formal um, report on school capacity, school-related issues. On any site development review that has residential as a, pon uh, as a component of it, we do submit that for comment to all the agencies, including the school district, for which then they have the ability to report back. And we would include any report that we get from the school district regarding capacity concerns, uh, about whether or not a new school would be needed. Um, we would report that back in the staff report. If it's an actual something of a size that would result in a new school, those are usually projects that would result in development agreements, like what has occurred up in Sky Canyon or Providence, in areas where they were actually required as a part of those negotiations to set aside school sites to be developed in conjunction with the school district at some future date. So that, knowing the, the, the dates of those, that was already a requirement before the ordinance Correct. The, new, the ordinance under which we exist now. Notice to the school district about a proposed residential okay. project. I just wanted to know what was in place and what's different in this particular ordinance. Um, so I don't know if there are any other comments, questions from uh, anybody else? Yeah. Yes or no? Okay, so let's. Um, well, I think what I want to do is hear from our cards okay, now. Okay. So if you would just, in case there's something, if you'd yep. stand by, I'd appreciate it. So let's start. Um, I know you've all been sitting here a long day. So let's, if you would, we're going to have a minute each. Let's do that. And then I want to hear from all of our cards that have just submitted now. So if you'd state your name and make your comment, appreciate it. One minute for everybody, please. Thank you for coming down. Henry Baker, uh, 125 Rock Moss Street, uh, 89145. I just want to say that I support item 71 and item 73. I uh, want to state that I moved to this area, understanding that this is supposed to be like a Rodeo Drive of Las Vegas area. I don't agree with anybody trying to 
stop development and jobs. So that's it. Thank, Thank you very much. And yes, sir. Dennis Cronin. I just want to say I support this. Item 71, Victoria Seaman, Council Seaman, I uh, appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I know it takes courage to stand up because I know there's just a small group of people against this. And I believe this is a great opportunity for someone. I live in that area and I drive by that area every day. It's an eyesore. So we need to do something down there. Queens Ridge, the two towers were built in 2005, and six and seven. Put a lot of members to work. I think that's what we're looking for. So I think a, a tower in that area would look beautiful. And then if you <coughs> develop that area, I think it would look real nice. So I'm here to support that. So I'm hopeful that it will pass today. So thank you for your time. Thank you for coming down. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Doug Rankin on behalf of uh, many residents of uh, the Piccoli Ranch Master Development Plan Phase 2. Um, I wanted to focus my one minute on those master studies. Um, currently, the ordinance requires the master studies up front, which will be seen by the public and those officials who make those decisions so that you get a chance to review those studies to know if the drainage is an issue and what the mitigation answer to that drainage is. Do the buildings need to come up out of the ground and be taller to, in order to mitigate? After, if you repeal the ordinance, those drainage studies and the traffic studies all happen afterwards. And you will not be able to see those. And then the engineers will work out a solution which may result in the project coming out of the ground, may result in additional traffic lanes to be built in order to accommodate the traffic. The project doesn't go away because it's not feasible. Uh, it, what happens is those changes are agreed upon by staff and the engineers to figure out what works in order to build the project. That takes away your ability as the council to hear what the issues are with these areas of open space that are tough to develop. They're already there, they're already built. Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, Kenneth McLean, okay. uh, 1300 South Arlington. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, the project is an eyesore for the people that's really spending their taxes and trying to have a you know decent area to look at so i would say uh hey if, if anything you can make it into a water park we never have enough water parks here <laughs> uh fill the back fill the ground in and level it off uh i support bill 71 and 72 as well to keep workers working thank you and that's what i stand for thank, thank you. you thank you yes sir good more uh, afternoon madam mayor and yes. commissioners my, uh, my name is Todd Bice as uh, you know I'm legal counsel for many of the homeowners in Queens Ridge uh, what I would just likely briefly like to talk to you about is the timing of this ordinance I think is part of the problem I mean uh, councilwoman made a comment about the fact that uh, there's a lot of litigation ongoing and this ordinance is somehow, I guess the inference is, is going to uh, uh, resolve it. It's not, it's actually going to exacerbate it. Uh, right now, the, Nevada, the, the, the matter involving uh, Judge Crockett's decision, everybody kind of agrees that issue will resolve a lot of this. That issue is fully briefed at the Nevada Supreme Court. All the briefing is done. All the judges have been appointed because there certain justices had to recuse themselves. That matter is pending for resolution. By doing this ordinance right now, uh, this action and the, and the other items that are on here that pertain to it, you're going to, you're going to breed an entire new round of litigation. It's gonna end up necessitating more litigation. Whereas the Nevada Supreme Court is poised to address this very issue. The matter is done, it's Thank briefed. You. And your counsel knows this. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Rogelio Gonzalez. I come here then you guys know that I'm a construction worker for the last 13 years. Um, I support 71, 73. I always seen construction one of the, my biggest um, things that I do out here. I also represent members at Local 872 that would like to see this project move forward to create more jobs, good paying jobs, and keep our benefits going along with our keep our health for our families out here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I am going to get to the cards, 
So just be patient, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. How you doing? My name is Harvey Noy. I reside at uh, 1029 Railroad Flat Court, Las Vegas, Nevada, and that's up in Summerlin. I voted for Councilwoman Seaman because of her promise, and um, I'm glad you're taking a forward the step to get this resolved. Um, we need to work, and um, the eyesore is getting kind of bad, and it's costing me a lot of money. It's costing me and uh, a lot of taxpayers money. I would like to get this resolved. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. Good afternoon. I know we are from Africa. I just came to America a long time Excuse ago. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I just heard the clerk say, could you repeat your name and oh, spell Oh, my name your... is Anthony Sengo. Okay. Do I have a card here? Yes. Yes, there he is. I got you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm uh, from Africa. I came here, you know, to work. But the thing that's going on is uh, I built New York for 15 years. And Las Vegas is the same tourist era. It got to be built. If we stop people from building Las Vegas, Las Vegas will go down. I built New York for 15 years. So let's build Las Vegas. I was in Africa, I knew about Las Vegas. Now I'm in Las Vegas now. So let's help. Let the union work. I came by joining the union. The training, you know. So let pass the bill. Let put people to work. We want people to be homeless on the street. If people not working, we're going to be sleeping on the bridges. You see, you. in Africa, we got homeless because everybody want to work. People go on the farm. People go do a lot of work. Thank they you. construction. Thank so you, sir. mayor, you the best mayor. Thank you. I want for you to. Thank for you, your sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You got to Thank you. It, 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 uh, you're over your minute, and I cut you off already, so <laughs> thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Eddie Ramirez. Um, I used to be a resident at 23 um, Chalice Street at 89110 on the east side. I see all the problems that's going on. I've been a construction worker for 20 years. This is an opportunity to put people to work and use some of those valuable resources for at-risk youth programs. I mean, we're under uh, uh, served in our communities and this is an opportunity to protect to those two you guys chose to represent. So please take that in consideration when you make a decision there. There's there's programs and assets that are being tied out to this uh, project that could be used towards other at-risk youth programs or saving people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Wait till you get to the mic. Oh, thank you. Afternoon, Your name, Mayor. please. Oh, Lori Jean McCorkle, MCCRKLE, and I'm currently homeless on the streets of Henderson, Las Vegas, Nevada, out on the city streets here. And um, God has brought me here to, um, in regards to your bill of that. Do you, are, do you know we're on agenda item 71 and 73? Yeah, the ones for the, I'm dealing with the, the homeless because I wasn't able to, no, no, no. to speak we, with them. Sorry, um, I'm going to ask Miss um, Gibson, Kathy Thomas Gibson, to talk with you about that. This is in her area. We oh. have already addressed that issue this morning with public comment. I'm sorry you couldn't be here. But well, I was talk here, but here. I was on the cards, but I'm not new to this procedures. I don't well, know how things work here, so okay. uh, forgive me Ms. for that. So. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Thomas Gibson would help you right here. If you'll oh. step over there, the lady in the black dress. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for coming down. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate Thank it. you. Okay, so let's go on. We've got John Bradford, Derek Estelle, George Garcia. I see Ms. Quagliana right here. So were you one of these that I already well, the did? The first name you said. The, your, uh, let's do it in order, then I'm alphabetizing, so make it fair, and unless you have to leave. No, I don't. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't you. realize what no, you no, were no. trying to No, 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 it's all right. I just alphabetized them. Come on up, Mr. Bradford. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Madam and Mayor, you say your name, please, even though I announced it. I'm going to get it. to it. Okay. I'm going to use this. This was part of my uh, introduction. Good. So Remember, you have time a minute starts. only. For my time starts. Go. So I'm John Bradford. Mount Logan Court, Silverstone Ranch. And I think one of the things that we're forgetting, we're focusing on Se uh, Councilwoman Siemens bill about repealing 71 and 73. And it, we fought very hard for this. And one of the things I think you all are missing the point on 
is the third point that the uh, first gentleman talked about, which was the maintenance. And our property has been uh, in disrepair for four and a half years. It's now a fire hazard behind my house. Uh, I know you have tried to abate it by removing some of the plants, but we have tumbleweeds piled up to the top of our fence. It's just a matter of ignition source, and, and then we'll have a major uh, a fire in our neighborhood. So what this bill, I just want to implore you that what this bill is doing by keeping it in place, it, it puts the onus on the developer to know that he has to maintain the property until he gets approval to do whatever he wants to do, which is fine. I don't, I'm not against workers, I'm not against construction, but I want the pe property maintained and not to blight and, and de point. depress property values. Good Thank point. you. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, Derek Estelle? Nope. Okay. Uh, George Garcia? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, sir, did, was your name in this card no, list? Not. Okay, so if you'll just get a card, I'm going to Ms. Quagliana now because you're the next card alphabetically. Thank you. Good so, afternoon. My name is Paula Quagliana, 9621 Orient Express. Before I give my minute, I have a request. My husband, Joseph Qualiana, is unable to attend because of health reasons. Some of you know what those are, some of you don't. I know Mayor Goodman does. So my request is if I could give my minute and also read his minute today. Well, only because I know you've been here almost at every meeting and I've denied everybody the opportunity to have it, but he has been such a motivational individual in the cancer field of medicine and so generous, I am going to make an exception for Dr. Joe Quagliana. I know he'll so thank it, you for so that. Just one, one minute though, please don't go over. He'll appreciate that thank very you. much. So if you would start on uh, Dr. Quagliana's written statement. I'd like to give mine first if that's all right with you. Thanks. Fact and fiction. The fact is without an ordinance, a developer erected and, or pardon me, tore down the fencing around Wallet, Pie, and Alta, breaching the Queens Ridge security, chopped down trees, put up ugly red signs. The ordinance you're considering to eliminate could delete these punitive and harassing actions by developer. That repealing this ordinance will save dollars and existing uh, litigation is fiction. It's misinformation. The fact is homeowners and associations can file just as expensive lawsuits against the city. That means more taxes and maybe more settlements. Also repealing risk establishing precedents showing developers and large, large institutions they can get their demands by filing a lawsuit against the city. This ordinance is not discriminatory. All developers are, in fact, treated equally. There shouldn't be any complaint. Sorry, that's the end. Now let's go to the written statement, if you would, please. Thank you. Wait one second, please. Your mic is somehow off. There it is. Okay, please go ahead. The claim that repealing this ordinance will save tax dollars in litigation costs is fiction. The fact is repealing the ordinance will open the door to multiple citizens and homeowners associations who properly rights and property values have been affected can also file lawsuits, thus requiring the city to defend more lawsuits with even more tax dollars. Further, not only would repealing the ordinance ignore the city's responsibility to its citizens, it would also risk establishing a pre precedence showing developers or anyone else that they can get their demands by simply filing a lawsuit against the city. This ordinance is not discriminatory and is meant to preserve communities that would be significantly impacted by developments threatening to reduce or eliminate open space. Vote no. Thank you very much for your comments. And our best to your husband, please. Okay, um, Mr. Uh, Michael Corsini, please. No. Okay. Uh, Thomas Marley. Uh, 
for the record, Tom oh, Morley. Okay, your mic is in on just it'll come. There, there we go. Okay. For the record, Tom Morley with uh, local 872 2345 Red Rock Street. My job, first and foremost, is to support jobs development for my members. As a planning commissioner for another government agency, I don't speak for that agency. Um, however, no one is ever happy with infill development. However, it is a much needed necessity currently. I've seen both arguments and feel this infill project and others like it must move forward and I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and now we have, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? This gentleman asked to speak at the end. Okay. Former legislator, Bob Coffin former city councilman for 150 years, former resident for another 150 years. Mayor, I still have four years left on this if I want to come back. Uh, thank you. I don't. Uh, thank you very much for hearing me, uh, Your Honor. I'll try to be as quick as I can. But do uh, say your I've name. I've lived please. this with you. My name is Bob Coffin, 1139 Fifth Place, Ward 3, downtown, right in the heart. Uh, I've lived this with you for five years. and. Uh, it's an ugly situation. Uh, a very wealthy individual has uh, blackjacked the council and the residents of the area. It's portrayed as uh, wealthy people in there, when in fact it, it's really not. There's about half a dozen really wealthy folks, and the rest of them are middle class who sold, hold their old homes, cashed in their equity, and bought in what was to be a quiet life. You have in your files, the brochures which promise to all of these homeowners a gated golf course community with a European lifestyle. That's there. Forget the fine point. I uh, got to tell you that those promises have not been kept, and it's our duty, it seems to me, to help people. I don't care who they are. Uh, how, can, how can we end lawsuits? Well, I guess. By serving on the council, I was served. A lot, I was pursued a slap suit by this developer. It's been thrown out by the federal courts. I hate to do this, but I got to cut no, you, you off. No, you don't it's hate to. It's only fair. It's only fair. You know, we've loved you all these years. We never knew where you were. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay, uh, he asked to be the last, so uh, I'm going to let that hold there. And um, if there are any comments, questions from council, um, yes, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so our mayor has been going through this for five years. I only about two and a half. But I'm going to tell you that what I've experienced sitting here and meeting with everyone and uh, you know, that live in Queens Ridge, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And what do I mean by that? Literally, I've met with 100, 120 people that live in Queens Ridge that have said, a few of them, they've joined some of the meetings, and every time they've had a, a different opinion, Frank Shrek would yell and bully them. This is what I've heard. So they're not going to come up and, and they don't want to create anguish with their neighbors. They don't want to, they just don't want to do that. And so I'm going to have you hear from, from a person that is a dear friend to all of us up here. And you can understand, and that person's never come here, right, and spoke about this. But it's literally the few of you that are here and, you know, when you gathered in the beginning with 50, it's, it's really, it's not the majority. And so I just want you to hear something. And Michelle, it's Shelley Berkeley. How are you? And congratulations again on your victory. I'm calling, I'm, Larry and I are going out of town. We're going on vacation. So I'm not going to be at the meeting tomorrow. And I know it is a very tough meeting. I would never presume upon another elected official to tell you how to vote. But as a Queens Ridge resident, it is time to resolve this issue. If the developer 
owns the property, and if he has a legal right to develop, then we need to move forward on this because the status quo simply is not working. If he conforms to the uh, zoning um, uh, uh, zoning issues, uh, uh, and come up with a um, uh, good density plan, then I would suggest that we look at moving ahead because I cannot continue in this manner. And I wish you luck tomorrow. I know it's going to be a contentious meeting, um, but I think it's time that we move on, uh, recognize his rights, and uh, start developing and turning that area into a paradise. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay. So your neighbors don't want to fight with you. They don't want to come here, and they don't want to make enemies of their neighbors. They're your neighbors. But more th than triple the amount of people that have come up here, yell at us, disrespect us, have literally sat with me and told me, please help resolve this. We have a new councilwoman here on, on council with us. I urged her not to meet with the group that she met with. I told her she was going to get attacked innocently. She's like, no, no. They literally asked. They wanted to talk about it, blah, blah, blah. And what happened? Famous Frank Schreck, bullied her, took over the meeting. Really horrific, horrific treatment. Not OK. So what I'm asking this council to do is support our new councilwoman and what she does to resolve this in her ward and work together as neighbors. More of you want this than less. It's just the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's what I'm going to leave it as. Okay. All right. Let's, um, I'm sorry. I, I, I wish I'd had your comments before, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's been a long time, and I think we all know the moment, and I, again, will say what I said four years ago, um, married to a lawyer, uh, two sons who are lawyers, one of whom's a judge. Um, once legal gets in, it's, nobody wins. It's just, it, it's horrendous. And I think of how long and knowing the pain from residents and knowing the pain of the developer, which I'm sure as the developer puts out money. I've not had conversations, um, but I know the main thing is, what, which is what I saw four years ago once law got into it, um, everybody would lose. And I look at that property and it breaks my heart. It was one of the most beautiful properties. Um, but then again, too, I live in an area where people have torn down houses and some's back to its desert look. And, you know, most important thing for all of us first is to be thankful for the families you have and for the safety that we're provided by our first responders. And the rest of it just has to work out. It breaks my heart to see this ongoing for four years. And it is, and, and I say it freely, I say it at home all the time. Once lawyers get involved, everybody seems to lose, except for the one person who may end up uh, having an award made by the court. So to me, this has broken my heart these four years. And we've all sat here till well into the night coming in here early in the morning, and I feel sorry as for our staff who come in at 7, and then on occasion through planning and through council meetings is here into the wee hours again and again and again. And, and certainly Councilman um, Stavros Anthony has been through it all. He's been on board longer than I, but the good thing is this issue didn't come up before. So um, it, is, it is something that we just can't, it, will it ever work itself out? Maybe not even in my lifetime, and that's just sad. It's just really sad, because I, I believe, and I, I absolutely believe always in absolute truth, and if I don't know it, I can't tell you something if I wasn't there. If I was there and had been at something, I can tell you for fact 
which um, on the sword, I can assure you that the facts that I heard, I would repeat. I've not been at the recent town hall meeting. I know this is just part of this painful suffering that goes on. And by the time we hear from the courts or the Supreme Court, whatever the decision is, it will be appealed. The other side's going to appeal. So the sadness that I personally believe this can go on five, six, eight years longer. And that to me is not acceptable. Mr. Marley, are you still here, Mr. Marley? Um, I thought that was a, a wonderful comment because that's something that should be written in that whoever purchases the land um, has a responsibility to maintain it. That to me makes such good sense because we've been watching this, we're a young city and we continue to have hiccups all the way around for things that come from our past and we have to deal with them because we're a young city. So all of this is to me, um, I see this issue continuing on far into the future and I may not be alive at the time it's in totally resolved. I feel sorry for the fact that we haven't developed it. Um, and so my biggest concern from day one, once this continued into the courts and made it to the Supreme Court, with some having to recuse themselves, very fine justices that can't even hear the case, and then how do you get impartial judgment, et cetera, was to go back into our planning department and get an education, which is what I tried to ask um, our wonderful Mr. Summerfield to put it down at my level, get it way down here so I can understand clearly. What it, for 20 years, Goodman's have been in this seat. And so for the past 20 years, what have we been doing? Why hasn't this happened? Well, this was a real first. Yes, Silverstone had its issues. There are going to be open uh, development properties, large pieces. We don't know what the economy is going to hope and maybe um, happen with um, uh, our American park or one of our bigger parks. So the issue I want to find out, how have we been operating up to the time of this particular issue? Was the city allowing people to uh, just go ahead willy-nilly when they have traffic and knowing that we're going to have traffic problems created by this development? And I've been assured, which I asked Mr. Summerfield in the most simplistic terms, what was happening before the uh, ordinance was brought to us to vote on? And so it seemed to me, except for mandated mandated requirements for meeting with residents. And I do recall the councilman saying, we are going to put into this seven required meetings, at which point my councilman on my left said one meeting. But I have heard also from Mr. Summerfield that there is no way a lobbyist, a developer knows that they're going to build anything without having meetings. It's just been throughout history. The other pieces, were these stop gaps there in the past? And we were operating what's new besides the required in writing mandatory which was just assumed um, that we would have to have a requirement for uh, meetings with homeowners. Uh, if I could ask you to come back to the, ma uh, to the um, whatever you call it, microphone, uh, Mr. Summerfield, and reassure just me at this point that what was in place up until this new ordinance was voted into effect that everything was in process to achieve the same end results, except for a written statement that we have required neighborhood meetings. Everything else was taken care of, and the only difference is the developer has to pay up front, which does, in effect, say to a developer, I'm not going to bother with this. I'll go somewhere else. Madam and Mayor I'm not asking you for a recommendation, by the way. No. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of Council, Robert Summerfield, Director of Planning again. So to answer that question, so again, there are, there are elements within the requirements that require additional documentation. So I don't want to... Wait a minute, if I may, I'm sorry to be rude. Nope. Before or now? I'm now. 
now. In the so new ordinance. In, in the ordinance okay. that is in place, there are some elements that do require some additional documentation that is not documentation that we would otherwise require for any other project. So I do want to be clear that in terms of new stuff, there are some, there's a, a what we called in the ordinance an alternative statement. That's not something we've ever done or do in any what other does that circumstance. Mean? What's an alternative So statement? the alternative statement is something that the developer is obligated to produce that basically has to answer some questions. At its base it's saying, if you didn't propose this project, whatever that project might be, what else might you have done with the land? Would you have continued to operate it as a golf course? Would you continue to have it as a park? Would you change it to the, okay, what the one gentleman that. said to a water park? What, are you, what would you do if you what would okay. What would you have okay. done okay. differently than this proposal okay. that's before you today? So okay. that's one thing. Um, there was another aspect uh, that is a, a document that's required as a part of this uh, that's called an environmental worksheet, which again is an inventory. It's not um, it's not actionable per se. It's where they need to inventory any environmental assets that may exist on the property that's proposed to be repurposed. We that's, were, again, can I ask you that, that you've brought that up? Were we in our prior to this ordinance, were we not concerned about environment? We are. So under your master plan, the 2020 master plan, and the conservation element specifically talks about this, there are certain things that we do care about from a policy guidance that we have from the 2020 master plan that we do need to address. So if you have, uh, if you have any endangered species, um, you do have to identify those things as a part of your development and have a mitigation plan. But this specific spelled out that way, this environmental worksheet, that was different and new in this. And then finally, the last... And there was, but beforehand, was there an environmental piece to protect the environment? Not, not spelled out that way, but yes, it was a concern and is something that has to be addressed and is part of the analysis when we do an analysis on a proposed could project. Could you deny my development if, in fact, I weren't in, or could we deny it if the development weren't environmental? environmentally sensitive absolutely before absolutely you have goals and objectives in your master plan that it, staff would have recommended if you have an environmental um, situation if you have a burrowing owl uh, colony on the property and you don't have a, a plan to address the where those burrowing owls may go to keep them productive and healthy then yes that would be guiding our grounds because one of the findings we have to make is consistency with the general plan and so under that staff may make the recommendation for denial and the city council or the planning commission can uh, adopt that finding Okay, and that would have happened before the ordinance or no? Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. So and, and again, it's an inventory. It's not a, okay. it's just okay. another document. And then finally, the other, the only other thing is this maintenance closure plan, which again is a, additional documentation. It's not, um, at the end of the day, it's not something that gets voted on by what city council. It? So it is a document that a developer who's closing a park or a golf course or any other open space, it's a document that they're going to give to the Department of Planning that highlights how they plan to maintain that property while it's in its closed state. So before it develops into whatever its next life is going to be, how it's going to be maintained in its closed state. So that's Mr. Marley's suggestion. Correct. That's what he was talking about. How are you going to maintain the property? So that's not something, or did you, um, and in your, whoever was your predecessor and his predecessor and his predecessor, what were we doing about um, open space main, maintaining so, its essence? So that's the point. So open space, like any other property in the city of Las Vegas, has basic maintenance requirements that it is to achieve. When we have a property that's out of compliance with those maintenance requirements, uh, I think I heard a comment about uh, Silverstone where, unfortunately, we have had to do uh, previous abatements, and we're in the process because that property owner has not been able to maintain that property in good care. We're in the process of working through another abatement situation on that one. Um, can't go into specifics because it's an open code case, but 
just like in all other cases, we have maintenance requirements, we have upkeep of property that is required, and when a property owner fails to do that, particularly if there is a concern about life safety, then our code enforcement team addresses that with the property owner, provides them opportunity to remedy the situation, and if they fail to remedy the situation, then the city takes appropriate action to um, bring the, the property into compliance with your, your maintenance code. Okay. Again, already existing. Okay. Okay. Any um, any other questions? Yes, please, if you would, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I, f for the record, just a quick sidetrack on item number 70. I was uh, absent, and I didn't realize there would be a comment period. So for the clerk to show that I would vote in opposition to item number 70. Um, with regards to this particular item, um, this has come up a lot during my campaign, and um, obviously while I'm the City Council. and I. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, coming into this, it's in a very confusing uh, conversation with a lot of different layers. Um, I was overwhelmed in the beginning and received a lot of questions from some of the people in the audience, a lot of residents in Queens Ridge. Um, and I wanted to assure everyone that's listening uh, or that will watch this that I followed through on every single question and every, every uh, commitment that I made, I followed through on. Uh, when there are things that I didn't know, I asked staff. When there were questions about the staff's integrity, I asked people outside of the city, and I asked outside council for feedback and guidance as well. Um, there's accusations about bullying for, on me. Uh, I really have not been bullied by anybody, including anyone on this council, um, and I have not been influenced by anyone on this council at all. Um, I've taken all the information and I've made decisions based on what I think is in the best interest of this ward. Um, as it relates to many of the other items today, I think the city should be spending money on services for our community as opposed to lawyers. Um, and so I uh, will be in support of this item, which I know is a disappointment to many people. Um, but I do think that it's the money that we spend on litigation is damaging to the city and damaging to the services we provide. With that being said, this is absolutely no way an indication of how I will vote on future development agreements that come before the City Council. Um, I understand the perspective of the residents. I respect the perspective of the residents. Um, and I will do my due diligence with every item that comes before City Council, much like I've done for this item. With that, um, thank, thank you, you Mayor. Sure thank you. OK, um, yes, please, Councilman Clare. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you, uh, wow, here we are again, right? Um, I've been dealing with this for, no, no, you can sit down. <laughs> been dealing with this for over four years and I remember the night that in well I, I take that back we haven't been dealing with this open space ordinance for four years we've been dealing with um, the development of Badlands which I don't see the correlation between the two except for it's another open space that has been repurposed and similar to Silverstone and uh, any other open spaces that we have um, and I, I with all due respect to my peer and the sponsor of this ordinance um, I vehemently disagree I for the reasons I stated previously to the reasons I state now, you know, I understand that if there was an issue with this ordinance that directly affected developers, that directly affected real estate um, uh, developers, then they would have come out in full force and tried to get with us and speak with us regarding the merits of the pros and cons of, of this ordinance. And, uh, I only saw one, and that, that came out. Nobody else. There was no other developers, no other major developer, no other Greater Realtors Association came out, nobody. Um, and so from sitting on a planning commission for two years prior, the question did come up a lot in the while on council, you know, have you done these things when they're coming up in front of us for whether it's a GPA or major mod or whatever the case may be? And they say, no, we haven't done it. We'll do it later. And I always found that a little odd um, as a planning commissioner, but I felt that when it went to council, maybe it'll get vetted by the time it goes there, because planning commission is a recommending committee to the city council that make the final decision. Um, so now it comes a board that says, hey, you need to do these things before you come in front of us, and I, I don't think that's a lot to ask, number one. Um, and I don't think it's singled out to any one developer. It goes across the board to anybody who's gonna uh, repurpose open space, uh, and I think it's fair and I think it's equitable. Uh, so I won't be supporting the repeal of it, uh, for obvious reasons that I've stated over and over and over again. Uh, but I, I, I have respect for my peer, and uh, if this is what she feels is appropriate for her ward, then, uh, you know, okay, I wish you all the best. But I, but I will not be supporting okay. it. I, I don't think it brings us any further. Many have talked about us, this helping the cause for the lawsuits, and everybody says the lawsuits are lawsuits. And you understand that 
it's easy for, not easy, but developers who want to just file a litany of lawsuits against the city and then cry foul about all the lawsuits that have happened with the city and then takes no responsibility out of the lawsuits for the city, then um, I, I don't think that's right either. I don't think it's moved us any further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilman Anthony. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, we're back to talking about Queens Ridge and Badlands, like you've mentioned we've been doing for the last four years, and every time one of these votes come up, it's tough. It's a tough vote. Good information on both sides, good people on both sides, but um, I have to vote. Um, what, what's interesting about this particular vote, though, is um, we keep bringing up Queens Ridge and Badlands. And uh, I don't represent Ward 2. I represent Ward 4. And if you read the ordinance, it says at the top, it says, uh, this bill to adopt additional standards and requirements regarding the repurposing of golf courses and open spaces uh, in the city of Las Vegas. Doesn't mention a development, doesn't mention a ward, it says the city of Las Vegas. So uh, I represent Ward 4. Uh, I represent the 100 plus thousand people that live in Ward 4. Uh, ward 4 has uh, Sun City Summerlin, which has three golf courses. Uh, ward 4 has uh, Painted Desert that has one golf course. Uh, ward 4, which I represent, has Desert Shores, which has a lot of open space lakes. Um, there's also a lot of open space in Ward 4 in these master plan communities as well as smaller master plan communities that are owned by somebody, but they're designated as Ward 4, uh, as open space. And uh, the people that um, uh, live next to these golf courses and lakes and open space um, bought a residence there because of those amenities. And they probably paid a premium for them. They probably paid a lot premium for them. And uh, um, they, they understand it's, uh, it's privately owned. Um, they understand that something may happen to it someday, uh, but they hope that it doesn't happen. And uh, uh, this particular ordinance doesn't stop anybody from um, developing those golf courses and open spaces. Um, they can be developed, but what this ordinance does is it adds a few extra steps that a developer has to take in order to develop those golf courses and open spaces that were built for the people that live in my ward. And I have to tell them that I supported an ordinance that provided some level of extra steps that would need to be taken to develop those properties, knowing that they still w could be developed based on what the city council does. So um, I need to tell those folks that, uh, that I represented them because that's what they're telling me to do. People in Sun City and Desert Shores and Painted Desert and other parts of Ward 4 have called me and said, we, we want you to support this ordinance because it does provide a level of protection uh, or extra steps that can be uh, that need to be taken by developers. So um, I'm not going to repeal uh, this ordinance. It was passed four to two by the city council. Um, I have no reason to repeal it based on who I represent in Ward 4. So I will not be supporting the repeal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think at this point, oh, did you want to yes. please count? Since everyone's already spoken, <laughs> I just find it, um, you know, pertinent for me to also speak to the repeal and um, being a native Las Vegan and seeing the tremendous growth that we have experienced as a city, um, I can't just think about the here and the now. I need to be a conscientious new council member and start thinking futuristically about where we're headed. And part of it is we are on our way to our master plan vision of 2050 and we can't really make prudent, intelligent decisions on behalf of our residents if we're not informed. And I feel that the, the ordinance that was crafted prior to me arriving by the residents and the homeowners um, is that sunshine and that transparency and that information that allows and affords electeds to make educated decisions. And I think that that's just 
part of being responsible and ensuring that there's balanced development and that we're bringing those that are going to be impacted and affected by it into the conversation earlier versus never. Um, so thinking about how it's increasingly becoming more and more landlocked in my ward and how very few spaces we do have to develop, I, I feel that I don't want to take the safety net away that engages my residents, my homeowners, my um, just my community. Um, I don't want to, I want to make sure that they feel like they're involved and that we're doing best by the schools, by traffic, and by safety. And by safety, I mean, is increasing the density going to allow us to afford more police officers also? So with that, you know, this is not about voting for or against, but I think it's really taking in mind what my role is and why um, I'm here, and um, I hope that you know, um, we can hopefully move beyond this and um, and find a better better day because this has been difficult on this whole city council for a long time. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so there is a motion, and before um, I do advise what I'm going to be doing, um, I wanted to be very sure again because of the 20 years of involvement with the city that everything that was in the process for development we at the city um, were addressing, that there was nothing in here except the mandated, mandated one meeting, which usually does result in many more than one meeting if there's any pushback from any community. And I tend to echo, um, and it does break my heart, that dollars and dollars and dollars and dollars that we need so desperately to run this city that are being wasted in the legal uh, realm of things. So I am actually going to be voting uh, for this and hope that Councilwoman Seaman uh, goes ahead and puts in um, something as we move forward if there's a new ordinance that is submitted that it would talk to Mr. Marley. I'm going to make you famous, Mr. Marley. <laughs> Your suggestion there that we address that in the future um, and look at that element that they're the criteria for it. But I, like Councilman Knutson, uh, very desperately see. I see nothing has been achieved by this ordinance. It was a very lengthy one, a lot of time effort. Uh, nothing new. We were already doing it, so it was duplicating what was there. And as uh, my hope is that we will continue to look at it with a fine tooth comb and expect planning and our city manager and all our departments to keep looking at this as we may bring back, or maybe you're going to do it now. I think it's agendized, but I don't know what you're going to do with it, that we assure the futures of large pieces of land that we're treating them reasonably, but to encourage development and, and truth in what, how we see the future and not discourage developers from coming in. So I will be in voting in favor of your motion. And uh, now- Mayor Jeff Dorkak, Deputy City Attorney. We don't have a motion on the floor, actually. If you want to- We don't? No, we, I don't believe Madam so. Madam Mayor, I move to approve. Okay. Thank you. There's a motion then. I've lost the number. Uh, what number are we 71. on? 71. 71. There's a motion um, on number 71. Please vote and please post. And this is on the repeal. And that motion carries. And so we will now go on to agenda item. Where are we now? 72. Um, okay, sorry. 73. We'll do 73, right? We were going to pull those together. So hold on, please. Uh, agenda bill, uh, agenda number 72, bill number 2019-49. Councilman Anthony, would you like the bill read? Yes, Mayor. Please. Yes, Mayor. This is bill number 2019-49, an ordinance to amend various provisions of the Unified Development Code to establish city communication sign as a subcategory of off-premise sign and establish the parameters under which such signs are allowed and to provide for other related matters. Move for approval. Thank you. There's a motion to approve agenda item. Where are we? Why is it not Seven. up here? I read 72. Oh, okay. Yeah, so much. did. So it's 72. But how come I'm not functioning here? 
That was 72 we read, so. That happened. was 72, we did, that was 72, the city communication sign, we didn't pull 73 forward, so we are in order. We'll be okay. going on to 73 now. And now we'll go, so please vote on agenda item 72. Oh, that was Me? <laughs> no, I did it, there it is, thank you. Okay, now 73, which I should have been reading, is bill number 219-51, Councilman Anthony, I'm sure you want the bill read. Yes. <laughs> please. Bill number 2019-51, an ordinance to amend the Unified Development Code, specifically LVMC section 19.16.10, to add new provisions regarding neighborhood meetings, including mandatory meetings for certain types of applications, such as a general plan amendments regarding land use, and applications to repurpose certain golf courses and open spaces, and to provide for other related matters. And just as a note, Mayor, in the backup for today's agenda, we have a proposed First Amendment that was reviewed at Recommending Committee. This bill came out of Recommending Committee with no recommendations, so we are going to need, if there's a motion to approve this bill, please make it with the proposed First Amendment. It's a technical matter just to make sure that all of the proper uh, applications have the neighborhood meeting that this bill would set forth. Okay, and before you make a recommendation here, can I request of staff that they take what I, for lack of a better term, the Marley recommendation into consideration if this should pass to add it in, uh, Mr. Summerfield. I think it, it is what does happen to open space land use that that should be and absolutely just taken in consideration absolutely we can we can have that and we can have it for a future briefing and if there's a sponsor for it then we can move it through the ordinance process so, but what I'd like to hear about it what are the negatives I mean obviously we know the positive I thought he did a great job in explaining what he thought and it made sense to me but then I'm sure the reasons why not so uh, as we go forward so that stands separate uh, unless this uh, recommendation and uh, a request of Councilwoman Seaman um, doesn't pass, so. We'll, we'll provide that information in a briefing setting, Thank and you. then if we have someone who wishes to sponsor that, then we'll have and something And anything forward. else that comes up that's of significant that we have, like the environmental piece, maybe we want something a little more specific in there. Of course. So, so am I making a motion just to? Just on this, so what's agendized? Agenda. Okay, so um, Madam Mayor, I move to approve. Agenda item 73. Yes. With the proposed First Amendment, please. Oh, sorry. You oh, said it so it was. Okay, it. so I move to approve with the amended First Amendment. With the First Proposed Amendment, correct. First Thank you, Councilman. First Amendment. Thank what, you. Can, is there a point of clarification of what the First Report of Amendment is? It's just for clarity. <laughs> Yeah, through you, Mayor, to Councilman Creer. It's a technical wording uh, the city attorney's <laughs> office did with planning to make sure that this, this bill has to do with neighborhood meetings. We wanted to make sure we caught everything uh, for land applications that they have the neighborhood meetings. Okay. Just for you, Stavros. Okay, and that motion carries. Thank you very much. And you know Bam. what, um, thank you very much, that motion carries. Um, you know what we didn't do, or was I sleeping through this? Um, at 10 a.m., we were supposed to have um, Mayor Pro Tem read 86, 87, and 95. Oh, so not a preemptive up front. Okay. I feel like I need to go All right, now I, item number 74, <laughs> recommending committee bills eligible at adoption for a later meeting. Like a Items number 74, bill number 219-50 will be heard at a later meeting. We'll move on to new bills. New bills, number 75, item number 7576, bill 2020-1, 2020-2 will be heard at recommending committee meeting on Monday, February 3rd, 2020. City Attorney, please read the new bills. Yes, ma'am. Bill number 2020-1, an ordinance to amend the Town Center Development Standards Manual to provide that the use motor vehicle sales used is allowed in the GC land use district only by means of special use permit to remove the provision limiting that use to the auto mall site located within the Centennial Center Plan and to provide for other related matters. Bill number 2020-2, an ordinance to amend LVMC section 19.12.70 to adjust the standards for waiving the minimum distance separation from a protected use that is otherwise required for either a beer wine cooler off sale establishment with a retail component or a beer wine cooler on and off sale establishment with a retail component and to provide for other related matters. Thank you very much. So bills number 
20-1 and 2020-2 are assigned to the February 3rd, 2020 recommending committee members, Councilman Anthony Knudsen and uh, Councilwoman Mayor Pro Tem Fiore. If any so designated or unable to attend, the clerk's office will coordinate finding substitutes as necessary at my direction. Yes? Yes. Okay, so now. 78. 78. For possible action, any items from the 10 a.m. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, any items from the 10 a.m. session that the council staff and or applicant wish to be stricken, table withdrawn, or held in abeyance to a future meeting may be brought forward and act upon this time, please. Madam Mayor, um, we have the items number 86 and 87, SUP-77365 and SDR 77366, applicant owner 900 Fremont LLC at 916 Fremont Street, abeyance requested to February 5th, 2020, requested by our councilwoman Diaz, and item number 95. DIR-78038, applicant City of Las Vegas at 1600 South Las Vegas Boulevard, Suite 120, abeyance to February 19, 2020, requested by the applicant. And that's your and motion. And that is my motion. Thank you. There's a motion on those items. Please vote and please post. Michelle, did you vote? No. Oh. I thought I did. It didn't go through. Motion carries. Okay. We're on to agenda I said in D9. Public hearing and discussion for possible action to consider a request for a waiver and or reduction of fees totaling $18,334.59 out of pocket costs 90,000 civil penalties for a total of $108,334.59 recorded against the property located 1640 East, excuse me, 1614 East Ogden Avenue. New property owner, MT Real Estate Investment Inc., Ward 5, Councilman Creer, the public hearing, which I declare open, and let's hear from Mrs. Zuna first. <coughs> Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council. Uh, the item before you today is a request of waiver of civil penalties for the property located at 1614 <coughs> East Ogden, Ogden Avenue. Code enforcement completed four abatement actions on this property from 2011 to 2019 while the property was owned by Jose Zapita. Uh, the total hard cost assessed against the property through the four abatements was $18,334.59 and $90,000 in civil penalties. The property was purchased by MT Real Estate LLC on August 6, 2019 for $157,000. Code enforcement inspected this property on Monday and found high weeds on the property, but the uh, building is secure. Uh, the new owner has not rehabilitated the property yet and um, the city has basically acted as the property management for the previous owner for the last five years. Um, staff is requesting that you deny this waiver request. Thank you very much. And so, gentlemen, if you'll introduce yourselves and tell us what your interests are and what you would like heard by the council. Uh, my name is Michael Turner. I represent MT Real Estate Investment. Okay. Uh, my name is Gregory Logan. I'm an associate of Mike Turner. Okay. The one-two punch. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for allowing us to come here uh, before you today. <coughs> um, and I just want to mention for the new council members that didn't know, we have been here before. And in fact, we came before the council on a property on um, 1209 Norman. And City Council uh, was nice enough to grant us 100% relief uh, on uh, civil penalties. We also came to City Council on 2009 Linden, 1402 Joshua, 1215 16th Street, and 849 Greenbrook Street, all of which uh, we were granted 90% waiver on civil penalties on these property on, on those properties. Uh, here today before uh, you, we request on this particular property 100% waived on civil penalties. And the reason is, is because the property's been vacant for at least 10, maybe even 12 years. Uh, 
Wow. The renovation on this property, and if, if I can, can I just go through these pictures real quick? Certainly. Yeah. This is uh, referring to the front of the property. And now we're going inside. Oh my, can you turn that one, please, that last one? I'm sorry. No, uh, the upside down. You're hanging oh, from this the ceiling. Way? There you are, okay. When was that taken, please? Uh, probably about 30 days ago. Okay. Recent, recent time. This is the rear property and it abates up to a commercial property. Once again, the rear of the property. Okay, thank you. And so with the amount of uh, expense it's gonna take to, to make this property whole, uh, that's the reason why we would request 100% of waiver of the civil penalties. Okay, thank and we're here to answer any questions that Mr. Green may have or anybody else. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Summerfield, any comments, Mr. Summerfield or Ms. McElhone or Ms. Zuna? Anybody want to make any comments here? No, ma'am, nothing from beyond what Ms. Zuna has already put on the record. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, any questions from council? No? Okay. Uh, to your baby, Councilman. Clark. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. You know, Mr. Turner, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, Mr. Logan, pleasure to see you as well. You know, we've met and we talked and um, I still stand with what I said was that I don't mind uh, working with a developer, especially on civil penalties, and if they're showing that they're doing something that is more beneficial to the community, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. But I have yet to see anything from you that shows what you're what you're doing, and 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 I told you this too. And it's no offense to you as an individual and as your business. I think you have a long history. But people do come in front of us and they make promises on things and they do not do them. Um, they come in and get entitlements for, for things and then they turn around and sell the property. Uh, they get abatement on civil penalties and then they turn around and flip the property and sell it. And then we're nowhere closer to getting an enhanced and a beautiful uh, home, a building, than we were the first time. Yet we've mitigated. $90,000 worth of civil penalties, which are accumulated because of the fact that, like Mr. Zuna said, they've had to become the property manager for five years for this property just to, just to keep it up, a, up and afloat. And so there needs to be some remuneration for that. Um, and then also, I don't know what you're doing there. And uh, I think you need to do it, then come back in front of this board, and we'll work with you to get those civil penalties and mitigated. Councilman, if I might yes, interrupt please. you, the one thing I failed to do, um, it is a public hearing. So if there's nope. anybody, I did fail to do that. Is there anyone here that has comments on this item number 79? Please come forward. Okay, now I'll close it back to you. Great. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Sorry. Mayor. So I haven't changed on that from our conversation that we had with me and my staff. And so I'm not sure, as of today, I would not feel comfortable mitigating any of the civil penalties as of today because I just don't know what's going to happen and I haven't seen you make any, any strides towards rehabbing this property. And therefore your motion is? Well, I'll, I'll give you an option. I don't know if you want to table this or pull I would, or, um, or what have you. I can, I can come back, Mr. Kerr, if you, if you wish. I could also post a bond up if you wish, but uh, I've been in, in business almost 30 years. Yep. My reputation with my license can be easily checked. You can probably do it by your phone. Uh, Michael Turner, Turner Realty, MT Real Estate Investments. We, we don't play games. And, uh, and furthermore, I do have a track record with the city council. Yep, you're right. And I tell you, you know, uh, when I first got on council, there was a developer that came in and said they're going to build $100 million worth of apartments on the corner of uh, Decatur and Vegas Drive. Uh, and they had plans, and they said they're going to do the whole thing, and we gave them the entitlements. And next thing you know, a friend of mine said, hey, you know that property's for sale. So it's no offense to you. It's okay. Right? And it's, it, it really isn't. I want to help you. But okay. I, I just need, you need to give me something. Get, get, okay. Can or you if, or if, me? You, or if you want to get halfway through the rehabilitation and come back or something. But, you know, you haven't broken ground. There's nothing there. The place still looks like it did from when you purchased That's it. That's correct. And yeah. so, and I understand what you're saying. You're saying, look, I, 
I don't know if I want to invest this money if I can't get my civil penalties taken care of, right. which, which makes a lot of sense. But I'm okay. telling you that I'll be happy to work with you, okay. but you have to give me something okay. and show me something that you're moving forward with something. Now, if we deny it today, then that means you can't come back. That means, is that, is that etched in stone that they can never come back or they have to wait a year to come back? Or? No, they can come back. They can reapply for a new waiver when they're ready and we can put it back on the agenda if that's what you want. And Mr. Creer, do they have to pay? Do you have right, to pay Right, I was about again? to ask that. They would have to pay for a whole new filing fee again. There, there is no filing fee for oh, it's just a, Oh, there's not? No, oh. but the, the problem is, is that it is on a tax roll and, yep. you know, it's, it's out there to go up for auction. But, but would, I mean, would, it be, would it be okay situation. if I post a hundred thousand dollar bond and come back in, in ninety days with a beautiful product, and then we can solve it then? I would have to refer to either Mr. Summerfield, Ms. McElhane, or somebody. Um, you know, sounds good to me, right? But okay. I, I just, I just want to have a comfort level. I'm not trying to. There's some pull and I'm not saying you are. I completely want to work with you, and I have every Thank trust you. that you're going to get this done, especially based off of your history from before. And I apologize you. that you even have to go through this. It's just a matter of, I, this is, this is what I have seen, and I don't feel comfortable just mitigating this without, and, and I would, this is no different than anybody else, whether okay. it's $2 million on the Moulin Rouge property or if it's $90,000 okay. on Ogden Street. Um, so maybe Mr. Summerfield or Mary or Vicki or somebody can tell me what might be a suggestion so, uh, Madam Mayor, through you, um, so Councilman, again, typically we, we look for actual performance. Right. So we look for improvements to have been completed or substantially completed right. um, for the hearing officer or council in the past when we have made a, uh, recommendations for lowering those civil penalties. Um, it really is, at the end of the day, up to you on what you deem is sufficient to feel comfortable that they're going to invest the money that you're waving back into the property and back into the community. Um, so if you feel comfortable that somehow the bond will satisfy that concern, like I said, typically we look for proof of, right. of um, Council improvement. And Councilman, maybe, maybe if we just obey the item for four months or three months. Well, that's what I was thinking. Give the, yeah. give the applicant an opportunity yeah. to make the changes you, you think you'd want to see and then have them come back okay. and on yeah. a status check. That's that what I said originally. Four months is more than fair. I'll okay, great. Before then. Great. Why don't, why don't we obey it for four months okay. um, and come back and then in the process let us know what's going on and we'll work with you. To I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it very All much. Right. Thank you. Do we need a motion for that? Yes, please. Okay. Sure. I have to make a motion to obey this. For four months, is it anybody have a calendar when that meeting May might 20th. Be? Pardon me? May 20th. To May 20th. Thank you. So in the meantime, fix it up. Yes. Oh, we will. So there's a motion. <laughs> you no, know we will. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Wait, wait, we have to vote. One sec, please, before it happens. <laughs> Legitimately. There you are. Now you got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Zuna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move on to 80 through 85, maybe considering one motion, one vote, and are considered routine, non-public, public hearing items with no condition changes. Any person representing an application or a member of the public or member of the council not in agreement with the conditions and all standard conditions for the application recommended by staff should request to have that item removed from this portion of the agenda. Number 80, RQR 77463, applicant, Las Vegas billboards, owner, Wild Decatur LLC on a required review of an approved special use permit SUP 3061 for a 40 foot tall sign, 12 foot by 24 foot off premise sign at 1571 North Decatur Boulevard, C1 Limited Commercial Zone Ward 5. Councilman Creer, number 81, DIR 77999. Boy, that's a good number. Applicant owner, Howard Hughes Corporation, LLC, on a required review of a 24-month development report as required by Section 11.01 .01 of the Summerlin West Development Agreement, generally located west of the I-215 Beltway and north of Charleston Boulevard, Ward 2, Councilwoman Seaman. Agenda item 82, EOT 77996, applicant owner Sahara Edmund Plaza, LOC, request for a first extension of time for a non-conforming liquor establishment tavern use at 5310 West Sahara Avenue, Suite D, C1 Limited Commercial Zone 1, Councilman Knutson, number 83, 
RQR 77460, Applicant Regan National Advertising Owner, Mercado 888, LLC, on a required review of an approved special use permit, SUP 2758, for a 40-foot tall, 14-foot by 48-foot off-premise sign at 6785 West Charleston Boulevard, C1 Limited Commercial Zone, Ward 1, Councilman Knudsen. Number 84, RQR 77822, Applicant Regan National and Reagan National Advertising Owner 1999 LLC and a required review of approved special use permit U-00 34 dash 01 40 foot uh, 40 foot tall 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign at 2101 South Decatur Boulevard C2 General Commercial Ward 1 Zone Can uh, Councilman Knutson number 85 VAC 77685, applicant owner Goodhood LLC, on a request for a petition to vacate a 20 foot wide alley between Las Vegas Boulevard, 6th Street, south of Carson, uh, Ward 3, Councilwoman Diaz. Staff recommends approval on all items. Planning Commission recommends approval on um, item 85. These are all public hearings, which I declare open. Is there anyone wishing to be heard on numbers 80 through 85? Seeing and hearing none, I'll close public hearings and Mayor Pro Tem may have a motion, one motion, one vote, items 80 to 85, please. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the one motion, one vote items. Thank you very much. There's a motion to approve. Uh, please vote and please post. Motion carries, thank you very much. And as we know, um, 86 and 87 have been obeyed to February 5th. Yep. So we are now on to 88 through 92. <coughs> okay. Um, ZON 77627 on a request for rezoning from U undeveloped SC service commercial general plan designation to C1 limited commercial on. 0.13 acres at the southwest corner of Kyle Canyon Drive and Oso Blanco Drive, number 89, SUP 77628, a request for a special use permit for a 5,100 square foot liquor establishment tavern use, number 90, SUP 77629, a request for a special use permit for a proposed 3,000 square foot beer, wine, cooler, off sale establishment use, number 91, SDR 77630, a request for a site development plan review for proposed commercial development consisting of 3,000 square foot restaurant with drive through a 3,000 square foot convenience store with fuel pumps and canopy and a 5,500 square foot liquor establishment tavern with waivers of the perimeter landscape buffer requirements and not to not orient the building to the corner and street frontage where such is required. And number 92, TMP 77631, a request for a tentative map for a one lot commercial subdivision. The applicant owner, CM Sagebrush 1 3082 LLC, on 2.61 acres, southwest corner Kyle Canyon Road, Oso Blanca Road, C1 Limited Commercial U, undeveloped zones proposed C. One limited commercial. The Planning Commission recommends approval on all items. Staff recommends approval on items number 88 and 92, denial on 89 through 91. These are in Ward 6 with Mayor Pro Tem Fiore, our public hearing items, which I declare open. Is the applicant present? Madam Mayor, I, I apologize. We do have to take one procedural item here. Um, so because of action that was taken by the City Council at the last City Council meeting, I need to request at this time that uh, item 89, SUP 77628, be tabled um, as action cannot be taken on it um, because it is within the distance separation to a tavern uh, SUP that was approved last meeting. So we're going to table this as indicated in briefings. The Mayor Pro Tem has put forth um, some ideas for some policy conversations that may allow that to come back in the future, but I would need to eliminate that 
and then note that on the site development review where it does indicate a uh, building as, that is proposed as a tavern, um, for that matter to go forward as just a retail or commercial building and not as a tavern at this time. So as we itemize this, go through them one at a time. Yes. When we get to that, then Mayor Pro Tem will table that But one. for the discussion purposes, even for the record, if we could vote on tabling that item first so it's outside okay. of the presentation, that Maybe would be helpful for just the okay. procedure on the meeting. So you're aware of that? Uh, you're, uh, Mayor Brian Hardy with the law firm of Marquis Arbot coughing on behalf of the applicant. Um, yes, we're aware of the tabling issue and we're looking very much forward to working with Mayor Pro Tem to get this taken care of as soon as possible so that we can get this back on an agenda and we can get this taken care of because we're ready to develop, which is exactly what Councilman Creer was talking about. We love tearing them. We're ready to go. We're ready to go. We're ready to go, sir. Okay, so, great. Uh, so Mayor Pro Tem, let's have a motion on that. Thank you, you Madam Mayor. And yes, and please begin building just because we're tabling item number 89. So my motion is to table item number 89. Okay, this motion, please vote and please post. Okay, so now we'll get back to number, uh, we'll start with 88. Mr. Summerfield, anything before I um, let the applicant go? Anything else, Dan? No, ma'am. Procedurally, that was, I just needed to take care of that, and then we can just have them do their report, and I'll do mine. So please go ahead. Anything you wish to state on this? Again, Brian Hardy with the law firm of Marquis Arbot coughing on behalf of the applicant for the remainder of the items. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, we appreciate your support in this particular matter in the past. We, as you know, this is, an op this is a, uh, a shopping center that we're going to be putting at Kyle Canyon in Asa Blanco. Um, it's got a C store, it's got fast food, and we're hoping in the future to have some other development there as well. Um, this is a, a great opportunity, a great benefit for this area, it's something that's needed out there. Um, and we've gotten the support of the Planning Commission, and we hope that we can get the support of the City Council as well as we proceed with this development and hopefully be able to proceed with the entirety of the development sooner rather than later. What is the drive-through? Uh, the drive-through is for the drive-through for the fast food or for the... The drive-through for the fast food, which one? For, or don't you know which one yet? That we'll have a drive-through. Well, we, we've signed, we have some leases that we have currently have pending. Okay. Um, that's I, all right. Just curious. I can't Anthony. disclose some of those no, leases because I, I guess I can't talk about at least one of them for sure because that issue's been tabled. <laughs> but we have a lease for that. We're, okay. we're ready to get it developed. We have a lease already sitting on my Great. desk. It's been negotiated, ready to be signed as soon as I can get that tabled back on here and we Great. can get that development going. That's how close that's how close we are to getting this developed. Great. So we're ready to go. Wonderful. So this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to be heard on 88, 90, or 91, or 92? Close public hearing, and uh, does council, anybody want to say anything here? It's all yours, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Wait, I need not to. all yours. Can you, Can you let Ms. Lazovich, uh, she needs to make a statement, and then I need to give my staff report as well. Well, before, I yeah, I just want to make sure before she makes her statement, w Robert, Mr. Summerfield, we talked about our trails. Where is that? So uh, she's going to make her statement about that request uh, that they have. Um, as you know, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, the, the Ward 6 has developed so fast, this area is not within our master plan for our trails, and so we do not have an adopted trail plan for this area. However, uh, one of the conditions of approval that's currently on here that was placed on it at Planning Commission does require the enhanced trees, so upgrade from the 24-inch box to the 36-inch box. Um, and then the other piece of it, and I think Ms. Lazovich is going to speak okay. to it, is a request for, in consideration to look at that Sky Canyon Trail for the developer to consider well, we, yeah. that going forward. So we're going to make a master trail plan right we, now. We absolutely are. Six, we absolutely uh, we are. We have to have trails, I'm just going to tell you. So this could all get approved with trails or, or not approved, and I'm sure you want to make trails. Okay, Ms. Lazovich, <laughs> go ahead, please. Jennifer Lazovich, 1980 Festival Plaza Drive here today on behalf of Sky Canyon. And yes, that was just, um, I'm actually standing in for Mr. Gronauer who's gone to another hearing. It was just simply to note on the record the desire to continue a trail system um, that has largely started by Sky Canyon and just keep it going. So, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Lazovich, uh, on the property ac across from them, but you guys have trails on that piece of property. Yes, that's my understanding. So maybe we can share with them on their development how to continue it. 
Do you see right. what I'm saying? Right. Just we so to, it's a flow. Right. We have to kind of bridge it together somehow. Yeah. Right. Because we, so in the Northwest, as our Madam Mayor states all the time, it's, it's the last frontier. So we've got to be careful as we do growth that it is smart growth and it's smart growth for that rural feel as well. So that's why trails and big trees are so important. I'm not waiting for him to make a comment, but it's good. Okay, so do you agree about that? We accepted the trees. Um, obviously, uh, with the Planning Commission, we're amenable to those. As far as the trail, we'd like to be able to see, obviously, with, with approval, right? I mean, we can go back administratively and take a look because we don't know what that's going to look can like right that? now. We don't know what the plan's going to look like. And so we don't have to come back here to get approval for any site development or site changes that would require Trust for that. me, our planning knows what and, oh, I and mean by trail. Absolutely, trails, Madam so. Mayor 3, Mayor Pro Tem, it's the the difference between what they have and what they would need to do to correspond, we believe, is minimal. And we already, as a part of your conditions of approval, is they have to give us an updated landscape and site plan to reflect uh, the other changes that are in there. So it, it should not be a, an issue to do anything beyond an administrative perfect. update to the approval, assuming an approval. Okay, perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Therefore, thank you. On agenda item 88. Therefore, on agenda item 88, we are going to move to approve. Okay. There's a motion on agenda item 88 to approve. And once we get the little circles. Okay. We can do it orally. Aye. Yeah. Please, oral. Aye. 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 Unanimous uh, 89 is tabled. So on number 90. We did vote. That we was did. our first vote. Yeah. Okay. And so 90. 90, I move to approve. Thank you. There's a motion to approve on agenda 90. Please vote and please post. And that carries. Oh, we're clicking along. Number 91, please. I move to approve. M Madam Mayor. So this is the one where I just need to make sure, again, for the record, the clarification that with this approval, it is understood that the 5,500 square foot liquor establishment tavern, uh, as indicated in the header, is a 5,500 foot commercial or retail building at this time. Correct. So I move to approve with Mr. Summerfield's words. Okay. On agenda item 91, please vote and please post. that motion carries so the last one's 92 I move to oh, sorry I move to approve madam mayor thank you there's a motion to approve on 92 please vote and please post I'm trying there it is and that motion carries thank you we look forward to seeing thank you, you appreciate again. your time mayor. Thank we can you. look forward to working together on getting this done thank you Okay, so now we're on to 93 and 94, correct? Okay, agenda item 93 and 94. Uh, 93 VAR 77642, a request for variance to allow 407 parking spaces where 449 are required, approximately 190 feet south of Meadows Lane. Number 94, SDR 77643, a request for site development plan review for proposed 865 square foot restaurant with a drive through approximately 155 feet south of Meadows Lane. The applicant is Dutch Brothers Coffee and the owners Decatur Meadows Shopping Center LLC on 9.32 acres, west side of Decatur Boulevard, C2 General Commercial Zone for both items planning. Commission recommends approval and staff recommends denial. These are in Ward 1 with Councilman Knudsen or public hearings, which I declare open. Applicant, I assume. Yes. Paul Deppi, uh, architect for Dutch Bros Coffee. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Councilman Knudsen for meeting us and Planning Commission for approving the project. Uh, and uh, we are in concurrence with all the conditions of staff, otherwise than the variance for the parking, which is why they had initially denied it. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Great, thank you. It's exciting, and 
Mr. Summerfield. Um, Madam Mayor, so uh, the proposed restaurant with drive through is a compatible use of the, the site at the shopping center um, and is compatible with the existing surrounding development. However, because this does create a parking imbalance uh, with a reduction in parking necessitating the waiver, uh, we believe that this is self-imposed and therefore staff has recommended denial of the variance and the subsequent site development review. Okay, thank you. This is a public hearing. Is anyone um, interested in making comment on 93 or 94? Please come forward. They've had enough, they've left. Okay, I'll close public comment. And anyone, council, any questions, comments? Nope. Uh, Councilman Knudsen. Uh, thank you very <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for, for being here. I just wanted to make sure it's clear to the rest of the council. Um, the model for Dutch Brothers Coffee is a little different than some of the other coffee shops in town, that it is solely a drive up. And so many of the folks who, who expressed some opposition didn't really understand that. And once they understood that, they became very excited. Um, so if you look at the parking lot in that area, I think it's more than accommodating for that type of business. Um, and as I understand, although I have not tried it yet, Dutch Brothers Coffee is, is amazing and the customer service is over the top amazing. So I think it's a very good fit for the ward and I would motion for approval. Okay, good. what do you mean by it's different? What do you mean by drive up it's, rather than drive through? It's essentially um, a drive through key, uh, coffee stand. There's no interior dining or consumption. There's a walk up window uh, in, as well as the drive, drive up window. And to uh, Councilman Knudsen's point, I mean, we do a lot of uh, quick serve fast food restaurants and it is, I, I hadn't heard of it until we started working for these guys and it's just top notch as far as the customer service goes. Um, I know you have a couple here in town, but uh, the customer service is, it's, it's, there's no menu boards, it's very person to person uh, interaction. Uh, there's menu boards, sorry, rather no drive through speakers blaring out, you know, somebody's talking through a mic from the inside of the stand. And it's just a, a very clean, very well-run concept. So there are other franchises around town of this company? Yeah, they're all company-owned, um, and um, they franchise from within. And they're based out of Grants Pass, Oregon, and, and then uh, hmm. extending down through the southwest. So you vouch for their coffee? I have not you tried the coffee. I however, In however, City. Mayor, if you look at that corner, that's where the council approved a, a housing complex to go Correct. on, which is going to have a first floor of retail. Um, so I think this is another step in revitalizing that area. And I'm, I'm happy and excited to try Dutch Brothers Coffee. Excellent. It is good coffee. So how many um, employees will be um, on a shift in this? They usually run about uh, four to six employees to a shift. And, and again, they, they have uh, employees that actually staff the the drive through stack oh. so that they're, again they're and, and if they've served the order they'll run down to the sixth seventh eighth car give them their order oh. without them having to even get to the window and then if you look at the site plan i have it here just to kind of i don't know what's coming on but we can flip back they have actually a bypass lane so that you know the cars can escape Keep as well but as they've gotten the order before they get to the window but um so it exits onto Meadows or onto Decatur? On, onto Decatur. So here's the, um, it's oh. a double drive-through. The, the stores are here, the kiosk is here, coffee stand is what they call it. They'll run, uh, the runners is what they call them, to come down and they'll serve the cars in the stack and or come across, serve the cars in this stack. And this paint and striped area here allows, if those cars have been served, to exit, exit before they're, you know, while they're... And do you also, besides coffee, serve breakfast, lunch? They have no pr no food. Uh, oh. It's only drinks. Uh, so it's uh, interesting. Concept. Quite an array. If you go on their website and look at their menu, it's okay. well, pretty. Uh, you create your own and go there often enough. The employees know who you are and what your order is, and it's pretty amazing. Wonderful. I mean, Being coffee drinker, I'll be there. Hot, their uh, chocolate milk's pretty good too. Okay. Thank you. All right, and so on uh, agenda item then 93, you're moving for approval. We'll take them one at a time. Thanks. Uh, yes, I move for approval okay. on item number 93. Okay, there's a motion to approve agenda item 93. Please vote and please post. Great. And then 94. And Mayor, I move for approval on item nine, number 94. Great. And there's a motion on 94. <coughs> so when are you going to open? Uh, we're going into plan check. We already got our civil drawings into plan check, so as soon as we can get our plans approved, 
90 days after we get approval, we'll hopefully have a store there. Hopefully it's happening. We can get power to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Motion carries. Okay, so that was 93, 94, 95 has been obeyed till February 19th? Yes. Yes. Okay, so now we're on to 96. Um, I'd instruct the city clerk to please set the public hearing dates and appeals from the city planning commission meetings and dangerous bu building nuisance letter abatement. Will do, thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're into our final citizen participation. Citizen participation public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of city council. No subject may be acted upon by the city council unless that subject is on the agenda and scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, please come to the podium, give your name for the record, the amount of discussion on any single subject, as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. This is your opportunity to address the council, but the council will not respond or engage in dialogue. Is there any member of the public who wishes to speak under this portion of the agenda? We will now move on. Seeing and hearing none, we will move on to number 98, council member recognition. Comments made by individual council members during this portion of the agenda will not be acted upon by the city council unless the subject is on the agenda and scheduled for action. So I know we always have comments to make, so let's go ahead and start with Councilwoman Diaz. I get to start, okay. <laughs> All right, it's been a long meeting and I know we all want to go home, so we'll be short and to the point. Um, coming up this Monday, I know that Councilman Creer was um, on the news this morning, making sure to advocate for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So don't miss Martin Luther King Jr. Parade this Monday, January 20th at 10 a.m. and uh, it will start off of Hoover and Stewart. So we'll see you all there. I know many of us plan on being there. And, and we'll it? go on to the next. I'm waiting oh. for the slides to go okay, so I can cute. speak. <laughs> um, just like we heard during ceremonials, the Chinese Heritage Year of the Rat Reception um, is happening here Friday, January 24th from 5 to 7 at the historic 5th Street School, 401 South 4th Street. And admission is free. So please you know, take advantage of this opportunity to celebrate the new year once more and the Year of the Rat. Um, we, in, in coordination with the festivities for Chinese New Year's, it extends into Saturday, January 25th with the Las Vegas Spring Festival Parade. And I'm so happy that they um, decided to give some love to 18B. Uh, the par parade route will be off of Utah and Main Street and uh, it will go Maine to California. There will be a parade after party in the Arts District from 9.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. So make sure you don't miss this. And this is all with the goal Golden Knights sponsorship. Go Knights. Can't wait. Um, on a more serious note, um, we're inviting everyone to a community meeting for development along Maryland Parkway. This is the time to really voice what you would want to see done with that transit corridor. And uh, they're going to have this meeting to take all community input so that as they're going through the development planning process, they can take into account your issues, your concerns, and what you think is needed when we do this um, project. So when are, when are we having the discussion? It's on January 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the center on 401 South Maryland Parkway. And this is in coordination with the RTC and Clark County. And that is all for me, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. And uh, Councilman Knutson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, January is National Mentoring Month. Um, if you've had a mentor in your life, now is a great time to recognize them for helping you become the person that you are today. Uh, Madam Mayor, you have been a mentor for me for many years, so thank you for taking the time to, to help me become a, a positive person in this community. Oh, I'd love um, you if you have the capacity to be a mentor yourself, there are many ways to do so, from the after-school all-stars, communities and schools, boys and girls clubs, big brothers and big sisters, just to name a few. Uh, mentoring is one of the most important things we can do as adults. 
Uh, this Thursday, the 16th, is January's Brews with Brian. Very, very popular. Huh? 5.30 to 7 p.m. at Aces and L's on Tanea. It's a great opportunity for me to meet the neighbors, um, and everybody who comes is always uh, super welcoming and have ideas and thoughts about how this community can be better, so I'm grateful for everyone who's shown up. And there is always a crowd, so I'm excited about this coming up Thursday. And then on Tuesday, January 28th at 10 a.m., we'll be celebrating the unveiling of Bill Breyer's new fitness court. This is part of the global movement to shape healthy outdoor infrastructure and healthy lifestyles in cities. And I hope to see a lot of our community out there with me. Thank you, Mayor. Wonderful. And for those of you who are new to town, Bill Breyer um, was mayor. And uh, he followed in, I believe, Warren Gregson. He's left some wonderful um, legacy. And so this is exciting that his park's being fixed, among the others so you're fixing or have fixed in your ward. So great. I'm skipping you because you're Mayor Pro Tem. And we're going down to the far end with Councilwoman um, Seaman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, so we're going to start with our next slide. I want everyone to know about the utility tax sewer rebate program. And there are several locations that you can go apply for this rebate. One is Centennial Hills Active Adult Center. You can go to Deers, Deerfeld Senior Center, Dula, Howard Lieburn Senior Center, Doolittle Senior Center, and the East Las Vegas Community Center, and it begins yet began January 6th and ends March 14th. So if you need to get a hold of us in our office, just please give us a call. And next want to reach out to folks about our Small Business Sundays. It's become very, very popular. So if you have a business in Ward 2, we would be happy to come out and just film your small business and put, our, put you on our Small Business Sundays social media channels. So again, you can just contact our office at 702-229-2420 or email us at ward2 at lasvegasnevada.gov. Next, we have some animals up for adoption. We have Nala. She's a spayed female, nine months old, and 5.4 pounds. Next, we have Tito. He's adorable, male, nine years old, eight pounds. So cute. And Shakira, spayed female, four years, 54.4 pounds. And then we have Sunset, beautiful cat, two years old, 7.1 pounds, it's a female. So if anyone wants to adopt any of these lovely pets, you can just call the Animal Foundation. Next slide, please. At 702-955-5901, or you can email them at adoptions at animalfoundation.com. Thank you, Madam Thank Mayor. Thank you. And um, what a nice birthday present you present by coming back for Councilman Ann. I flew in. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, as we are approaching uh, the end of January, we're still in the middle of we're going to hit Black History Month. In the month of February, as you know, is designated as Black History Month. And I just want to take a moment to recognize our Parks and Rec Department for all of their uh, work that they do in serving um, on our Las Vegas Black History Committee. They do our standing work. You can always visit the website, lastsecondsnevada.gov slash ward5 and find out everything that's going on. Uh, we start Peace Week 2020, Sunday, uh, January the 19th. Uh, join us at the West Las Vegas Library Theater on Sunday the 19th from 3 to 5 p.m. as we honor the life, legacy, and contributions of my uh, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity brother and my Sigma Pi Phi Archon, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the spirit of Dr. King we will hear from leaders who are making positive changes in their community. Uh, this inspiring event will feature performances of dance, spoken word, and more to include a performance by the Trinity Conservatory of Performing Arts. And during this event, community service awards will be presented to community members and groups who have made a huge impact to improve the lives of residents. For more information, please call 702-229-6125. I'm going to skip the Martin Luther King Parade. Thank you, uh, Councilman Diaz, for um, bringing that to the forefront. 
uh, Thursday of the 23rd of January. It's the first Ward 5 Community Conversation of 2020. It will take place uh, at 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Tenea Creek Brewery, located at 835 West Bonanza Road. Uh, we look forward to kicking off the year to meet with residents and businesses and come on out and join the conversation to discuss matters that are always important to you. For more information, call 702-229-5443. Uh, we have the grand opening of the Doula Community Center Thursday, January the 23rd. Join me on the 23rd at 2 p.m. to celebrate the newly combined community center and gymnasium located at 451 East Bonanza Road. The center has undergone major renovations and we are celebrating the grand opening. Our programming will include activities and events for all ages and abilities. For information, contact 702-229-6307. And you can always find us on social media at Twitter at Cedric Creer. Instagram, Councilman Career, Facebook, Councilman Cedric Career. Thank you. Thank you. And please make sure from here on out that all the PR that goes out, including anything you send, says do this um, community complex. complex yes. Because that said the wrong name. They yes. didn't know. Yes. All right, Mayor Pro Tem, go. Please. Thank you. I did not know that January was mentor month, so thank you. Councilman Knutson for saying that. On that note, I will tell you, people have asked me what happened to me. And I said, <laughs> Madam Mayor Goodman, what happened to me? So it's working whenever you're doing according to the outsiders. Oh. Oh, nice. So thank you for being such a great mentor to me for the last couple of years. So tomorrow night we have our Golden Knights game, Thursday the 16th. Game starts at 4.30, so get your gear on. Then we have a very, very, very special park opening. And it's going to be Jeremy Mitchell Huber Field. It's the grand opening. It's January 26, 10 a.m. This is our lacrosse fields, and we are going to be giving a proclamation to him and his family to make January 26 at 10 a.m. Um, his day. Jeremy um, left us at age 19. He was in college in the East with um, like pneumonia type of thing just last year. So. This will be um, the one year anniversary and we got it done thanks to Greg Weitzel and his whole team. So please join me for this very, very special park opening on January 26th. And then we have the first of two, this is, touches me and everyone else, my, our mayor, myself and all city council is welcome to join us. Um, mayor and I will be at the Officer Allen Beck Park uh, for the grand opening and unveiling of the park on Wednesday, January 31st, 2020 at 10 a.m. Officer Allen Beck and his partner, Officer Igor Saldor, was having lunch in CeCe's Pizza in 2014 and they were gunned down and, um, and they live in our ward out there in the Northwest and so we are building two parks and Officer Allen Beck's Park is the first park to come and Madam Mayor and I work diligently and we will be revealing Officer Alan Beck's life-size bronze statue on January 31st, 2020 at 10 a.m. So please join us, our police officers, for this groundbreaking. And Mrs. Beck and, and Alan Beck's kids, too. Then we have some good news. We located um, a baby, uh, Willie Thomas, which was only 11 months old. The baby was last seen with the custodial mother and uh, was missing, but now they have found the baby. So good job, you guys. Mm. Now we are going to be looking for Tatiana Guterres. She's only 16 years old. She's adorable. She's only 4'10", 91 pounds, hazel eyes, black hair. She's Hispanic. She was last seen in the area Reno, in Reno, Nevada, so it's unknown where she is right now, and it's unknown of what she was wearing last, so please, if you have any information on Tatiana, please call Reno Police at area code 775-334-2121, or our Nevada Child Seekers here at 702-458-7009. Then we have another missing youth. Soraya Garcia, she's 17, she's 5 feet, 100 pounds, blue eyes, blonde hair. Um, she's a Caucasian, and she was last seen in the area of Sparks, Nevada. So please, if you see Soraya, please call Sparks Police Department, which is 775 area code 353-2231, or our Nevada Child Seekers at 702-458-7009.
Then we have our Corridor of Hope, Homeless Success Stories, Tracy uh, Verdamirano. Tracy has proved herself to be an extraordinary person. She states she became homeless while struggling to maintain employment while managing her disabilities with her health. She vividly remembers how she ended up at the courtyard her very first night of homelessness. While recalling that terrifying night on June 28, 2019, Tracy's voice reflected the tears that streamed from her eyes. She carried on to, to state she had called the mainstream number for homeless resources at uh, star 211 and was provided information to the local shelters. Unfortunately, the shelters had reached their capacity. Tracy laughs remembering the 211 operator stating, there's always the courtyard. Today, Tracy states the courtyard was her true, genuine blessing. Tracy tells us the first service she received was a place to rest and sleep. She states she felt safe providing what she describes as a space. Tracy was inspired to capture her experience with homelessness in her novel published through Amazon titled Clarity, Memoirs from the Streets of Vegas under the name of T. Ray. Tracy states the greatest service she received was being placed in a flexible housing program in August of 2019. She is proud to say that the program gave her the tools and resources, along with positive to support, to feel and regain her control over her life and hopes for her future. Beautiful. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Beautiful, I like that. I love to hear success stories, wonderful. Well, I think between uh, or among all of you, you've covered everything. I was gonna do the Martin Luther King, also Chinese New Year, but that's been so capably done. And um, I do want to thank uh, Gerard Gallant of the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. He, for whatever reason, and uh, we're not privy to that, but thank you for bringing us that wonderful winning team for the time that you were employed by the Vegas Golden Knights. And I understand we have a San Jose Sharks coach coming in, Peter DeBoer. So we wish you well and wish you, Mr. Gallant, Coach Gallant, uh, the best as you go forward with the next part of your life. Um, and for us, all of us, uh, we are all fans of the great Vegas Golden Knights. So um, I want to thank our staff, our wonderful staff here, and for just all that you do to keep us informed. And I want to thank Tech because you are always forever there. And very specifically, I want to thank our Marshal Detail who keeps keeps us safe and, and ever watching all of us. Our clerk's office, who's done an outstanding job keeping us on point, except when the computer doesn't work, which isn't your fault. And anyway, I uh, wish you all, thank you very much for everything that you do. I think it's been a productive day. I'm sure some people aren't thrilled to death with some of the decisions, but that's, you can't win them all. So um, the main thing is thank you very much for everything that you've done. And you have to have broad shoulders to move forward and take care of that city. This city is what we're about. And uh, we thank you very much. And for our team of uh, executives and um, our city manager, thank you very much. It, it is challenging every day, and every meeting always has something new. But I was told we were going to be here till 7 or 7.30, and it's 4.15. So you're welcome for getting you out, so you can have a nice time, whatever you're doing this evening. And uh, hopefully the city manager will let you go at 5 instead of 5.30. I am letting my staff go at 5. So thank you all, and marshals. And uh, Mr. Hacker, who has disappeared in smoke, thank you for taking this on. Appreciate it. We're adjourned. Till the 5th of February, Wednesday the 5th at 9.